Honourable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples, who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area, and pay respect to the elders, past and present, of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. I call the clerk to table documents. Mr President, I table documents pursuant to statute and returns to order as listed on the dynamic red. I understand there are no committees request to meet today. Senator Patrick. President, I seek leave to move a motion to provide for the consideration of the Biosecurity Amendment No Crime to Return Home Bill 2021. The motion has been circulated in the chamber. Leave is not granted. Pursuant to contingent notice of motion, I move that so much of the standing orders be suspended that, as would prevent me moving a motion relating to the conduct of business, namely a motion to give precedence to the consideration of the biosecurity amendment, no crime to return home bill 2021. Now, um, Madam Deputy President, well, Madam Deputy President, I've not sought uh, the grace of the Senate to immediately consider a bill before, uh, and I would not do so except in, se in exceptional circumstances. And the exceptional circumstances and the reason why we should be dealing with this particular uh, bill this morning is because uh, on the 1st of May, the Minister for Health made a high-risk country travel pause determination under the Biosecurity Act, which made it a criminal offence for distressed Australians, uh, distressed, distressed Australian citizens to return home from India. Now, I don't say we should open our doors uh, and just let everyone come back in uh, without any sort of quarantine or any measures being put in place. My bill does not seek to, uh, to um, uh, prevent the exercise of other existing powers under the Biosecurity Act. Uh, to require persons, for example, to quarantine on arrival uh, or to go to a particular uh, destination. It doesn't stop any of that from occurring. Um, now, I know there's a bunch of Australians out there who would say, look, you know, tough luck, you left the country, uh, you shouldn't be able to compromise our, uh, our health. And I know that that, is, that that sort of sentiment is driven by uh, uncertainty and fear, and I understand that. But we shouldn't be losing our uh, compassion and our humanity in relation to our, our Australian friends uh, and neighbours. Senator Last... Patrick, um, I am listening carefully, and I do remind you this uh, your contribution really needs to be around why you consider the bill urgent or, sure. or not urgent. Sure. Well, that, uh, I'll go exactly to that at the moment. Last week it was revealed that uh, there are 173 unaccompanied Australian children in India that are affected by this bill. And if we don't deal with this, that they're affected by the determination. If we don't deal with this, this uh, uh, determination this week, that will continue. And not only that, there is the possibility that throughout this pandemic, the minister could extend that determination. The minister could make a new determination that is similar. And uh, it's important to understand. And last night I read through the explanatory memorandum of the Biosecurity Act. Okay, around section 477, which is how the power is being exercised in these circumstances. And there was nothing in there that suggested in any way, shape or form that that particular uh, bill would ever be used to prevent an Australian from returning from home. So we're in a situation where a law has been, or a determination has been made that wasn't foreshadowed. And so the urgency in dealing with this is, is the fact that uh, a right has been taken away that was never intended by the parliament uh, to have been taken away. That's the problem we've got here. That's why we need to deal with this particular issue urgently. Um, we, we have had a determination that was made that is not disallowable. 
is not disallowable, so the Senate can't use its normal processes to deal with this particular determination. Again, I checked the, uh, the explanatory mem mem memorandum last night, and the reason uh, for not having these, allow these uh, determinations disallowable was because they were going to be uh, determinations that were based on technical and scientific requirements. Okay, this, is, this doesn't go anywhere near that. This is about the removal of a, of a right for an Australian to return home, to criminalise uh, an Australian from returning home. That was never the intention of, ha of, of having a, of a non-disallowable instrument under the uh, uh, bill that was debated back in 2014. So there is absolute urgency in dealing with this particular motion. I, I, uh, I wasn't in the chamber yesterday when uh, Sir, uh, Senator Ferravanti Fer Wells uh, talked about this particular uh, determination, but I have read the Hansard this morning as to what she said. She made it very clear that these sorts of determinations are quite dangerous, quite dangerous, where the parliament has no oversight over, over the exercise of a power, and so I am now forced to come into the chamber and uh, seek to uh, expedite my bill uh, uh, being pa passed through this chamber in order to deal with a situation that should never have arisen under the bill that was originally presented to this parliament. Okay? I invite people to go back and have a look at that explanatory memorandum. Uh, I invite them to have a look at the debates. This sort of, the exercise of this sort of power was never mentioned. We have to deal with this uh, Bill, I'd love to be able to do it by way of disallowance. I'm unable to do that, and that's the reason why we should be dealing with this bill this morning. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Senator Seawitt. Deputy President, I rise to contrib contribute to this debate on the suspension of standing orders and, in fact, uh, indicate that the Greens will be supporting the suspension. Um, we believe this is a matter of urgency that needs to be dealt with now. Um, we also believe that. Uh, amendments need to be made to the Biosecurity Act. Now, in fact, if people uh, can recall earlier in the week, I circulated an amendment to the Biosecurity Bill that was supposed to be coming to this place, being dealt with by the House of Representatives and supposed to be in here. We thought that was a way that we could deal with uh, this particular issue by amending that bill, which would, of course, amend the Act. However, that bill hasn't come on for debate, so that has not been able to occur. So Hence our support for this, uh, the suspension of standing orders to discuss this bill. I'll remind this chamber that there's 9,500 Australians and permanent residents stuck in India who wish to come home. They were devastated when the ban was put in place, but even more devastated when overnight on a Friday night the minister chose to uh, put in place and announce uh, criminal sanctions uh, on people returning home. That was, a, that was a further uh, devastation for those people. Reminding people of those 9,500, there's 950 vulnerable people there, 173 of whom are unaccompanied minors. And I'm sure this place has all heard the very tragic accounts of parents separated from their children. They need to come home. I can just imagine or barely actually imagine being one of those parents that heard the ban and then the criminalisation of their child potentially coming home. That's why this is urgent. Because although the Prime Minister at the moment is saying, oh yeah, well, we'll have three repatriation flights and maybe a few more, there's nothing to stop him enacting this again and making it happen again. That is why this is urgent. That is why we will be supporting uh, the suspension of standing orders to ensure that this situation does not occur. Which also takes me to the points that Senator Ferravanti Wells made yesterday, reinforcing the concerns that the Greens have had for a long time. And I used to be a member of, scrutiny of the Scrutiny of Bills Committee, as uh, Senator Rice is now. And this issue has come up also repeatedly, and that is legislation that is coming through with instruments that are not disallowable. It is an outrageous way to govern this country when ministers and prime ministers, but ministers, can make decisions that cannot be questioned, that we cannot come into this chamber and seek to disallow. And when you're getting something such momentous 
as banning 9,500 people from coming home, of which 950 are vulnerable, which means they need urgent support and attention, that power should not be put in the hands of a minister. That's just one example of a whole lot of other instruments that are no longer dis that are not disallowable, and increasingly it's the trend of government to move to putting in place instruments that are not disallowable. This is certainly one. This is certainly one, and I commend Senator Fair of Anti Wells. I don't often uh, commend Senator Fair of Anti Wells, to be uh, honest and open, but on this one, she's right. We shouldn't be governing in this manner. In some legislation, there's barely any. There's, there's a few principles there, but uh, not much meat in the bones, and everything else is through disallowable in, uh, through instruments, through regulation, many of which, increasingly so, as I said, are not disallowable. This is why this is urgent. So we make sure that the Prime Minister doesn't change his mind again to stop people. Particular, particularly in India, to stop citizens and permanent residents from coming home. It is absolutely critical. The situation we know in India is critical. That is why this debate needs to be had, and that's why we'll be supporting this, uh, this uh, motion to suspend standing orders to bring on this bill. Thank you, Senator Seward. Minister. Um, thank you very much, um, Acting. Uh, sorry, uh, Madam Deputy President. My apologies for incorrectly addressing you. Um, well, look, unquestionably, Australia stands absolutely side by side uh, with India through this particular pandemic um, crisis that currently is impacting their particular country, and, and we will continue to stand by um, countries around the world as they go through the pandemic. Um, however, um, decisions in relation to um, Australia and decisions in relation to legislation um, remain the purview of, um, of the government. Um, and the idea that Senator Patrick, in the support with the support of the Greens, would seek to come in here and decide that he himself is the one who decides how this chamber is operating. Um, you know, there is there is uh, there is a process, and you know, I, it sort of surprises me. It sort of surprises me. Senator Patrick has always been one of the people, one of the people who has been particularly um, consistent um, in understanding the processes and the, and the procedures this chamber and respect in. Highly, and, and I, I understand that Senator Patrick is a, is a great respecter um, of the processes of this place and respects this chamber. So I find it quite surprising that he comes in here today uh, and decides to rearrange um, uh, government business. So, however, I would just like to put on the record Order. before I finish my short contribution on this matter to say that Australia takes its responsibility for keeping Australians safe very, very seriously. We also take our responsibility uh, in relation to all Australians very, very seriously, and we will always operate to make sure that we operate in the best interests of the health and safety of our citizens, because there can be no greater or more, no more important thing that a government can do than to protect the safety of its citizens and its country, and we will continue to do so. But we will continue also to defend the right of the government to determine the operation of the business of this chamber. And, uh, and I'm sorry, Senator Patrick, but I think this is once again a stunt, and I'm particularly disappointed because I know how widely and held your views are on convention in this place. And for you to come in here and seek to abuse that, I find quite surprising. Thank you, Minister. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. One Nation won't be supporting Senator Patrick's stance on this and uh, suspending standing orders to put his bill forward. I do believe also that it is grandstanding. Here it is going to come to an end on 15 May and be reviewed and see if, it, see if it will, they will open up the borders. Why I think this it's important is that, yes, India is going through a pandemic. But the courts ruled on this, and they threw it out. There was no, it was not under breaking the constitutional rights of the people. It was for the health reasons, and exactly the same why they did not open, allow the premiers um, 
why they didn't open up the state borders exactly for the same reasons why the, the courts have ruled and supported the government on its stance. In India, you have the Consulate of Australia over there. Depending on the citizens that are there, and a lot of them are permanent residents who have travelled there on the Indian passport, the consulate under the international laws, if they travel on the Indian passport, they then are under the laws of the country where the Australian consulate cannot intervene. It depends on those Australians whether they've travelled under the Australian passport or whether they have travelled under their Indian passport. Senator Hanson, I'm listening carefully to your contribution. I remind you that the debate needs to really be centred around uh, why the, this matter is urgent or not urgent. Well, I think it is urgent in talking about it because it is about bringing the citizens back to Australia or not to Australia when there is a pandemic that is going on. And it is very important that I think Senator Patrick is actually grandstanding here with regards to it because it's two days until it is, will be reviewed. And that was the government that has made the decision with it. We cannot allow this just to stand up. And Senator Patrick's been exactly the same. He's always looked at the procedure of the chamber, government business. He doesn't like voting against it, the procedure of the chamber. So now, all of a sudden, we're supposed to vote on because he decides he wants his bill heard um, with regards to this. We won't be supporting it. So, Thank you, Senator Hanson. Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Oh, Madam Deputy President. Uh, Labor will not be supporting this motion by Senator Patrick. Labor shares Senator Patrick's concern for the stranded Australians in India. We oppose the Morrison government's attempt to jail Australian citizens for coming home. But this motion would see the introduction of a bill for debate that would see the Senate override the advice of our medical experts. That is not the Senate's role. The only way we can bring home the 40,000 stranded Australians, including from India, is for Scott Morrison to finally roll out the vaccine here in Australia and accept his responsibility to safely expand Australia's quarantine capacity so that all Australians can again call Australia home. Thank you, Senator Watt. Senator Lambie. It won't be supporting this either. Um, you know, this is a, a mixture of a lot of things. First of all, um, let's be honest, the Liberal Party, you have failed. So far we've got 28, uh, you know, uh, just over two and a half million uh, vaccine jabs on the road. That should have, you know, so we're miles behind on that. It's not just the people, it's not just our only Australians in India. We've now been, what, 15 or 16 months into this, and we've still got stranded Australians that want to come home where countries have now got COVID under control and we still can't get them home. So it's been a failure on behalf of that government over there. You still have not set up places to quarantine them so we can get them home. Right. Really has been a failure. It has been, and for that they're paying the price. In saying that, I will always be that those on home soil first, I will always put them first and foremost, and I will never ever put their lives at risk. We will not do that. And I'm sorry that there's Australians overseas, whether they're in India or not, that now that they're going to have to pay the price, uh, they're going to have to pay the price if they're there because for the sake of everybody else. Uh, and I do apologise for that. I know what you're saying, and this is about jailing Australian citizens. Well, I'm telling you, you know, I'm telling you right now. I don't think threatening them with jail was a good idea, but if you want to come home and you want to put other Australians at risk, uh, when you should, when there is, when, uh, when I just, there is no need to put the other 25 million of us at risk. You've got to weigh it up. I think that Senator was a really Lambie, harsh way Senator of dealing. Senator Lambie, may I remind you, this debate is about the urgency or not of the motion before the Parliament. Yes, yes. The so, uh, so the urgency of the motion. Um, for me, quite frankly, um, I don't believe they should extend, extend that in the next few days. Um, there's no doubt about that. But there are much bigger problems here. First of all, how are we going, what are we going to do about quarantine? What are we going to do about getting people vaccinated? And how are we actually going to get these people, Australians, home? So we won't be voting for this. Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. No, thanks, Deputy President. I want to reiterate the Greens' support for this suspension of standing orders because this issue is urgent. And although the current measures are due to expire on the 15th of May, it is quite possible for the minister just to roll them over and to continue 
to address and to attack the rights of Australians to come home. That is a fundamental right of citizens of Australia to be able to return to their home country. That is, is what is at stake, and that's what there has been ministerial override of. This, this is an issue that this parliament needs to decide, and in particular this Senate needs to decide, as to whether that's an appropriate action for this government to be taking. And we feel very strongly that it is not. That the fact that the minister has acted in this way to disallow people to be able to come home, to block the borders, to keep Australians in India where they are becoming sick from COVID, they are dying of COVID, Australian citizens dying because they are not being allowed to return home to Australia. This is an absolutely urgent issue that we address because there are Australians who are dying in India because of the actions of this government, because of the failures of this government. We know that Australians would be able to return home if we had put the appropriate quarantine facilities in place. And it just beggars belief, and I do not understand why the federal government has not accepted its responsibility that is there in the constitution to deal with quarantine. All this government needed to do was to actually act as a federal government to put appropriate quarantine facilities in place so that Australians would be able to return home. But they have refused to do that. It seems that they've refused to do that because they've left it up to the states. So that if things go wrong, they can blame the states. They have ab you, the Morrison government, you have abrogated your responsibility to be keeping Australians safe by not investing in those quarantine facilities. We could have quarantine facilities like Howard Springs. That everybody who has been through Howard Springs, I have not heard. A, a bad word about the experience of people who have been through the, the Howard Springs quarantine facility. We should and we could have facilities like that right around the country, but this government has just said, no, nope, they are not putting the investment in, they are not Senator taking Wright. responsibility Senator for Wright. that. Please resume your seat. Senator Hanson. Point of order. Urgency of the motion, please. Yes. Th thank you, Senator Hanson. I have been listening carefully and I was just about to remind Senator Rice that we are really dealing with this, the move to suspend, not the substantive nature of the bill. Thank you. Urgent because this measure that the government have put in place it could be rolled over from just a few days' time. It is critical. This is our last day here for a month. And yet we know that there's a possibility that this government could just roll over this issue and keep Australians away from home, locking them out from home, meaning that they are getting sick and they are dying in, in India. The fact that people are dying, isn't that one of the most urgent things that we could possibly be considering here? The fate of Australians who should be able to come home. That's why this is urgent. That's why we need to be discussing this today. And it's because of the failure of the Morrison government to be putting in place appropriate quarantine facilities. If we don't discuss this motion today, what pressure is there on the federal government to actually put in place the appropriate quarantine facilities? If we don't discuss this today, we will just go on for another few months of basically blocking our borders to Australians blocking Australians from their constitutional right to be able to come home. This is absolutely urgent. It is absolutely right at the core of what this Senate should be discussing, because this Senate is here as a watch on government. We are here as a, as a chamber to oversight what happens. We are here in control of our own destiny. This legislation is entirely appropriate to be discussed today. It should be discussed today. We need to have measures in place so that we can keep Australians in place, Australians safe. We need to have measures in place that allow appropriate quarantine facilities. We need to be keeping the pressure up on this government to be investing, to be setting up quarantine facilities like Howard Springs right across the country to allow Australians who are in India to come home. And if we don't, well then it is on the heads of this government when more people die. And this, I just want to finish up to say that we did not put measures in place like this when COVID was racing through Europe. The only reason this measure has been put in place is because it is in India, because this government does not see Indian Australians as Australians. They see them as Indians. And I think we need to 
This is a racist measure that this government has been put in place. It is impacting upon people you, who are Indian Rice. heritage, Your time and it has is expired. I'm going to put the motion. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Patrick. Uh, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the noes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Lock the doors. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Patrick to suspend be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Patrick as teller for the ayes and Senator Ciccone as teller for the noes.
order, there being 10 ayes and 36 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I call the clerk. Government business notice of motion number one, standing in the name of the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin, uh, relating to exemption of bills from the cut-off. Oh, just this. <laughs> We're just the, the minister's coming to her positions. She's minister. I move government business number one. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Oh, so, Senator Seawood. I to vote differently on some of the bills that are contained in the exemption. So, could we ask that the migration amendment clarifying the international obligations and removal bill be put separately? Yes, okay. it's fine. So. The motion is that the question um, be agreed to. Sorry. Okay. So, uh, Senator Seaward, um, we we will do all the bills except for the migration bill. So the question is that. The bills be be exempted from the cutoff. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. The question is: is that migration bill um, be exempted from the cutoff? Or, or, or the question is. Right. So the question is: Is that the migration amendment clarifying international obligations for removal bill 2021 be exempted from the cutoff? All those of that opinion say aye. All those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. That's all. Well, I didn't have the.
lock the doors. The question is that migration amendment clarifying international obligations for removal bill 2021 be exempted from the cutoff. The ayes will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left, and I appoint uh, Senator McGrath for the ayes and Senator Seward for the noes. Uh, the, there being 36 ayes and no, nine noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. Clark. Business order of day number one, uh, Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility Amendment Extension and Other Measures Bill 2021, resumption of debate on the second reading and on the amendment moved by Senator Watt. I'll just give people a moment to get back to their seats. It's Senator Roberts. Yes. Here you are. Is uh, Senator Pratt not in continuance? She's not here, Senator Roberts. Okay. Senator Roberts. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, Senator Hanson and I are passionate about developing the northern, uh, northern part of our country. The 2015 Government White Paper clearly articulated the unique challenges facing our north. It's a no-brainer. Consider these things. Long distances, highly variable weather with more extreme weather in cyclones, services, shortage of services, reliable and accessible infrastructure that we simply take for granted here in the south. There are no economies of scale in the north and they have smaller populations and plenty of communications blackouts. Now, in spite of the best intentions, a big pot of money and all the knowledge required to develop a robust fit-for-purpose infrastructure fund to meet the needs of the north, the Northern Australia Infrastructure Fund has not been fit for purpose. As a member of the Senate Selecting Committee on the Effectiveness of the Australian Government's Northern Australian Agenda, I repeatedly felt disappointed to hear witnesses across Northern Australia stating that getting money from NAIF was impossible. Northern Australia is operating from a lower base than in the South. The foundational pieces that we take for granted here in the South, all weather road access, reliable internet, access to a skilled workforce, highly qualified professionals, be it in the trades, engineering or medicine, are not readily available across northern Australia. NAIF needed to be, value at, to be adding value to northern development at a grassroots level, yet missed that target altogether. And it's significant that for a 20-year development horizon that the first five years have been far from optimal. 
So we welcome the changes included in, in this legislation, and I say the ground lost during the last five years was an unnecessary opportunity cost and loss of momentum. The government had all the information it needed to have made better decisions from the start. A more accessible NAIF is not the only element, though, that needs to be addressed. It's ironic that the issues that need addressing to facilitate development in the north are systematically being dismantled in the south due to atrocious federal and state governance. For example, energy, water access and price, and land tenure are severe problems and hurdles in the north. Yet how the hell can these be addressed and solved with policies currently destroying energy, destroying water access and prices, and raising prices, and destroying land tenure in the south? They, the problems in the north cannot be solved with these destructive policies. Wonderful to have NAIF improved, but we need to get the governance fixed in this country. The core issue suppressing the North development is atrocious, atrocious governance, atrocious state and federal governance. People, their talents and resources are being suffocated under a stifling morass of bureaucracy inherent in the interference, overlap and duplication of government agencies, state and federal. Until this poor governance is addressed, then the good work that NAIF can bring will be diluted and the development in the North will remain painfully slow to the whole country's detriment. I look forward to the next review to see how quickly and effectively this last $2.5 billion has been committed on bringing Northern Australia along with the rest of the country. We will be supporting this bill, especially given the deadline of 30th of June for the changes, and we will be closely scrutinising all amendments. We will not be supporting racially based amendments, and we will improve assistance to the people in the north. And I point out some of the comments in my dissenting report to the Northern Australia Agenda inquiry. We will be balanced and measured, but always ensure responsibility is with the right people. Thank you. S Senator McMahon. Thank you, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to support the North Australian Infrastructure Facility Amendment, Bill 2021. The NAIF has been an important vehicle for a number of Northern Territory enterprises, and I am advised that there are potentially another 50 proposals from the Northern Territory in the NAIF pipeline at the moment. In the Northern Territory, NAIF is providing nearly $700 million in loans through investment decisions and conditional approvals to infrastructure projects supporting over 1,500 jobs. The Northern Territory projects supported by NAIF so far include supporting economic growth through the funding of a new shiplift facility in Darwin, expansion of facilities at Humpty Doo Barramundi, helping to grow the Northern Territory aquaculture industry, upgrades at airports to help Northern Territory airports increase capacity and support export industries, and improved infrastructure at Cornellan Airport operated by Voyages, supporting tourism for the Ilara region and supporting Indigenous enterprises. I want to talk further about some of these projects in more detail shortly. Uh, but let me first turn to the amendments. These amendments will help further turbocharge this government's investment program for Northern Australia and make it easier for projects to receive funding and generate economic development and jobs as the country emerges from the COVID-19 pandemic. As part of the 2021 budget, our government announced reforms to the NAIF to provide more flexibility, to increase risk appetite and widen the scope of eligible projects. This is in addition to the July 20 announcement, which extended the NAIF's operation until 30 June 2026. The proposed reforms seek to address stakeholder criticisms of the NAIF 
regarding it being a risk averse and not providing enough and follow recommendations from the statutory review of the NAIF. Uh, the following are the proposed amendments to the NAIF Act 2016. Extend the time period in which NAIF can make investment decisions by five years to 30th June 2026. And given that we have approximately 50 projects in the pipeline from the Northern Territory, this is an extremely important uh, change from the Northern Territory's point of view. Uh, this will accelerate lending and, and uh, the, the amendments will also allow NAIF to lend directly to proponents under certain circumstances. NAIF will have the option to lend directly to project proponents, which will simplify the lending process and reduce administrative burden. Currently, all late NAIF loans are made through the relevant state or territory jurisdictions. While the state and territory governments remain important stakeholders for NAIF, the ability to lend directly empowers the NAIF to move projects to contractual close faster. So projects can get on with creating jobs and developing the north, which is, after all, what this is all about. This change also permits the NAIF to establish on-lending partnerships with local financiers to improve access to NAIF finance for smaller project proponents. Those partners will have the expertise to work with smaller proponents to demonstrate their suitability for NAIF finance and will extend the NAIF's reach to those smaller projects that need added assistance in these economically challenging times. I'd like you to note that the Select Committee on the Effectiveness of the North Australian Agenda, chaired by Opposition Shadow Minister Murray Watt, recommended the reforms recommended by the statutory review be passed by the parliament as a priority in 2021. Other relevant info on NAIF's investment. Total NAIF investment is now at approximately $2.9 billion. This $2.9 billion is generating $9.4 billion in economic benefit across Northern Australia, including a forecast of more than 9,000 jobs. In Queensland, more than $1 billion has been committed across 10 projects. In West Australia, more than $1.1 billion has been committed across eight projects. In the Northern Territory, more than $697 million has been committed across seven projects. This government, in general, is investing $9.3 million over the next five years from 2021-2022 to pilot regions of growth in Northern Australia locations. These pilot regions are mine and produce to port, Mount Isa to Townsville, agriculture, aquaculture and manufacturing precinct, Cairns to Gladstone, strategic gas basin, Beedaloo Basin to Darwin Port, Northwest Agriculture Corridor, Broome to Kununurra to Darwin. We are also improving digital connectivity with 68.5 million for dedicated Northern Australia round of the Regional Connectivity Program and the Mobile Black Spot Program, including 41.4 million for the Regional Connectivity Program and 25.1 million for the Mobile Black Spot Program. The government is investing $111.9 million to support Northern Australian businesses to scale up and diversify by providing co-investment grants to businesses for activities including infrastructure, assets, feasibility studies and business planning. The investment will be supported by a strengthening Northern Australia Business Advisory Service. This shows the commitment of this government, our side of politics, to those of us that choose to live, work and contribute to Australia's economy in the North. 
Again, let me go over what this bill is um, doing for the NAIF. This is going to extend the investment time period for the Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility by five years. Important for those 50 projects in the Northern Territory that are in the pipeline and uh, whose survival will depend on investment. This will expand the functions of the NAIF to include the provision of financial assistance to projects that contribute to Northern Australia's economic and population growth, and it will amend certain governance and administrative processes of the NAIF. Let me mention some of the projects that NAIF has enabled so far. One of my personal favourites, Humpty Doo Barramundi, a family-owned business, and uh, Bob and Dan Richards are two of my favourite human beings in the Northern Territory. The story of Humpty Doo Barramundi is rapidly becoming one of the great success stories of the Northern Territory. As I mentioned, father Bob Richards and son Dan Richards have been driving this project for the past 28 years. In fact, Bob likes to say to everyone who will stand and listen that uh, he is an overnight success story that was 28 years in the making. Um, Hupati de Barramundi is 100 per cent Australian family owned and operated <clears throat> from a farm located halfway between Darwin and Kakadu National Park. Since 1993, they have farmed premium saltwater barramundi on the Adelaide River. I think it is fair to say that the Northern Territory is the spiritual home of the barramundi. Hapti Du Barra is on a journey that began as a pioneering barra farm back in 1993. The annual harvest has grown from 300 kilograms in its first year of sales to over 3,000 tonnes of barra per year today. The success of this business has been through a trial and failure, followed by improvement processes of research, trial and error and passion from our unique team of people, which has led to recognition as a premium producer of great quality farmed barramundi. These guys have set themselves a target of becoming a world-leading barramundi farm, utilising technological advancement with increased opportunities for training and employment in Northern Australia in aquaculture, one of the world's fastest growing industries. And, uh, and let me tell you this about them. When COVID struck uh, last year and restaurants all around Australia closed down, um, they, were, they were struck extremely hard with no outlet for their produce. Um, this didn't deter them. They set out to develop other markets, which they did, which included um, selling through supermarket chains, something that they hadn't done before. And <clears throat> during this period, which was extremely tough for the family, they did not lay off or cut back the hours of any of their employees. They care for their employees, they are passionate about what they do, and they managed to keep their business running through what were extremely trying and difficult times. Now, how does this fit in with NAIF? As I've said, these guys were helped by NAIF and probably wouldn't be where they are today without investment from NAIF. They received a NAIF loan, the first NAIF loan, for $7 million in 2018, which was also matched by the ANZ Bank. The, the result of that loan saw the business successfully deliver increased capacity for barra aquaculture at their farm and increased employment as well as a new high-tech nursery facility, introducing a higher level of care for the fingerlings, the baby barra, before they enter the grow-out ponds. Then these guys at Humpty Doo Barra 
invested a further $48.4 million in aquaculture infrastructure with a new loan through NAIF, matched again by, a loan, by funds that were loaned through the ANZ Bank. Uh, now, Dan said at the time, this loan will take us further down the path of making Australian self, Australia self-sufficient in salt water, barramundi production, plus secure our supply of barramundi through, through a purpose-built barramundi hatchery. He said National Barramundi Day is the perfect day to announce this huge boost to Australia. As Australia's iconic fish, demand for quality Australian saltwater barramundi is growing. We, we aim to meet that demand through improving our facilities to provide the best growing conditions, leading to a healthy, great tasting fish. The NAIF loan, alongside private bank co-funding, supported the construction of a purpose-built hatchery for saltwater barramundi that will provide a significant boost to the Northern Territory's aquaculture industry and generate economic activity in the Territory as we recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. This latest round of funding through NAIF will support around 110 jobs during the construction phase and a further 160 jobs when the new hatchery is up and running. NAIF support will ensure Australian farm barramundi will be available in restaurants and at home and around the world, Minister Keith Pitt said at the time. This is a type of facilitation that NAIF provides, and it is why it is so important to the Northern Territory. 160 extra jobs might not sound like much, but in the Northern Territory, where we have a very small population, uh, this is extremely significant, as is the income generated by the export of farmed barramundi around Australia and potentially around the world. This is a sort of uh, life-changing, economic-changing uh, support that NAIF can uh, produce across Northern Australia, where we so vitally need it. And I commend this bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator McMahon. Senator Dodson, thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy uh, Speaker. Uh, I rise to speak on the North Australian Infrastructure Facility Amendment, Extension and Other Measures Bill 2021. There is no doubt that the NAIF is in need of urgent reform. Its operations over the last six years is indicative of the failure of this government to deliver, especially for the people of Northern Australia. It is symbolic of the pattern of announcement without follow-up or follow-through that has become the hallmark of this government. As my colleagues before me have highlighted, by October last year the NAIF had only released $218.4 million of its $5 billion budget, $218.4 million out of a $5 billion budget. Less than 10 projects have begun or completed construction. Only two First Nations projects have received NAIF support. And communities in Northern Australia, particularly First Nations communities, are calling out for investment. And not just any investment, but an investment that is smart, sustainable investment, an investment that encourages prosperity without destroying culture, land, and resources for future generations. In other words, a balanced development approach. The NAIF represents an opportunity to achieve these goals, but it has fallen far short of that expectation to date. I had the privilege of being part of the Senate Select Committee investigating the effectiveness of the government's North Australian agenda. Uh, which was chaired by my colleague, Senator Watt, and has recently handed down its final report. And I recommend the report to all in this chamber. The committee spent two years investigating the impact of government policies 
across communities in the north in, and including the, the NAIF itself. Despite being hampered by COVID-19, the community travelled to Cairns, to Townsville, Thursday Island, Darwin, Nullumboy. We heard video evidence from many, other, many more other places across the north, including my home community of Broome. We heard from community groups, entrepreneurs, local governments, Chamber of Commerce and First Nations organisations about the challenges facing North Australia. And what was our conclusion? That this government is stuck in the slow lane when it comes to Northern Australia. There's no roaring engines going forward here. The failures in relation to the NAIF are just one example of promises not being delivered. The committee's interim report reflected that while there is support for the idea of NAIF, the reality has been profoundly disappointing. We have heard numerous criticisms about the complexity of the application process for NAIF funding. The administrative burden of applications is considerable, and it is no surprise that this has stymied First Nations projects most of all. The NAIF is simply not accessible for many First Nations entrepreneurs and organisations. Evidence submitted to the committee highlighted the many barriers faced by First Nations seeking to access uh, the NAIF funding, uh, from the lack of liquidity equity to inability to afford administrative costs and lack of credit history. This means that Northern Australia is not benefiting from the innovative development led by First Nations. It also means that First Nations peoples are being left behind, despite the burgeoning wealth of some in the region. The committee received a report by Professor John Taylor, who studied the impact of the mining boom on social indicators for the Pilbara Aboriginal people. His research found that, and I quote, in many respects, outcomes are worse now than they were before the mining boom. As representatives of the eight uh, traditional owner groups in the Pilbara noted, there has been a failure to raise all boats on the back of massive government and private sector investment in the region. This will not improve without better engagement with First Nations peoples. As we debate this bill, it is important to note the extent of the First Nations presence in Northern Australia. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples make up approximately 15 per cent of the population of Northern Australia, and over 25 per cent of the population is in the Northern Territory, of the Northern Territory population. The First Nations land tenure covers a vast proportion of the Northern Australian land mass—66 per cent of Northern Queensland, 80 per cent of the Northern Territory and 94 per cent of Western Australia. Given this context, it is unthinkable that the future of Northern Australia could be charted without the involvement of First Nations peoples. The government's white paper, Developing Northern Australia, acknowledged that, and I quote, developing the North will need to be in full partnership with Indigenous Australians, end of quote. But this government has demonstrated again and again that it does not understand the concept of partnership with First Nations. Defenders of the NAIF's current structures point to the procurement and employment opportunities for First Nations peoples arising from the NAIF-funded projects. While these opportunities should undoubtedly be strengthened, they are poor substitutes for First Nations being able to control and direct projects in their own right, and a poor substitute for being assured a seat at the NAIF decision-making table. 
This bill includes a number of amendments that Federal Labor has called for for many years. We hope it marks a step in the right direction, but we also think we can do better, both to ensure that First Nations peoples are truly benefiting from the NAIF and that the projects it funds are sustainable in the age of changing climate. To this end, Labor will be moving a number of important amendments to the bill, which my colleague Senator Watt has outlined. One of these amendments would ensure that there is a First Nations member on the board of the NAIF. The government's current proposal is to add experience in economic development in Indigenous communities that's the category, to the list of experts sought for the NAIF board. This is simply too weak. We must relegate to history the days when others speak for First Nations, particularly as they are property owners. And I've outlined the amount of property they have in Northern Australia. Labor amend amendments is a simple measure that would mean that First Nations peoples are assured a seat on the NAIF decision-making table. And it is consistent with similar requirements that apply to a range of other federal bodies, including the Australian Heritage Council, the Great Barrier Reef and Marine Park Authority. Valid concerns have also been raised about the effects of this bill on the North Australian environment, particularly whether projects funded by the NAIF will help or hinder us in addressing serious impacts of climate change. Bear in mind that First Nations peoples in the north are likely to experience the brunt of harmful climate change or any other form of pollution of their lands and waters. We are already seeing these impacts across our communities and nowhere more stark than in the Torres Straits. The government's action have eroded any trust that they will be doing the right thing when it comes to managing the necessary transition uh, to clean energy. We've seen that in the extraordinary decision of the minister, Minister Pitt, to veto NAIF funding to the carbon wind farm near Cairns just last week, against the express recommendations of the fund, so Labor is moving amendments to ensure that the minister cannot direct the fund to allocate funding in a way which is inconsistent with Australia's achievement of a net zero emission by 2020. These and the other Labor amendments are straightforward, sensible proposals that will make this legislation better. I urge the government and all in this chamber to support them. There is considerable beauty and potential in Northern Australia. Much of it is fragile and unique. This time of the year is one of the best times of the year in Northern Australia. Let me tell you, I look forward to going home to Broome next week. Much, much of its manifest, this manifestation is in the richness of the First Nations cultures, its languages, its knowledge, its relationship to the land and its willingness to share some of that if you don't destroy it. The knife could be a vehicle to harness this potential for the benefit of the whole of Australia, but it is currently failing to do so. It's up to the government and Minister Keith Pitt to deliver on the promise of the knife. And this bill represents a second chance and those of us on this side of the chamber will be watching this closely and we'll be listening also continuously to how people in the north are benefiting from the actual release of funds rather than its promises. Thank you, Senator Dodson. I have Senator Hanson Young, but you're jumping. Sen Thank you, Senator. Deputy President. The Northern Australian Infrastructure Fund 
is a failed slush fund already. This bill is only going to make it worse. And it's such a pity because infrastructure is so critical and appropriate development of Northern Australia is so critical. And there are such opportunities for appropriate, ecologi ecologically appropriate, socially appropriate, economically appropriate development to occur in Northern Australia. And in a better world, with a better government, you would be able to set up processes to actually facilitate and encourage and support that type of ecologically, socially and economically appropriate development. But the Northern Australia Infrastructure Fund is not the vehicle to do that. It's already been shown to be a failure. It is already not directing investment where it should be, should be directed. And it's clear from the amendments to the bill that are being put forward in this bill is that it's only going to get worse. And rather than having a facility that is ensuring that investment goes to appropriate developments, this is going to be setting it up as a slush fund for the government to be funding their mates, to be investing in the most inappropriate developments. I mean, particularly, I think the government just, I mean, essentially they're climate denialists. We are in a climate crisis. The world is in a climate crisis. The number one global priority that we need to be working out how we shift as a global community is to be getting out of burning, polluting coal and gas and oil. Governments all around the world are tackling this big problem. Governments all around the world are committing themselves to be working in the interests of the globe, working to be reducing our carbon pollution, slashing our carbon pollution, urgently slashing our carbon pollution to zero as quickly as possible. But not this government. This government, in this bill today, is saying that it wants to provide flexibility to deliver for the Northern Territory and Northern Australia. But translated, what this means is this government wants to deliver for its mates, and it wants to deliver for the big fossil fuel companies. And this isn't just something that the Greens have thought up. It's very clear from the um, statements that the minister has already ma made as to what he wants to see the NAIF to be used for. Keith Pitt, as the Resources Minister, who we know does not is a climate denialist, does not understand and support and accept the reality of climate change and climate, say, cl climate change science, he sees the NAIF to be doing things like opening up more opportunities for the Beetaloo infrastructure financing, which is just going to be a total carbon bomb, as well as destroying huge amounts of wonderful Northern Territory um, landscape. The amount of carbon that, the Beetaloo, that fracking the Beetaloo Basin is going to cause is going to, on its own, significantly increase carbon pollution from globally. This is exactly the sort of development that should not be going ahead. This is exactly the sort of development, though, that this government wants to see funded under the NAIF. I mean, infrastructure, as I said, really has got the opportunity to be supporting the transition to a zero carbon, ecologically sustainable, socially sustainable economy. And that's what the NAIF could be, but it's what the NAIF is not. I want to go through um, what some of the problems with this bill are. And, and there are four, basically. The first of the problems of this bill is it's actually going against everything that um, this place is saying needs to happen in terms of facilities like this, of maintaining independence and maintaining the ability of, of an organisation like the NAIF to be actually making decisions on the basis of good, good information from across the, the people that are advising them. By requiring the secretary of the department to be a member of the NAIF board, it is actually going to be increasing ministerial influence. And we've already seen that this minister has got form in terms of influence. We've had, just in, in recent times, the minister extraordinarily exercising his ministerial veto to stop 
a project that the NAIF board recommended. The NAIF board was recommending, in fact, the sort of project that we as Greens say, yes, this is the sort of infrastructure that government should have a role in to actually be helping our transition to a zero carbon economy. And that was a wind farm. And it was going to be a wind farm supported by a battery. It was going to create 250 jobs. It's exactly the sort of infrastructure that we need to be seeing here. That the opportunities, massive opportunities in Australia for this sort of renewable energy infrastructure. And why? Why did the minister ex exercise his ability to block this project? The only way you could see that the minister decided to do this was on sheer ideological. Um, Stubbornness, really, um, because here you've got the sort of project that, with a board recommending it, investment in a wind farm, investment in a battery, and the, the minister, when asked about it, could not even bring himself to say the word battery. He could not even accept that batteries actually might be the way of the future. And the whole, we keep on hearing from the, this, the government side of, of politics, oh, the problems with the renewable is you know, what happens when the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow. Well, there are actually answers to that. You know, and batteries are a huge part of the answer to that. You invest in a wind farm and a battery. That's right. <laughs> Coal, exactly. And, I, I, look, Senator Canavan has, I will take the interjection because Senator Canavan has only just walked in the chamber and has actually missed the beginning of my speech when I have been talking about the need to transition to a zero carbon economy. And sadly, and less Senator Canavan sort of um, maybe he doesn't realise that coal is carbon. Maybe he doesn't realise that the mining, the burning, the export of coal actually results in carbon emissions going up into the atmosphere. It's actually the sort of thing that we need to be avoiding. It's actually the sort of thing that around the world people aren't, countries are saying, well, sorry, Australia, we're not going to want your coal in the future because of those that amount of carbon pollution. Other countries recognising that the world is on a precipice, that we are facing an existential crisis because of our climate crisis, because of the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And yet we have this government that is ideologically committed to delivering for their mates, to delivering for billionaires, to delivering for the big mining countries, companies, and continuing, and not just continuing, to expand the burning of fossil fuels, to expand the burning of coal, to expand to the fracking of our country and the burning of, of gas. Exactly the direction that we, we just cannot afford to be heading. Going back to the problems with this bill, one, removing the independence, but the second one is removing the veto right of states and territories. And again, we are in a situation, the only way that our carbon pollution is not worse than it is at the moment in Australia is because some of our states and territories are actually recognising that we need to cut our carbon pollution. Some of our states and territories are getting on board with that, and they have got far more ambitious um, targets for cutting carbon pollution that the, than the federal government um, has. So, in fact, the potential for the governments of the Northern Territory, Western Australia and Queensland to actually to be listening to the science, listening to their communities and saying, well, we actually don't want these fossil fuel projects. We don't want the Adani coal mine because of it's, it's going to be a carbon bomb. We don't want the fracking of the Beetaloo Basin because it's going to be a carbon bomb. This is what state governments should have the ability to stay. The interests of their community, of their state or territory, and the interests of the world to say that these fossil fuel projects should not go ahead. But no, this government is saying we're going to remove the right of states and territories to actually have that say, to be saying that these projects shouldn't be going ahead. The third thing that this bill does, which is a problem, is it ex actually expands the funding mechanisms to get into riskier developments. And that's important because we know that if you look at the, the risk of investing in fossil fuel projects, they are incredibly risky. They are likely to be stranded assets in the future. And so actually investing in, in investments that are problematic climate-wise, but they're also really problematic economically. But no, this NAIF, um, these measures in this bill would say, forget about that, we're going to allow you to invest in riskier investments, again, in order to suit their ideological um, 
position in order to suit the, be the, the business interests of their mates, in order to suit the business interests of the big mining billionaires. And the fourth problem of this bill is, of course, it extends the NAIF for another five years, which means that all of these things can just go on for longer, rather than actually sort of coming to an end and actually rethinking what sort of investment um, mechanism you should have for investing in cr clean, green, economically and socially uh, appropriate infrastructure, not we're going to get another five years of this climate denialist, carbon polluting, big business supporting approach. So what do we do about it? We've got a number of amendments that the Greens are putting up. I know there are a number of amendments that the Labor Party is putting up as well. Um, that basically are saying, well, you could have a NAIF that would work better, that we could shift to be actually delivering appropriately. And so I'm foreshadowing that I'm going to be moving a second reading amendment that I really hope will get the support of, of the Senate uh, that says at the end of the, the motion for the bill, but add that the Senate is of the view that no public money should be invested in coal, gas or oil projects. And I think given that the world's in a climate crisis, Given that we know we've got to slash our carbon pollution, given that we know that the science is saying that we need to have at least a 75 per cent in our carbon pollution by 2030 if we have got a hope of tackling the existential threat of our climate crisis, I think that's quite a reasonable measure. It's actually not saying, you know, um, close down every fossil fuel project in the country. It's just saying don't invest in any more. Don't add to the problem. We've already got a massive problem with the amount of coal and gas and oil that we are mining and burning and exporting here in Australia. So this second reading amendment basically says just don't make the problem worse. And as I, you know, given that we need to be cutting our carbon pollution, I can't say I will keep on saying it because it is an existential threat that the world is under. You look at the, the fires that we experienced in the last black, the black summer. Fires like that are going to become more frequent, more intense, more extreme, more widespread. You look at the issues of sea level rise. We have got a massive proportion of Australia's population that lives sort of within a couple of metres of, of, of sea level. You have sea level rise of one, two, three, you know, tens of metres potentially, depending on how quickly the ice sheets are melting. Huge impacts on us. Huge. You look at the number of people that die in heat waves. You look at the amount of our country that is going to be unlivable. You look at the amount of our country where we're not going to be able to be growing food. That two-thirds of our wheat, that virtually all of our wheat growing areas, by the end of the century, we will not be able to grow wheat there. You know, these are the realities of our climate crisis that this place needs to come to terms with. The community have come to terms with it. The Australian community know that we do, should not be investing in fossil fuels, that we need to get out of coal and gas and oil as quickly as possible. But this government is just doubling down. And why? It's because of their mates. It's because of their billionaire mates. It's because of their big mining company mates, the people that have got so much power in our, in our society. They're not listening to the community. They're not listening to the vast majority of Australians who just want some leadership from government. They want government to lead them to say, yep, we know that we've got to get out of fossil fuels and this is how we're going to do it. We're going to have a transition and, and we're going to invest in infrastructure that helps that transition. We're going to invest in wind farms with batteries. We're going to invest in solar farms. We're going to invest in, in electric vehicles. But no, we have just got this ideological denialism that's insisting that we just go backwards as a country, that we are the pariahs of the world, that we are the absolute laggards. Well, everyone else is going on. Conservative governments, you know, the UK government's carbon targets, why aren't we emulating them? We've got far more potential um, of renewable energy than the UK, but no. We have just got this commitment, which is just expressed through this NAIF bill, expressed in through the budget this week, of saying we are just going to keep on keeping on. We're going to keep on burning and digging up and burning coal. We're going to keep on digging up and burning gas. We're going to keep on with our dirty internal combustion engines. It is such a travesty. It is such a backwards um, way that this government is, is 
operating, and it needs to change. Thank you, Senator Rice. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, it's a great privilege to follow the Green Senator for Northern Australia, uh, Senator Rice uh, from inner city Melbourne. Um, and it's an even better honour here, though, to confirm the continuation of the Northern Australian Infrastructure Facility. Uh, uh, this facility uh, was set up uh, six years ago by the government for an initial five-year period, and today, or when this bill passes, we'll extend that period for another five years. And what is important about this is that this shows that the government, uh, that the Australian Parliament, indeed, is in the north for the long haul. Uh, uh, we have great opportunities to develop northern Australia for the benefit of Australia. Uh, uh, and it is going to take a long time. It was right and proper to set up a new and innovative uh, facility like this for a limited time at first to see how it went, uh, but it's great to see that it will continue its life, I believe, with the support of this chamber, because to build the north will need to be in there for the long haul. We need to work at this over many years and decades indeed. Uh, to, to really uh, accomp accomplish the opportunities and potential of northern Australia. Uh, the NAIF is being extended through this bill. The Northern Australian Infrastructure Facility is being extended uh, because uh, it is working. Uh, the NAIF uh, is working. It is delivering major projects that are creating jobs right across northern Australia and benefiting the whole country. Uh, it now has made nearly $3 billion worth of investments uh, around the country. I saw last week firsthand uh, the impact of these investments. I was at Beef Week uh, in Rockhampton, and there a company called Signature Beef uh, had, a, had a stall at Beef Week uh, uh, run by Blair and Josie Angus, Signature Beef, great company, great Australian company. Uh, they are in the process of building a new meatworks near Moranbar in central Queensland. It'll be one of the first meatworks open in this country for decades, and it'll be right in, in, in the smack bang of cattle country uh, in the Fitzroy Basin. There are more cattle there in the Fitzroy than the whole of the Northern Territory. Uh, it'll be a fantastic opportunity for graziers right through central and north Queensland to have an alternative for their product to be processed, especially in a way which keeps them ownership of their product, because they want to set up a facility which will do what's called service kills and allow a grazier uh, to, to process their own beef and sell their own beef with their own brand on it uh, after it comes out the other end. So it is a great project. It's all, all, all the, all the, they had a video there of the, the building being funded by the NAIF. It's almost complete, should be without holding them to it, hopefully an opening in August this year, and then 80 people will have a job at that facility as well in central Queensland, giving it another alternative opportunity for people there. There's also the Kidston Hydro project, which has reached financial close in the last couple of months. It's been a, a long process to get them there, but that's a massively innovative project, uh, almost a billion-dollar project, creating hundreds of jobs in North Queensland. They are using an old gold mine to install a pumped hydro project, which will help back up energy in North Queensland, a massive project also creating jobs and lower energy prices for North Queensland. There's other projects. Metro Mining doing bauxite uh, in Cape York. Uh, we will have, it will have substantial Indigenous benefits, indigenous, uh, benefits to Indigenous Australians in employment in a mining industry there on the Cape. And one of the projects I, I'm most proud of as a former Northern Australian minister who ticked off this was the, it was the loan the NAIF has made to the, to the Australian Aboriginal Mining Corporation. They are building they are currently constructing Australia's first Aboriginal-owned iron ore mine. Uh, a great outcome for our nation to see Indigenous Australians not just getting a job in the mining sector but also owning the mine itself, taking the business decisions, taking the risks, hopefully making the profits. Certainly if the iron ore price stays where it is, they'll have no problem there. Uh, but making a goal of it in this, in this country, in their own land, in their own country, and building something for the long term for their peoples, that has been facilitated and come about thanks to the NAIF. There's also the Cal Calium Lakes project, uh, providing the first, uh, first um, um, uh, uh, a production of, of, uh, of phosphate products in Australia, or first for a long time, a fertiliser that will help farmers and, and increase our own food security, not relying on imports from overseas. In the Northern Territory, there's been fantastic projects at the Humpty Doo uh, Barramundi farm there, I think going back for their second NAIF loan, after one expanding their Barramundi output there. And in Darwin itself, there's also been 
uh, NAIF uh, loans to expand the port uh, there to, protect, to especially help uh, maintain more of our naval fleet in northern Australia uh, in the great port of Darwin. And uh, further south in the Northern Territory, there's been the investment to another Aboriginal corporation, Voyagers, uh, to upgrade the airport near Ayers Rock at Eulara. Uh, a fantastic, um, uh, fantastic initiative there that will help them attract tourists and uh, grow their business. So these, all these investments are making sense. They are creating jobs, they are building our nation, and that is why it's important to extend the Northern Australian Infrastructure Facility so we can keep doing more of those things, more of those things in the future. And the reason we should invest in Northern Australia is not just for the, the people of Northern Australia. The, there's uh, around 6 per cent of Australians live uh, in Northern Australia, just over a million Australians in Northern Australia. Uh, it's important that they're looked after, of course. Um, they deserve to have nation-building initiatives spent in their part of the country, uh, just as we built the Murray-Darling, uh, the Snowy Scheme, uh, 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 just as with the Kalgoorlie-Perth pipeline. Uh, we should also seek to, to build nation-building initiatives in Northern Australia as well. That's important for them. But it's also important for our nation because those 6 per cent of Australians, those uh, just over a million Australians that live in Northern Australia, they actually produce, they produce economic output that represents around 12 per cent of our nation's output. Uh, so they punch above their weight. They punch above their weight. They actually produce double per person uh, in terms of economic output than the average around Australia. Uh, and that is because uh, Northern Australia is home to our nation's biggest exports. Uh, uh, it is actually where more than half our exports originate from. So more than half of the boats that leave our shores that make us money so that we can afford the things that we've spent in the budget the other night leave from Northern Australia. It leaves on big uh, Cape iron ore vessels filled with red rocks from Western Australia that help pay uh, for public service. Those boats leave with lots of black rocks from central Queensland, where I'm from, that also from the coal that helps us pay the bills uh, that makes us this great nation we are. It increasingly comes from big refrigerated boats, uh, LNG boats that have liquefied gas on it that help us pay the bills for this nation. And of course, it is a powerhouse for our beef industry. Uh, there are plenty of grains. Uh, produced in Northern Australia and cotton in Northern Australia, and all of these products help our nations pay their bills. And what does a good business do? A good business invests back in those parts of its business that make the money. So if you sat down the boardroom and think, okay, where should we put our capital expenditure budget for the next year? Well, you'd probably look at the parts of your businesses, the, the lines of business that are actually making a profit, that are making money, and you'd say, okay, let's put more into those. Let's put more into those areas. And that's why, as a nation, we should put more in northern Australia, because you get your bang for your buck, uh, because there is so much opportunity there uh, to build more dams, to capture the water, to grow more food, to expand our mining industries, our coal, our gas, our iron ore, and massive demand for all of these products through the world. And we produce some of the highest quality minerals in the world. We should focus on those. Now, which brings me to the um, Greens senator for northern Australia from Melbourne, uh, Senator Rice. Uh, it's not surprising, perhaps, that a senator uh, that from Melbourne shows a complete misunderstanding. Oh. Uh, <laughs> um, I forgot that. Yes. Uh, my apologies, Senator Waters. I thank you, Acting Deputy Chair. I just wanted to clarify for Senator Canavan's benefit that I'm the representative of the Greens on these matters, and I happen to live in North Queensland. He seems to be uh, in Northern Australia. Thank, in Northern Australia, he seems to be thank, a bit confused. Thank, thank you. And I know it'll wreck his rhetoric. I'm oh, sorry about that, mate. But get your facts right. Referring to Senator Waters, I'm referring to Senator Rice, who said she was going to move amendments. <laughs> Senator Rice is moving amendments on the Northern Australian Bill. She mentioned in her contribution. So a member, a Green senator from Melbourne. Is, having, is, 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 it making, is it making her say, telling us what to do in Northern Australia? We've seen that before from the Greens, which I might come back to. And also, Senator Waters, just to clarify for the Senator, Senator Waters does not live in Northern Australia. She lives in Brisbane, in Queensland. And, and we know in this Act, if she'd actually read this Act, she says apparently she's the representative for Northern Australia, if she'd read the Act of the Northern Australian Infrastructure Investment, she'd know there's a map that's referred to in that Act. And Brisbane, Brisbane is not in, not in Northern Australia. It's not in. It's about 600 kilometres south of Gladstone, which is where the border is on the coast of uh, no, Queensland for Northern Australia. So, a little bit embarrassing for uh, Senator Waters Senator there. Senator Stirl, on the on the point of order. Madam Acting uh, 
Deputy President, and I can't remember which part of the standing orders it is, but Senator <laughs> Waters had clearly, clearly corrected the, 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 uh, the uh, record, and Senator Canavan is being frivolous. I can't think what uh, the actual thank, word is. Th thank you, Senator Stoll. Senator Canavan, could I, could I invite you just to continue with your remarks and move, well, move, it's, it, move it's, the Senate forward? It's no wonder that Senator Stoll can't remember the point of order, because there is no point of order against frivolity. Frivolity. <laughs> Let's, um, this place is a little bit boring at times, so it's nice to have a little bit of fun. Now, now the, the, as I mentioned, the uh, Green spokesperson for Northern Australia from Melbourne uh, uh, has—that's not a point of order. <laughs> Indeed, she wasn't seeking one. Oh, Senator okay, right. Sorry, I saw Senator Waters get up. I saw Senator Waters. So the Green spokesperson for Northern Australia from Melbourne, Senator Rice, says that oh, we should not invest in fossil fuels in Northern Australia because it's all bad, terrible. It's going to blow up the planet if we continue to do these things. What she doesn't understand and doesn't mention is that half of the economy in Northern Australia comes from mining. 50 per cent. Half of the jobs, half of the income, half of the cash flow, half the tax revenues that we all take down here comes from the mining sector in northern Australia. So if you have, if you move an amendment here that cuts off a big part of the mining and resources sector, and I'm including LNG as part of mining there, just to clarify, if you, if you cut that off and say nah, none of that can be invested in, you are cutting off half of northern Australia and you are completely limiting the opportunities for our part of the world where I live in northern Australia to grow and develop, because we have enormous opportunities to grow and develop our mining sector even further. Uh, we have enormous opportunities to grow and develop the coal basins of North Queensland because, because people want high-quality coal around the world, and we have it. We have enormous opportunities to continue the enormous trade in iron ore uh, we have going out of the west. We have enormous opportunities to continue exports of gas, especially in the Northern Territory, where our, first, our country's first shale gas play exists in the Beetaloo Basin. And wouldn't that be a great thing for Darwin? It's a great port. It's got great access to the Asian region, but it doesn't have cheap energy at the moment. Uh, that, that field offers that. Let's hope it is developed. Because this is the problem. Where the NAIF did get off to a, to a rocky start. There's no doubt about that. It's hitting its straps now. But it got off to a rocky start. And one of the reasons it got off to a rocky start is because the Labor Party teamed up with the Greens to stop the NAIF investing in the Adani Carmichael mine. That was going to be a big project for the NAIF. Could have built the rail line out there to Adani. Could have been built to a bigger, a bigger capacity than it's currently being built. But the Labor Party, with Jackie Trade in Queensland, with Bill Shorten down here, uh, with everybody supine over there on this uh, Senate side, teamed up with the Greens to kill any investment in a new rail line out to a new coal basin, the first coal basin that would have been opened up in Australia for 50 years. And so that was taken off the table. Now, thankfully, thankfully, the Labor Green Alliance there weren't successful in killing the project overall. They were successful at killing the size of the project. The rail line's not as big as it could have been, thanks to them. We could have more jobs going up there now, but for them. But thankfully, the project is going forward and the rail line is currently being built. And just the other day, Adani did hit first coal at their Carmichael mine, or load the coal seam they hit is not one they'll mine. In a few months they'll hit the coal seams they actually will mine. And later this year they'll export the first coal from the first coal base in 50 years from this country to another one to India. And it'll be a fantastic day for our nation. And then no thanks, no thanks to any of those people here in this chamber in the Labor and the Greens parties. They actively tried to stop it. And thankfully the Australian people rejected that the last election and we're getting those jobs. We've got that mine and we're going to have future opportunity for Northern Australia and North Queenslanders. Now, I do need to say though, I do need to say thanks. There is one person I need to thank, and that is a former Green Senator in Bob Brown. He was of enormous assistance and help in getting the Adani miner going. Uh, I was trying for years, I was banging my head up against the wall, pushing, fighting, uh, 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 begging for the project to proceed. Bob Brown turns up, and within weeks, the whole thing's going forward. He was a magician, an absolute magician. And there is one particular amendment I think I would suggest to the Greens to move that I might support. I might consider supporting. If they want to put Bob Brown on the NAIF board, I might, I might support that, almost as, a, as an, honor, an, honorary, an honorary position for Bob Brown to come onto the NAIF board for his, his work in helping create jobs in northern Australia. And we'd love to see him more in the north. I'd love to have him back. Unfortunately, I've invited him many times and he's not coming, apparently. He's blamed COVID. Now that's gone. But maybe if he was on the NAIF board, he'd actually come and visit us a bit more. He'd come up to the Beetaloo Basin and help us get help uh, Senator McCarthy get shale gas going in the Northern Territory. He'd come up uh, to, to the Kimberley 
uh, to the West Kimberley and Senator Stirl's area and help us get cotton farming going uh, around Kununurra. He'd hate that too. He'd do, he'd do magic. He'd do wonders up there. We could get that moving because there is so much opportunity here across northern Australia. And there are a lot of people from down south, like Senator Rice and others, who constantly want to downplay those opportunities, who often bring a, can I say, European mindset to our nation where they think the north is hot and humid and infested with pests, and we should all just keep our population development, our population development down in the, in the, in, in the more sanguine Mediterranean uh, climates of our southeast. But I think our nation's mission is actually to grow and develop across this great continent. That is great what we've done in cities like Melbourne and Sydney. They're fantastic testaments to what we've achieved as a nation, but that we can actually build similarly successful and popular cities in other parts of our country as well, where there is plenty of supplies of water, where there is high-quality minerals, where there is high-quality soils to grow food in. If we invest in those areas, we won't maintain our position as a country where we are concentrated in just one small corner, but we will spread, grow and develop and create the opportunity for thousands and millions of more Australians, as we have done in the South. Senator McCarthy. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, the NAIF needs a bold correction. And uh, senators like Senator Canavan, who uh, have drank the Kool Aid of these mining companies across the country, uh, Madam Deputy President, uh, certainly need uh, a lesson in trying to understand. Uh, where First Nations people are coming from in the need to be able to care and look after country, culture and kin. It doesn't help, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, when we think about the $5 billion—$5 billion. Just imagine what we could be doing to improve the lives of the most impoverished Australians and those Australians who live in northern Australia. How about opening up the opportunities, Madam Acting Deputy President, to those northern Australians who would dearly love to be able to access that $5 billion to build better homes, to have employment strategies that are long-term, consistent and enable families to provide for their families, without the kind of sarcasm that comes from members opposite who so want to dwell on their mates by punishing and rubbishing the people of the North who do their best in circumstances that economically that they are not on the same level as those opposite, Madam Acting Deputy President. This is an important piece of legislation in terms of what it could do for Australians in the North. And it needs a bold correction, Madam Acting Deputy President, because $5 billion is not something to sneer at, is not something to wave in front of the most impoverished people in this country and say, hey, look at what we've got and you want this. That is not what this discussion here in the Senate is about, Madam Acting Deputy President. There needs to be far greater responsibility and acknowledgement of the mistakes and there have been plenty of mistakes on this five-, six-year journey of the North Australia Fund, investment fund, or as my colleague uh, Senator Murray Watt has deemed uh, not the Australia Investment Fund. It's in this government's DNA, Madam Acting Deputy President, to make a big announcement and fall flat on delivery. And certainly the people of the Northern Territory can see that. Sure, I certainly commend uh, the business in terms of the Humpty Doo Barramundi fishing farm. And I had the opportunity to go out there and have a look. And I think they're doing a terrific job, a wonderful job. They were doing that anyway but they've certainly been assisted, as they rightly should be. And there are people who work at Voyages in Central Australia, First Nations people wanting opportunities in the hospitality industry, 
businesses in central Australia who desperately need tourism to do well uh, for that part of the country. They shouldn't be laughed at and mocked, Madam Acting Deputy President, in wanting to persevere in having access to $5 billion. But we've also seen, and it was on display this week, Madam Acting Deputy President, when the budget came down on Tuesday night, and for the people of the Northern Territory, we were told that Budget 2021 would include an additional $150 million for Northern Territory National Network's highway upgrades for strengthening and widening, and $48 million for road safety projects. But none of this funding, none of this funding, Madam Acting Deputy President, will hit the road in the coming financial year, and the Northern Territory will only see crumbs of the promised new roads infrastructure. But always there are strings attached to that kind of funding, isn't there, Madam Acting Deputy President? And let me tell you, I will certainly be investigating those strings. 99 per cent of new Northern Territory funding is beyond the forward estimates. Oh, let me repeat that. Let me repeat that. 99 per cent of the Northern Territory funding, new monies, is beyond the forward estimates, perhaps as much as three elections away. So hello, what do we have here? An announcement and no delivery, but announcement specifically for a purpose to either prepare for an election or bring about a great wedge amongst First Nations people who want to look after country. Our roads are on the never-never when it comes to this government. This will hold up vital development, jobs creation and the hope of new industries and economic development in remote regions. But what it also does, Madam Acting Deputy President, is it shows what's missing here. And what's missing is the genuine engagement with First Nations people across Northern Australia. Now, I know the NAIF and those board members on it will highlight the two projects that have been uh, involving First Nations people. When we talk about a mining company, an Aboriginal mining company in Western Australia. Now, I'd like to know more about uh, that relationship, Madam Acting Deputy President, but what I'd want to see is those First Nations groups who look after country, our rangers, our seafarers, looking after the sea country and their ability to engage in the NAIF, their ability to access this $5 billion. Where is the support and encouragement for them? Why is it that there has to be a siloed view that what you take from country is the only thing that is good enough for NAIF? How about giving back? And giving back not just with country, but giving back in terms of the cultural connection that First Nations people have with the different kinship groups right across Northern Australia, but also uh, in the desire to be able to create a home and family life with access to funds that ordinary Australians, most Australians, have. This is what I want to see with the bold correction that this NAIF requires. The bold correction of an enabling First Nations people to be consulted and genuinely engaged. Not come to last minute, Madam Acting Deputy President, and ask to sign off on things simply because it suits whoever it is that might be pushing forward a particular development in Northern Australia. We've seen far too many examples of that, and it's got to stop. Australia, it has to stop. It has to stop where First Nations people are just made to feel like that they come to the table when it suits those who are making the deals. There has to be thorough engagement. In the Northern Territory, when we see that there's only, and there is only, one or two projects that have come through in NAIF, that is not good enough for the people of the Northern Territory. Five, six years of waiting 
there cannot be another five or six years of waiting to come. Things have to change. Stop wasting the opportunity of the North. The government's amendments here to the NAIF, when implemented, are supposed to be a step in the right direction. But people in the North have every right to be sceptical of promises made by this government. Last week it was revealed that Keith Pitt used his ministerial veto power to block funding to NAIF-approved renewable energy project in North Queensland. And that project would have created 250 jobs and delivered cheaper, more reliable power for Cairns. It's just another example of this government neglecting the North. And in the Northern Territory, we have work going on into building one of the world's largest solar farms. The Sun Cable $22 billion project in the Barclay region includes a 10 gigawatt solar farm. It's a massive project and if it proceeds to financial closure very well may be locking or may be looking sorry to the NAIF for financial support. But even that project still needs thorough investigation in terms of the relationships with First Nations people. And that's not to put that project down, Madam Acting Deputy President. It's actually about reminding all businesses right across the country that we as First Nations people mean business. And we would like and need to be respected in that process. So we can't let the renewable energy dinosaurs on the other side veto another key project that could drive so much development opportunity in northern Australia. There are also many smaller groups, Madam Acting Deputy President, who want to use the natural resources of the wind and sun energy of the north. Let them do it. Encourage them. Provide an incentive within this program. So Labor is moving a number of amendments in this legislation, one of which would remove Keith Pitt's veto power so he can't put a stop to any more job-creating projects in Northern Australia. And also, Madam Acting Deputy Pre President, in a bid to encourage more investment into renewables, one of our amendments will allow the NAIF board to encourage projects that assist achieving net zero emissions by 2050. We'd also require for profit private sector projects to meet a rate of return in line with that of the Clean Energy Finance Corporation. And I'd like to add here, Madam Acting Deputy President, that Labor amendments require the inclusion of the Indian Ocean territories within the definition of Northern Australia. So a massive shout out to our constituents on the Cocos Keeling Islands and Christmas Islands because those families there, and yes, we have a family in detention who desperately need to get out, but I say thank you to the families around Christmas Island who are trying to work with us on many issues, but in particular that one that I've raised where we need to see a family in detention removed. So it's good that Christmas Island and Cocos Keeling Islands is um, is going to be, as far as Labor is concerned, uh, hopefully included in the, uh, in the definition of Northern Australia. Another one of our amendments, Madam Acting Deputy President, will require First Nations representation on the NAIF board. Currently, the NAIF board is made up of Western Australian and Queensland representatives. Now, I do understand there was a Northern Territory representative on there. Uh, in the initial stages who's retired, and that is Barry Coulter. But we do need to see First Nations uh, individuals and organisations represented as part of uh, NAIF going forward, and that is a recommendation or an amendment that we will certainly be putting forward. So, Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, in closing, I would just say that uh, the NAIF does need a bold correction. It has an incredible amount of faults. But $5 billion is not to be sneered at, and I urge this Senate, I urge the parliament to consider those Australians in the north who do not have access to the kind of wealth that is clearly out there for many others 
to use wisely this opportunity to enable those Australians to have a go. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise uh, today to speak in relation to this piece of legislation, which um, I must say I, th I find um, a pretty bad practice that the Senate is debating this uh, today without sending it uh, to a Senate inquiry first. This bill uh, should be being uh, inquired into and the ramifications on both our climate on our environment and, on, and our communities as a re result of this. Now, it seems pretty clear that the government is desperate to rush this through as quickly as they can. Why, you may say, Madam Acting Deputy President? Well, it's pretty easy because uh, the minister in charge has uh, made a promise, hasn't he, to his mates in the fossil fuel industry that they can get their claws into uh, some of this money, the $5 billion that's going to be extended. Uh, to allow uh, the fossil fuel industry to get another uh, handout from the taxpayer to prop up what is a uh, polluting uh, and incredibly damaging uh, industry uh, for our climate and our environment and our children's future. Now, it is the exact wrong way to go to be spending taxpayers' money opening up new gas uh, fields, uh, building uh, new gas pipelines, uh, propping up uh, the coal industry, when in fact we know the science is very clear. The rest of the world is begging Australia to get on board to transition our economy from one that is fuelled by dirty fossil fuels to one that embraces the clean green technologies that are going to power the world into the future if we're going to deal with dangerous climate change. We've been encouraged over and over and over again by countries that we often compare ourselves to, from the US to Canada to Germany to the UK. We've been told by the IMF, we've been told by the UN, we've been told by various economic think tanks around the world that as we grapple with the economic recovery from COVID-19, we should be investing in the transformation to a clean, green economy. And yet this bill and the uh, changes that this bill makes, coupled with the billions of dollars handed out to the fossil fuel industry under Tuesday night's budget, is the exact opposite. Uh, to investing in a clean recovery. In the United States, President Biden is spending $2 trillion in an infrastructure fund designed to invest in clean, green transformation of the economy. That is a good use, and that is a good use of stimulus funding and, infra and an infrastructure fund, the exact opposite to what we are being confronted with here today. Billions of dollars going towards gas and coal, dirty fossil fuels that are going to continue to pollute our environment and our planet. Germany, they're spending $47 billion on a green recovery. Canada, $36 billion on a green recovery. Now, if we were debating today billions of dollars going towards an infrastructure fund that was going to transform our economy to where we need to go, we would be backing it. But that is not what we're confronted with today. We're confronted with outdated, old thinking that puts public money into the hands of the dirty fossil fuel industry. And it's not just having to read between the lines of this bill that proves that that's what is going on here. The minister responsible has boasted about it. The minister responsible has made no qualms about saying he wants to open up more opportunities for the Beedaloo infrastructure financing. Public money being spent on dirty fossil fuels. Now, I always um, think the irony here from the conservative side of uh, the parliament. They're all okay for social spending when it comes to money for the fossil fuel industry, 
They're all okay with subsidies to the coal and gas industry, but oh no, we couldn't possibly give some money to the unemployed. We couldn't possibly give some money to environmental restoration. The hypocrisy in this place is rank, and this bill says it all. Not only has this minister, Minister Pitt, bragged and boasted that this extension of uh, the NAIF uh, scheme and that this piece of legislation will deliver for his mates in the coal and gas industry, but he's then used his veto powers to stop projects that are actually good for climate action, are good for transforming the economy. He vetoed a wind farm that had battery backup, exactly the type of project that we should be seeing infrastructure spending going towards, indus an industry that should be supported by this government. This minister has stood for stopping jobs. That project in Caban, in, in Caban uh, near Cairns in Queensland, was going to create 250 jobs. Minister Pitt is a job killer, a planet killer, and handing out cash from the taxpayers to his mates in the fossil fuel industry. That's what this bill is about. It's going to cost jobs, it's going to cost our environment, and it ultimately costs the budget. And when the rest of the world is transitioning, and in our trade negotiations with other countries, we're starting to be frowned upon by not uh, looking uh, towards a transition out of fossil fuels. We're, gonna, we're getting marked down for that. In our negotiations with the EU, they're starting to say, well, hang on a minute, we're not going to keep negotiating with a country like Australia if all you are doing is continuing to prop up polluting industries. It's starting to cost us around the world, not just in reputation, but it's starting to cost us in terms of our negotiations and ultimately our future economy. So it is a false economy, this piece of legislation. This is denial in the extreme. Five billion dollars for the rules to be rewritten so that it can just be handed over by the minister, by the fund, oh, which, by the way, this bill stops the NAIF board from really being any sense of independence by putting the department secretary on it. This is the Liberal National Party's slush fund for the coal and gas industry. Now, the Greens have been concerned about this from day dot in relation to this fund, and we raised serious concerns at the beginning, and now we're seeing the rules changed even more to make it easier for the slush fund. And I, I, I beg his belief, to be honest, that the Labor Party um, is not standing stronger against this, because at the end of the day, this is a slush fund for the LMP in Queensland, and that's all it is. Public money, $5 billion so that they can keep their mates in the coal and gas industry happy. Meanwhile, we've got everyday Australians who are struggling with zero wage growth, hundreds of thousands of Australians who are struggling to find permanent work, hundreds of thousands of Australians who are underemployed, Australians who can't afford to go to the dentist to get their teeth fixed because this government won't fund proper dental care. But they're more than happy to put $5 billion on the table for their mates in the dirty fossil fuel industry. Public money. Public money.
I will be moving an amendment to this piece of legislation. I know Senator Waters is moving a series of amendments which would stop this money going towards those projects that would make our climate worse. Fossil fuels. Would we stop putting public money behind fossil fuels, which is making our climate worse? You can't take seriously anyone from this government on climate action while under the table they're propping up the industry that's making things worse. The Senator Waters amendment will make it clear that this $5 billion should be going towards projects that are good for the planet, that help transition our economy, to put us in line with the countries where we always like to compare ourselves around the world. Canada, the US, the UK, Europe. We've got to stop making climate change worse. We've got a lot of work to do to try and stop it from getting, becoming dangerous and keeping temperatures below 1.5 degrees, but it's near impossible to do that while at the same time we're continuing to let the fossil fuel industry pollute and pollute and pollute. One step forward, two steps back. It's a false strategy and it is deeply buried in denialism and vested interest. So I hope there is support for Senator Waters' amendments. I'll be moving an amendment that says, at the very least, we shouldn't be spending $5 billion of taxpayers' money on projects that trash the environment, that run through conservation-protected areas. Now, I know this government's obsessed with spending public money on fossil fuels, but could we at least think about the rest of the environment, our national parks, our protected conservation areas? The farmland and agricultural areas that have been earmarked by their owners as being looked after for conservation. There are lots of parts of Australia that will be impacted by a number of these projects that the government wants to just push on through with taxpayers' money. And some of them, at this point, are listed to, be, to run right through or dig up in some of Australia's most unique environment and areas of nature putting at risk bushland, unique desert areas and threatening our native species. Now, if you can't come at stopping this money going to polluting fossil fuel industries, then at least do something about protecting the environment by which and on which these projects are being mooted uh, to be housed. Let's think about the fact that we need to protect our precious Australian outback, that our native animals that live in some of these places are found nowhere else on earth, and that once you've devastated their homes and they've become endangered and extinct, they never, ever come back. We need to be thinking more long term about the impacts of these types of projects on the climate and on nature, on our wildlife, on our precious places, on our bushland, on our grasslands, on our forests and on our unique desert. Handing out money to projects that degrade Australia's environment should be a no-go zone. We've already lost so much of what makes 
our environment so precious and unique. We've got to stop ruining the little that is left. It's important for the long-term survival of our wildlife and our native species, but it's important for Order. us Senator as a Hanson community Young. too. Senator Seward. Thank you, President. I rise to speak on the Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility Amendment Extension and Other Measures Bill of 2021. This bill seeks to extend the time frame and the remit of the Northern Australia Infrastructure facil uh, Facility. It will allow the facility to operate for another five years. Insert a departmental officer onto the NAIF board. What could possibly go wrong with that? No, yeah, exactly. No conflicts of interest there at all. Completely independent advice. Remove the requirement to gain. It will also remove the requirement to gain the support of the host state or territory for future projects supported by NAIF. In other words, it removes the state veto power. In other words, the Commonwealth can come in and fund a development in my home state of Western Australia, for example, in the magnificent Kimberley, which the state opposes which perhaps the First Nations peoples oppose. For example, a dam on the Fitzroy, something that I have opposed for as long as I can remember and campaigned against. But that might let the Commonwealth do that, because they think it's a very good idea, which of course it isn't. Order, Senator Seawitt. You'll be in continuation when debate resumes. It being 11.45 a.m., we'll move on. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Senator Ferravanti wells Thank you, Mr President. Pursuant to notice given yesterday on behalf of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation, I withdraw notices of motion proposing the disallowance of 15 legislative instruments as listed at item 5 of today's order of business. Are there any other notices of motion? Senator Rustin. Um, I seek leave to move a motion relating to the consideration of legislation today. We can do that now. Uh, is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Rustin. I move that a motion relating to the consideration of legislation may be moved immediately and determined without amendment or debate. Question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator. Oh, sorry. Um, Sorry, can you? I can't hear you, Senator Waters. You couldn't hear Senator Rustin's motion. All right, Correct. I'll, I'll, I'll Thank ask you. Sen I'll ask Senator Rustin, with the consent of the Senate, that's not that motion has been called. I'll ask Senator Rustin to move it again. That a motion relating to consideration of legislation may be moved immediately and determined without amendment or debate. So the question is that motion be agreed to? Motion okay. to the state of the chamber. Um, we. Uh, Below quorum, ring the bells, I think. Forum present. So the question is: the motion moved by Senator Rustin be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. no. The ayes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. The question is the procedural motion moved by Senator Rustin be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Dean Smith teller for ayes. Senator Seawitt teller for the noes. Ayes 37, noes 10. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senator Rustin. I move the motion as circulated. Question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. By Senator Rustin be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Smith teller for the ayes. Senator Seawitt teller for the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 36, noes 10. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senators, we will now move to the changed routine of business. Um, I have already dealt with notices of motion, um, so I will move, absent there being any further, to the consideration of a report from the Selection of Bills Committee. Senator Smith. President, I present the fifth report of 2021 of the Selection of Bills Committee, and I seek leave to have the report incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Question, Senator Smith. Senator McKim. Um, uh, thank you, President. Um, I would uh, like to move the amendment in my name that has been circulated. Um, and uh, that is that at the end of the motion add and in respect of the migration amendment clarifying international obligations for removal bill 2021 the provisions of the bill be referred immediately to the legal and constitutional affairs legislation committee for inquiry and report by 29th of june 2021 and i'd just like to offer a few observations um, if i might in support of the motion that the Greens are putting. Um, firstly, I just want colleagues to know that what we're all suffering under here is yet another dirty deal on refugees struck between the ALP and the LNP. Now, uh, now what this bill uh, seeks to do is undermine uh, a decision made last year by Justice Bromberg, who ruled, who ruled that um, the detention of a particular person known um, in that court case as AJL20, um, that that person's detention in immigration detention by the Commonwealth was unlawful and ordered the government to release him from detention immediately, and the ruling also entitled him uh, to claim damages. Now, Justice Bromberg further ruled in that decision that the government cannot hold people in immigration detention indefinitely for no reason. That is, that the government must be actively pursuing an outcome for the detainees they keep locked up, whether that be deportation or release into the community or to a third country. Now, um, what uh, the government is trying to do is uh, come in here with the support of the Labor Party and subvert Justice Bromberg's decision and make it easier for the government to detain people indefinitely in immigration detention. And I'll point out that the Labor Party took to the last election a policy of ending indefinite immigration detention onshore in Australia and providing a 30-day limit for immigration detention. And now here is the Labor Party ganging up with the government, doing a secret deal and a dirty deal with the government to once again do over refugees and make it easier for the government to detain people indefinitely. Now, that's not all that this bill does. The other thing that is extremely troubling that this bill does is, is, is that it includes a new power that would allow the government to reconsider a person's refugee status. So that even if someone has previously been found to be a refugee in Australia, the, de the department or minister could reopen that decision at any time under section 197D2 of the government's amendment act. Now, what this means, of course, is that someone could have been found to be a refugee a decade ago or a couple of decades ago um, in Australia. They could have uh, built a life here, built a home here, built a career here, established a family here, paid taxes here, lived here effectively as an Australian. And then the government can turn around and say, oh, well, the conditions in your home country have changed. It's now um, safe for you to go back. Tatars, off you go, go back to where you came from. And this is the government's philosophy that now apparently has been signed up to by the Labor Party of believing that our protection obligations are only temporary. Well, they're not only temporary, they should be permanent. If somebody is found to be a refugee and have fled because they have a genuine and well-founded fear of persecution, that should be permanent protection, and they should be put on a pathway immediately that would allow them ultimately to Australia obtain Australian citizenship, citizenship and reside here. But that's not what this bill does. It overturns 
that principle and will allow the government to reopen those refugee status determinations. Shame on the Liberal Party for bringing this bill on. It is a complex bill that should be referred to a Senate inquiry, which is what our motion is proposing. This bill has the potential to have massive, potentially life or death impacts on people's lives. And yet here, totally unsurprisingly, once again, are the collaborators in refugee torture, the Australian Labor Party who invented the last iteration of offshore detention, who have blood on their hands for exiling people to Manus Island and Nauru, once again coming into this place, teaming up with the LNP in order to do over refugees in this country. Shame on you all for even thinking about it and another layer of shame on you all for jamming this bill through the parliament with no Senate inquiry, with no opportunity for stakeholders to share their views with the Senate and to jam it through effectively without meaningful debate today. I mean, this bill was only introduced into the parliament this week and here it is being jammed through by an House motion that will have support from both the LNP and the ALP. Seriously, just when you think uh, life for refugees couldn't get any worse in Australia. Here we are. The question is, the amendment moved by Senator McKim to the Selection of Bills Committee report be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. The question is the amendment moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Seawitt, tell if the ayes. Senator Urquhart, tell if the noes. Him and what?
The result of the division is ayes 10, noes 33. The matter is resolved in the negative. I will now put the question on the adoption of the selection of Bills Committee report as moved by Senator Smith. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Senator Dunningham. Uh, thanks, Mr. President. I move that general business notice of motion number 1111 be considered during general business today. Okay. I'll, um, I'll ask. I'll ask Senator Dunningham to say it again, and I'll just check the microphones turned on. There's Senator Dunningham. Probably a bit much noise around you, but uh, I move that general business notice of motion number 1111 be considered during general business today. Question is that motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. I'll call the clerk. Mr. President, a postponement notification has been lodged in respect of matter of privilege notice motion number one for today, postponed to the 15th of June, and committees have lodged extension notifications as shown at item seven of today's order of business. I remind senators the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, I shall move to the uh, discovery of formal business. And it, this no longer has a hard marker by my reading of the motion, so we will be dealing with all matters um, on the notice paper today, and I'm just going to go through them in that order. I'll start with Senator Seward, Business of the Senate, matter number one. Uh, thank you, uh, President. I ask that uh, Business of the Senate mo uh, notice of motion number one, proposing a reference to the Community Affairs Reference Committee, be taken as formal. Uh, is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Seward. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Dunningham, Government Business. Thanks, Mr. President. I ask that Government Business notice of motion number two relating to the reference of time critical bills to committees be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this us? motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Dunningham. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Aye. So I'll now go to um, general business. Uh, Senator Senators Wong and Keneally. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr. President. On behalf of Senators Wong and Keneally, I ask that General Business Notice of Motion Number 1100 be taken as a formal motion. Any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There is. It's going to be a long morning. Question ma ma matter number uh, matter number 1102, Senator Urquhart. Is that General Business Notice of Motion Number 1102 be taken as a formal motion? Any objection to this motion being taken as formal? Senators Askew and O'Neill, line 103. Senator Askew. I ask that general business notion of notice of motion number 1103 relating to World MS Day be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? I'll just make the observation that this does not do the chamber any credit. Um, this particular session hasn't for a long time. Um, Senator McMahon, 1104. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1104 relating to the labour shortage in the Northern Territory and regional Australia be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? Yes. 1105, Senator Waters. Uh, thank you very much, President. I ask that General Business Notice of Motion number 1105, standing in my name for today, proposing the introduction of a bill, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Waters. I move that the following bill be introduced. A bill for an act to amend the Snowy Hydro Corporatisation Act 1997 and for related purposes. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Waters. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Snowy Hydro Corporatisation Act 1997 and for related purposes. Senator Waters. Thank you, President. I move that this bill now be read a second time and I seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. Is leave granted? It is. Senator Waters. I table an explanatory memorandum and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated into Hansard and to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? It is. Thank you, Senator Waters. 
1106. Senator Urquhart. Thank you. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1106 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, contrary, to the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senators Faruqi and Waters 1107. Senator Faruqi. Uh, Mr. President, I ask the general business notice of motion number 1107 relating to consent and respectful relationships education be taken as a formal motion. Any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Faruqi. I move the motion. Senator Dunham. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. The Department of Education, Skills and Employment are reviewing the Good Society website in consultation with a panel of experts, including Our Watch and Chanel Contos and a number of agencies that focus on preventing violence against women. The Good Society website was always designed to be a live and dynamic resource that's been, uh, that responds rather, to community expectations. Senator Roberts. Seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. Australian school students are Australian children and parents are the first educators of our children. It should not be left up to school programs, which are so often based on ideology of the day, to be educating our children in sex education. While we support schools complementing the work of parents in this area, primary age children cannot by default be taught about consent when they are not in a position to neither give nor deny consent. They are children. Our parents have the first responsibility to ensure their children are equipped to engage in respectful relationships. We will be opposing this. The question is the motion moved by Senator Faruqi be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
question is motion number 1107 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart tell if the ayes, Senator Dean Smith tell if the noes. The result of the division is ayes 27, noes 29. The matter is resolved in the negative. I urge senators to remain in the chamber. You'll need to be very quick to get back on a one-minute bell. Senator Small, 1108. You can do it from there, Senator Small. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, I ask the general business uh, notice of motion number 1108 related to Rotary Australia be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? Order, order, order. Senator Lambie, Senator Lambie. I'm trying to maintain the dignity of the chamber in a relatively challenging time. Senator Steelejohn, 1109. You can do it from wherever is most convenient, Senator Steelejohn. Since this is the only accessible desk, Mr. President, I'll do it from here. Um, I uh, would like to move general business notice of motion number 1109 uh, and ask that it be taken as a uh, formal motion. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Steele John. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. Climate change is a global problem requiring a global solution. And we are doing our bit by meeting and beating our emissions reduction commitments and by investing $20 billion in low emissions technology Order. to drive at least $80 billion of to total public and private investment by 2030. Our gas-fired recovery is focused on ensuring Australian gas works for all Australians. It is supporting a resurgence in our manufacturing sector, which more than 900,000 Australians rely on for their livelihoods. The Senator would be aware that the International Energy Agency, uh, Director uh, Fatih Birol, has said that carbon capture technologies are necessary on a global scale if we are to meet the Paris Agreement. Order. Order. Senator Watt. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Labor is the only party of government that is committed to climate action that creates jobs and reduces emissions. As the Greens Party, who will remain in permanent opposition, knows, stunt motions in this place achieve nothing. Only the election of an Albanese Labor government will create new Order. jobs while reducing Order. emissions. Some people in this chamber actually think it's important to win government and actually deliver jobs. Others prefer to sit in here and move stunt motions that will go nowhere. Senator, yeah, I'm just waiting for silence. Senator Roberts. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. So far we've had a global warming emergency, then we had a climate change emergency, then we had a climate catastrophe emergency, now we've got a climate collapse emergency. One thing we've never had is any empirical scientific evidence showing that carbon dioxide from human activity needs to be cut. 
I first challenged Senator Waters to debate me and to provide the scientific evidence ten and a half years ago. She immediately declined. Again in 2016, she declined. Again 602 days later, 602 days ago in the Senate. Nothing since. Because there is no such evidence justifying the collapse of our electricity sector. What is threatened here with extinction is not our planet, it is our civilization, and it is science. The question is the motion moved by Senator Steele John be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. no. The noes have it. Ring the bells. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is the motion moved by Senator Steele. John, be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Seawitt, tell if the ayes. Senator Urquhart, tell if the noes. The result of the division is ayes 9, noes 38. The matter is resolved in the negative. Now move to triple one zero in the name of Senators McCarthy and Dodson. Are you doing that, Senator Urquhart? Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number one 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 zero be taken as formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? Yes. We'll now go to motion number one 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 two in the name of Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Before I seek leave uh, to move this motion, I'd just like to add the names of Wong and Marielle Smith to the motion, so and Senator Patrick as well. Thank you. Um, I ask that General Business Notice of Motion uh, 112 uh, 
uh, to be taken as uh, a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Hanson Young. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. I beg leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. The Morrison government has committed $1.1 billion in women's safety as the down payment to the next national plan. There has been no cut to homelessness funding or a reduction of crisis accommodation by the South Australian government. To suggest otherwise is blatant fear-mongering. Under the reforms at Catherine House, crisis bed numbers will remain the same and at-risk women will continue to get the support they need when they need it. In 2020-21, the Morrison government will spend $1.6 billion specifically in payments to state and territories, states and territories under the National Housing and Homelessness Agreement. Question is the motion moved by Senator Hanson Young and others be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Now I assume we'll go back to the routine we've been adopting in recent weeks. Senator Dunningham. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I seek leave to move general business notices of motion 1103, 1104, and 1108 together, and for the motions to be determined without amendment or debate. Leave granted. No, Senator Dunningham. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that so much of the standing orders be suspended as would prevent general business notices of motion numbers 1103, 1104, and 1108 being moved together immediately and determined without amendment or debate. Question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Locked doors. The question is the motion moved by Senator Dunningham be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Dean Smith teller for the ayes, Senator Lambie teller for the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 57, noes 2. The matter have received an absolute majority. It is resolved in the affirmative. I will now put matters number 1103. Oh, it hasn't moved them. Senator Dunningham. Move the motions. The motions 1103, 1104 and 1108. I will put those motions together unless anyone objects. The question is those motions be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it on those three motions. Senator Watt. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I seek leave to move motions 1100, 1102 and 1110 and that they be determined without amendment or debate. The question is, though, I said yeah, we can't. No, I, I've actually got to put the procedural motion. Then we'll get to the separation of the motions, um, Senator Canavan. The question is, or is leave granted for that, Senator Watt? Uh, I move that so much of standing orders be suspended as would prevent me from moving motions 1100, 1102, and, one, and 1110. The question is, that motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is the motion moved by Senator Watt be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Dean Smith, tell of the ayes. Senator Patrick, tell of the noes. The result of the division is ayes 57, noes 2. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. I'll call on Senator Watt to move the motions. The question is those motions be agreed to. Senator, I'll come to you in a second. Senator Canavan. Senator Dunham. Thank you, Mr President. I'm going to ask on behalf of the government that uh, with regard to motion 1110, uh, that parts A, C, E and F be taken separately to parts 
B and D, and I'd also like to table our statements relating to all three sure. motions. Senator Canavan. Uh, sorry, Mr. President, I couldn't hear Senator Dunningham, but I wanted to indicate to vote differently on on 110. Yep. So separate A and B. So I'm not sure if I'm repeating. 1110. So all hear. right. So I will then. Okay. Put, I'll, I'll go through that. But you would like to be, have that considered separately. Uh, a and B. Okay, Senator. Sorry, uh, motion. Senator, sorry, I was about to call Senator Thorpe. I'll come to you in a second, Senator Watt. Senator Thorpe was on her feet. Mr President, I seek leave to make a short one-minute statement on 1110. Um, the motion was passed it, that to, uh, to can I do table? this without amendment or debate. I think you can seek leave to table it, Senator I Thorpe. I seek leave to table. Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Thorpe. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go to Senator Watt, who is next, then I'll go around the chamber. Senator Watt. Just to be clear, I think Senator Canavan's remarks were in relation to 1100. It's double one double oh. Senator Canavan, what was the subject matter of the motion? Just Oh, okay, so it's not Okay, sorry. I will amend my paper according. So that was eleven hundred as opposed to eleven hundred and ten. All right. Um, Senator Faruqi and then Senator To um, table a short statement on motion number one one zero two. Leave is granted. Senator Fruki, Senator Roberts. I too seek leave to table a short statement on uh, motion number 1102. Thank you. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Okay, so I'll come to motion 1100 and Senator Canavan, I'll read this out so I've got it correct. You would like me to put clause A and clause B of that motion separately? Thank you. So I will put clause A of motion number 1100, the subject matter be regarding um, Australians in India, amongst others. The question is that part of the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. All right, I do need some noise here to make a, an educated guess about the state of the chamber. Clause A. Those in support of that part of the motion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes, and I, I gauge the whips to keep their people in the chamber because I'll be ringing them for a minute after this for the remainder of the divisions.
lock the doors. The question is that clause A of motion number 1100 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart tell of the ayes and Senator Smith tell of the noes. The result of the division is 26 ayes, 27 noes. The matter is resolved in the negative. I will now put clause B of motion number 1100. Those in support of that clause say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Doors. The question is that clause B of motion number 1100 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart, tell of the ayes. Senator Smith, tell of the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 28, noes 23. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. I'll now move to matter number 1102 that was in the name of Senator Ayres. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. The noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is that motion number 1102 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart, tell of the ayes. Senator Smith, tell of the noes. The result of the division is ayes 26, noes 27. The matter is resolved in the negative. Senators, I'll now come to 1110, which is a little complex. The government has asked that clauses B and D be separated from the motion and dealt with separately. So I'm going 1110, the motion in the name of Senators Dodson and McCarthy. So I'm going to put clauses A, C, E and F in the first instance. The question is that those clauses of 1110 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. I will now put clauses B and D of that motion, 1110. The question is that those clauses be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. That, to my knowledge, concludes the discovery of formal business. So, under the motion that went before the chair, we call the clerk to call on consideration of. Oh, Senator Rustin is seeking the call. Senator Rustin. Okay. Um, sorry. Right one. Um, I seek leave to move a motion to vary the order agreed to early today. Is leave granted. Leave is not granted. Senator Rustin. Pursuant to a contingent notice standing in my name, I move that so much of standing orders be suspended as would prevent me from moving a motion to provide for the consideration of a matter, namely a motion to provide that a motion proposing to vary the order agreed to earlier today may be moved immediately and determined without amendment or debate. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute.
Sorry, Senator Seward. Order. People that have left the chamber, can we ring the bell for four minutes, please? Well, we were on. I was calling it for the convenience of the chamber, but if you uh, if immediately followed another division, if you insist, because it is a different matter of business, I will. I, I will. All right, then I will. I will start to very strictly enforce the standing order that allows me to roll divisions with one-minute bells um, for future divisions. I warn all senators that will be happening. If senators are going to do this, I, ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The question is the motion moved by Senator Rustin be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Smith, tell of the ayes. Senator Seawood, tell of the noes. The result of the division is ayes 40, noes 9. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senator Rustin. I move that a motion proposing to vary the order agreed to earlier today may be moved immediately and determined without amendment or debate. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is the second reading amendment moved by Senator Watt on sheet 1284 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point. Oh. Just giving the whips a moment. Point Senator Ciccone, tell of the ayes, and Senator Brockman, tell of the noes.
result of the division is ayes 25, noes 28. The matter is resolved in the negative. The question now is that the second reading amendments circulated by the Australian Greens on sheet 1274 and 1290 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is the second reading amendment circulated by the Australian Greens on sheets 1274 and 1290 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator C. What tell for the ayes. Senator Ciccone, tell for the noes. so the tellers can instruct the clerks.
The result of the division is ayes 9, noes 44. The matter is resolved in the negative. The question now is the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. The question is the bill be read a second time. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Brockman tell off the ayes and Senator Seawood tell off the noes and ask for a little bit of quiet to allow the tellers to do their job quickly.
The result of the division is ayes 47, noes 9. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. The clerk. The bill for an act to amend the Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility Act 2016 and for related purposes. I will now deal with the circulated amendments to this bill, starting with government amendments on sheet RJ117. I understand there is a supplementary EM explanatory memorandum to the amendments, and I call the minister. I table a sub supplementary explanatory memorandum. The question is that the amendments on sheet one RJ117 circulated by the government be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is that the amendments on sheet RJ117 circulated by the government be agreed to. The ayes will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Brockman, tell off the ayes, and Senator Seawitt, tell off the noes. The result of the division is ayes 46, noes 9. The matter is therefore resolved in the affirmative. I will now move to sheets of amendments circulated by the opposition. Senator Waters. And I seek leave to have an amendment on sheet 1292, which has just been circulated, um, which amends uh, Labor amendment on sheet 1247, just changes the date for carbon neutrality from 2050 to 2035. So, as this was not circulated prior to the cut-off, leave is required to move the amendment? Yep, and I'm asking, just explaining it to the Senate, is leave granted? I don't actually have it. Order, order. Senator Waters. It was circulated about 10 minutes ago. It just changes the, um, the year for carbon neutrality from 2050 to 2035. Okay, so what I'll do is, I was, uh, uh, yep, leave has been granted. Leave has been granted. So what I will do is, can I just 
call on you to move that formally, Senator Waters. Thank you, President. I so move uh, that Greens amendment on sheet 1292. Thank you, Senator Waters. So I was going to deal with a group of opposition amendments, but I'll put this amendment um, to amendment on sheet 1292, which amends a Labor amendment on sheet 1247, before I put that larger group of amendments. The question is that Senator Waters' amendment to the Labor amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is that Senator Waters' amendment on sheet 1292 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Seawitt tell off the ayes and Senator Ciccone tell off the noes. The result of the division is ayes 10, noes 42. The matter is resolved in the negative. So I will now deal with the amendments as circulated by the opposition on sheets 1, 2, 
146, 1247, 1248, 1273, 1277. The question is that those amendments on those sheets be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Sorry, I've just, with the consent of the Senate, I will cancel the division. I have been informed by the whips that there are some instructions from an absent senator that will require the consideration of these amendment sheets separately. So what I will do is await some information on which ones to put. Um, and if I could seek the guidance of a whip or a spokesperson um, about which amendment to put so I can separate the ones where you've got separate voting instructions. Um, on sheets one, two, four, six, yep. we can vote on that separately. Yep. Uh, actually, one, two, four, six, one, two, four, seven, and one, two, seven, seven, we can do together. And, I've, and the other two separately? And the 1248 and 1273 we can do together. Okay. Yep. So what I'll do is I will first put the, the amendments. Oh, sorry, Senator Brockman. Um, uh, sorry, Mr. President. We we uh, we don't. We you can't put four six and four seven together. One two four six and one two four seven. I've got different voting positions indicated on those two. Uh, one is an abstaining, so it doesn't matter. It can be put together. We, we just, just don't register. Um, I, an abstention would need to be put separately because it would be an absent vote from the chamber. Together. What I will do then, I'll, I'll reflect both whips. I can put one. I will put one two four six, then I'll put one two four seven. That can go one two seven seven. Is that okay? With That's you? an abstention. That is. Okay, yep. so we'll have three votes. The first yep. vote is this: that the amendments circulated by the opposition on sheet one two four six be agreed to. Aye. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. The have Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
oder Lock the doors. The question is that the amendments on sheet 1246 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Ciccone, tell for the ayes. Senator Brockman, tell for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 30, noes 33. The matter is resolved in the negative.
Senators, I'll now put the amendments on sheets 1247 and 1277. The question is, the amendments on those sheets be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is that the amendments on sheet 1247 and 1277 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Ciccone, tell her for the ayes. Senator Brockman, tell her for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 30, noes 34. The matter is resolved in the negative. Senators, I will now put the amendments on sheets 1248 and 1273 circulated by the opposition. The question is that those amendments be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute.
Lock the doors. The question is that amendments on sheet 1248 and 1273 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. I point Senator Ciccone, tell off the ayes, and Senator Brockman, tell off the nose. The result of the division is ayes 29, noes 34. The matter is resolved in the negative. I will now deal with amendments circulated by the Australian Greens. The question is, and I'm referring here to um, sheets 1268, 1278, 1280, 1281, 1282 and 1287. The first question is that items 25, 27 and 42 of Schedule 1 stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is that items 25, 27 and 42 of Schedule 1 stand as printed. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. I point Senator Brockman tell off the ayes and Senator Seawitt tell off the nose.
The result of the division is ayes 37, noes 11. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. The question now is that the remaining amendments on sheets 1268, 1278, 1280, 1281, 1282 and 1287, circulated by the Australian Greens, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Doors. The question is that the remaining amendments circulated by the Australian Greens on the sheet numbers I read earlier be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator to see what tell of the ayes and Senator Ciccone tell of the noes. The result of the division is ayes 10, noes 37. The matter is resolved in the negative. I will now deal with the amendments from the Australian Greens, which were circulated after 11.30 this morning. Hence, leave will be required for them to be considered. Is leave granted? It is. I'll just quickly call Senator Waters to move, formally move those amendments. Thank you very much, President. I move uh, and Green's amendments on sheet 1283, uh, circulated earlier, Thank you. Um, which says that we should fund Waters, we don't have time. new fossil no, fuel Waters, projects. Yep, well, the question is, those amendments be on sheet 1283 be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The noes have it. 
Division required, ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is that Green's amendments on sheet 1283 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator C. what tell of the ayes and Senator Ciccone tell of the noes. The result of the division is ayes 9, noes 39. The matter is resolved in the negative. Senators, the final matter is that the remaining stages of the bill be agreed to and the bill be now passed. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute.
Lock the doors. The question is the remaining stages of the bill be agreed to and the bill be now passed. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. I point Senator Brockman, tell off the ayes, and Senator Seawitt, tell off the nose. The result of the division is ayes 37, noes 9. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. I call the clerk. The bill for an act to amend the Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility Act 2016 and for related purposes. I thank senators. We now return to the routine of business, which will be question time. I'll give senators a moment to take their seats. Ask senators to take their seats. One ready, Senator Kitching. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health. Senator Colbeck. On Tuesday, the Treasurer said, and I quote, the assumption is that every Australian who wants to get two shots of the vaccine will be able to by the end of the year. Does this remain the Morrison government's position? The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Thanks, Senator Kitching, for the question. As I said this morning um, on the ABC, our objective is to offer every Australian the opportunity to have a vaccine before the end of this year, Mr. President. Mr. President, the uh, assumptions, the assumptions in the uh, budget papers are very different to government policy, in that the objective, Mr. President, is to offer uh, all Australians uh, access to a vaccine uh, by the end of the, this year, Mr. President. We have, as I said yesterday during question time, uh, continued to grow and develop the vaccine rollout based on the availability of vaccines. As more vaccine supply has become available, we have expanded uh, the vaccine rollout. We've uh, commenced with stage 1A uh, as we scheduled, and then we commenced the, pr the process in uh, vaccinating those in 1B as we scheduled. Uh, we've, brought on, uh, we've brought on GP practices and uh, 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 vaccination clinics around the country to uh, expand the vaccination rollout this week, Mr President. Uh, we're expanding the availability of vaccines. Senator Wong, on a point of order. Um, Mr. President, direct relevance. Um, Senator Kitching put a very clear quote by the Treasurer, Treasurer about the budget assumption. 
The simple question to this minister is whether or not that remains the government's position. I'd ask him to return the question. Senator Wong, you remind the minister of the question. I was listening to the minister. If, if he is talking about the government's policy on this matter, um, you asked whether this remained government policy. Does this remain government policy? Oh, government's position. Sorry, I don't think that substantively changes the point of order. Rule on the basis of the question. The quote was: the treasurer said, "Quote: the assumption is that every Australian who wants to get two shots of the vaccine will be able to by the end of the year." Does this remain the Morrison government's position? Okay, my apologies for getting the word position and policy juxtaposed, Senator Wong. Um, you're quite right there. I do not believe, however, that substantively changes my ruling, which is that if the, gov if the minister is talking about the if the minister is talking about the vaccination policy of the government, you are asking me to frame an answer for him and put words in his mouth, and I can't instruct him how to answer a question. It was narrowly constructed, and I'm listening carefully. And if he's only talking about the government's vaccination po policy, I believe that is covered and directly relevant to the question, even if it is to be debated after question time. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. And uh, it would be nice if Labor did listen to the answers that government members gave because, Mr President, uh, I, have, I have in my answer already directly addressed the question that was asked by Senator Kitchen, Mr President, uh, and I am providing additional information to the parliament uh, with respect to the vaccination rollout, Mr President. Uh, as of uh, uh, close of business on 12 May 2,828, 2,894,770 Australians have received a vaccination that's 882,284 in the last 24 hours, Mr. President. The vaccine rollout continues to gather pace as we have available more vaccines uh, and has been controlled by, vac by vaccine availability all the way Order, through. Senator as we've Colbeck, had more vaccine available, the answer has more expired. Senator Kitching, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. When asked this morning about the Morrison government's commitment for all Australians to have two vaccine doses by the end of this year, this minister said, and I quote, that's never been part of our plans. Who is correct? This minister or Treasurer Frydenberg? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. As I said, I stand by the, the, what I said this morning. I stand by my words this morning. I stand by my words this morning, Mr. President. Order. Uh, Mr. President, and, and, and all Australians would understand that as the vaccination rollout has progressed, Firstly, there's been the issue of supply, and as more supply has become available, we've had to uh, we, we have made more available to, to Australians, Mr. President. And once we understood the circumstances with respect to AstraZeneca, we, and and had, had the AstraZeneca as, had the AstraZeneca vaccine available to us, which required a 12-week period between the first and the second dose, Mr. President, that has had an impact on the rollout of supply. Of, of the vaccination rollout and, of course, the time at which people would have their first and second dose, Mr. President. So, Mr. President, we have continued, as we have additional access to, to vaccine, continue to roll out the vaccine. We've made it available to people through our various. Order, um, Senator Colbeck. Time for the answers expired. Senator Kitching, a final supplementary question. Thank you. In December last year, Minister Hunt said, and I quote, we expect that Australians will be fully vaccinated by the end of October. Which of the three different positions is actually the government's position? This minister's, Treasurer Frydenberg's or Minister Hunt's? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. As I've said a couple of times already today, Mr President, we, our objective is to have, to have offered every Australian who wants a vaccine uh, one by the end of this year. Every Australian who wants a vaccine will have available one by the end of this year. Mr. Order. So, Mr. President, Order. Mr. President, vaccination, Mr. President, vaccination, Order. Mr. President, is not compulsory, Mr. Order President. Of vaccination my is Order. not Senator compulsory. Senator Colbeck, please resume your seat. I actually can't hear my own voice, and I have the only microphone that's constantly turned on. Please, a little bit more silence, Senator Colbeck. Mr. President. Mr President, Order. vaccination is not compulsory, and so our objective is to provide to all Australians Order. who want a vaccination to have one available to them by the end of this year. 
uh, th we will continue to make available vaccines to Australians in that context as we continue the vaccination rollout and as vaccines become available. As more vaccines become available, we will put more into the rollout and, and we will open up more phases of the vaccination process to Australians as we get access to the vaccine, Mr President. Order. Senator McMahon. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister Order. for Sorry, Employment, Senator McMahon. I actually Workforce. can't hear you. Order. Order. Senator Wong, please. I need to be able to hear Senator McMahon's question. The Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, the fabulous Senator Cash. We are currently seeing many green shoots with our economic recovery. Can the minister outline how the Liberal and National Government's 2021-22 budget is securing Australia's economic recovery and helping employ more Australians? The minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and uh, I thank Senator McMahon for her question, and I acknowledge her deep commitment, in particular, uh, to the Northern Territory and ensuring uh, businesses stay in business and uh, jobs are created. And certainly, Mr. President, Australia entered the COVID-19 pandemic uh, from a position of economic strength. Those opposite, though, prior to COVID, they like to talk the economy down, but it was performing strongly, as we know. For the first time ever in 11 years, the budget was in balance. We actually had workforce participation in Australia prior to COVID at a record high. In excess of 13 million Australians were in work. And of course, as Senator Rustin well knows, we also had welfare dependency at its lowest in a generation. That is something that we should all be very, very proud of. Mr President, because of the strong fiscal position that the government was in at the time, it enabled us to respond decisively in putting in place a $290 billion economic support package. In terms now, though, of the government's economic and fiscal strategy, the budget very much does set out the economic recovery strategy that we have, in particular by supporting a sustainable private sector led growth and job creation. We are looking to drive down the unemployment rate lower than pre-crisis levels. And as we know in terms of workforce participation at this point in time, we still have now, even though we've been through COVID, more Australians are in employment than ever before. And in fact, the unemployment rate has fallen rapidly and is set to recover, Mr President, five times faster than the last recession in the 1990s. This is a government that is committed to putting in place the economic framework so that businesses can employ more Australians. Senator McMahon, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Um, Minister, can you please tell me how is the Liberal and National Government budget supporting regional Australians to get back into jobs now and into the future? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, supporting Australians in regional Australia, that is something that on uh, the Liberal and National side of politics we are very, very proud to do. And certainly uh, the budget that uh, came down on Tuesday night, it is well and truly supporting regional Australia's economic recovery, helping to create jobs and, more importantly, to grow regional industries. Senator McMahon, around 43,000 Australians last year moved from the city to regional Australia because they appreciate the benefits that are afforded to them in regional Australia. The budget that we handed down on Tuesday night it is investing, as we know, in infrastructure, regional infrastructure, right across the Northern Territory. This is all about, as Senator McMahon knows, making roads safer, reducing travel times, but at the same time supporting more than 900 direct and indirect jobs for Territorians. Again, this is a government that understands putting in place the right policy framework to create Order, more jobs Senator Cash, for Australians. Senator McMahon, a supp final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, over 947,000 jobs have come back into the economy since the trough of COVID. How is the budget 
continuing this jobs recovery. Senator Cash. And you're right, Senator McMahon. Almost a million people have now returned to work. Those jobs have come back into the economy since the trough of COVID-19. And that is something that we should be celebrating. Australians moving back into the workforce. And Mr President, the 2021 budget, that is the next stage of the Morrison government's economic plan to secure Australia's recovery. The budget is all about creating jobs, because that's what this government does. We create jobs, guaranteeing the essential services that Australians rely on, but also ensuring that we build a more resilient and secure Australians. And certainly we are putting in place the policy framework to do just that. Personal income tax cuts, creating more economic, economic activity. And when you create more economic activity, what do you do? You actually enable job creation business tax incentives to get businesses to invest in their businesses and to create more jobs, new apprenticeships, new training places. Again, this is a government that understands you put in place the right policy framework so businesses can prosper, grow and create Order, more Senator jobs Cash. for Australians. Senator Gallagher. Oh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Who was right? Minister Hunt, when he promised all Australians would be vaccinated by October, Minister Tian, when he said the goal is for all Australians to have a dose by the end of the year. Treasurer Frydenberg, who promised every Australian will get two shots of the vaccine by the end of the year. Senator Birmingham, who says people will still be getting vaccinated next year. Or this minister, who says <laughs> fully vaccinating Australians this year has never been part of our plans. Minister, with five different positions I've just quoted, put by five different ministers, <laughs> who is right? The minister representing the minister for health. Senator Thank Colbeck. you, Mr. President. As I have said to, um, on, as I said on radio this morning, and as I said in the two questions that I've been asked today, the objective of the argument of the government is to have uh, all Australians who want to have uh, a vaccine the opportunity to have a vaccine this year, Mr. President. That's the objective of the government. As we have more vaccine available. Uh, Mr. Pre Mr President, as we have more vaccine available, uh, we will increase the, av the availability to more people in Australia to get the vaccine. We started uh, with stage 1A Mr. President, uh, in February, then 1B in March, uh, and we have continued to expand the rollout as we have had more vaccine available. The availability of vaccine has always been the constraint in the context of the rollout and, of course, the rollout has also been uh, guided by the medical advice, Mr. President. So, the medical advice with respect to the AstraZeneca vaccine, where there's a requirement for a 12-week gap between the two doses, has had an impact on the uh, on the process of, of and the timing of the vaccine rollout, Mr. President. Uh, and if Labor were honest and they hadn't spent all of their time trying to undermine the confidence Order. in the vaccination rollout, Mr. President, they would acknowledge that. They would acknowledge that. The availability of vaccine, uh, the medical requirements and the advice of the health professionals which have guided the vaccine rollout have had an impact on the vaccine rollout all of the way through, Mr President. And as we've had more vaccine available, we've made it available to Australians and we have taken the advice of the medical and health experts in the application of the vaccine all of the way through. And that has, in, that has required, Mr. Mr President, some resets in, in the context of the vaccination rollout, Mr President. And we've been quite open and we've been quite honest with the Australian people about that as those circumstances have arisen. Order. arisen. Senator but, Mr Colbeck, President, the Labor Party time have not been honest. Has expired. Senator Gallagher, yeah. a supplementary question. I'll give the minister the opportunity to be honest with the Australian people. Will the minister now tell the Senate and the Australian people when will every Australian adult who wants a vaccine be fully vaccinated? Senator Colbeck. Mr President, as I've said a number of times today, every, every Australian who wants access to a vaccine, our intention is to make that available to them by the end of this year, Mr President. Mr President, the time of their full vaccination will be dependent on when they take that up, Mr President. Uh, and Senator Birmingham said 
uh, recently Order. that some, some, some Australians may still be getting vaccinated next year because that may be their choice, Mr President. If they have the first dose of a vaccine that's made available to them late in December, Mr President, they won't get the second dose of AstraZeneca if that's the choice of the vaccine they take up until 12 weeks later, Mr President. They are the simple facts. Our intention, as I've said a number of times today, is to provide every Australian who wants access to a vaccine to have uh, availability of that vaccine by the end of this year. I could not have been clearer, Mr President. If the Labor Party don't want to listen to the answer, uh, I can't help that, Mr President. Uh, I have been very consistent uh, with Order, all of Senator my answers Colbert, today. Order, time for the answer has expired. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. On page 15 of Budget Paper 1 of last year's budget, the government said a faster than expected COVID vaccine rollout would boost the economy by $34 billion. Where is the estimate of the cost of the botched rollout in this year's budget, and what is it? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, uh, clearly a, a budget assumption in last year's budget papers, and as I've explained to the Chamber, uh, as I've explained to the Chamber, the circumstances of the vaccine rollout have changed with the advice that's been given to us, the medical advice that's been given to the government with respect to the utilisation of the vaccine and the availability of vaccine, Mr President. So we have continued to roll out the vaccine and make it available to Australians in the context Order. of supply, Mr President, uh, and we will continue to do that. We will continue to roll out safely the vaccine to Australians, making available to them uh, uh, the opportunity to have a dose by, of the vaccine by the end of this year, this year Mr President. Uh, we will continue to do that. Those things, the availability of the vaccine, uh, vaccination process will be contingent on supply and as supply grows, we will make the vaccine available to more Australians. Order. Senator Rice. Thanks, Mr President. Um, my question is to the minister representing the foreign minister, who I understand is Minister Birmingham. Minister, in recent weeks, violence has engulfed Israel and Palestine, following the threatened evictions of Palestinian families from East Jerusalem, Sheikh Jarrah neighbourhood, and restrictions and violence against worship, worshippers at Al-Aqsa Mosque during Ramadan. In the last few days that violence has escalated, it's resulted in the deaths of 67 Palestinians and seven Israelis so far. Minister, do you agree that this latest devastating outbreak of violence stems from the unlawful and unjust occupation of Palestine by the Israeli government? And isn't ending the occupation the best way to end the violence? The Minister representing the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, Mr President. Uh, Mr President, uh, our government is deeply concerned by escalating violence in Israel, Gaza and the West Bank. Uh, we unequivocally call on all leaders to take immediate steps to halt violence, to maintain restraint and to restore calm. We also call on parties to refrain from unilateral actions that destabilise peace. The focus on all parties should be to return to genuine discussions as soon as possible. Australia has, Mr President, for many years supported a two-state solution, and this has not changed. We continue to welcome any initiative that can assist the resumption of direct negotiations between Israel and the Palestinians. We encourage the representatives of Israel and Palestinian representatives uh, to enter into good faith negotiations and discussions. In relation to issues of settlements, the Foreign Minister issued a statement on 1 July 2020, urging all parties to refrain from actions that diminish the prospects of a negotiated two-state solution, including acts of violence and terrorism, such as rocket attacks on civilians and land appropriations, demolitions and settlement activity. Australia regularly raises our position about settlement activity with Israeli authorities. Indeed, Prime Minister and Minister Payne have both done so. Prime Minister has already said that settlements can at times undermine peace and contribute to the stalemate, and that indeed is why the government continues to urge parties to engage appropriately order. in Senator discussions. Rice, I, sorry, Senator Birmingham, Senator Rice, on a point of order. On a point of order of direct relevance, I've been very, listening very closely, Minister, and my question was very specific: Isn't ending the occupation the best way to end the violence? 
respect, Senator Rice, I think the minister was being directly relevant, um, given there was a preamble as well. And I'll ask the minister to continue. Senator Birmingham. Um, thanks, thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, I have uh, stated the government's position uh, and also stated in that regard uh, the advocacy the government continues to make uh, to Israel and to representatives uh, of Palestinian uh, peoples. Senator Rice, a supplementary question. Thank you, President, and thank you, Minister. Um, Foreign Minister Payne's statement yesterday called for a halt to actions that increase tensions, including land appropriations, forced evictions, demolitions and settlement activity. Do you agree that these actions undermine progress towards a two-state solution? And can you confirm that the Australian government recognises that settlements in occupied Palestine are illegal under international law? Good question. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, we urge all that are involved in the current chain of violent events across Israel, Jerusalem, Gaza and the West Bank to cease provocations, to maintain restraint and to de-escalate the current exchange of fire and to halt the violence. The rocket attacks from Gaza into Israel are never justified and represent indiscriminate acts that fuel the cycle of violence and bloodshed. They must cease and we do note that Israel, like any state, always has a right to self-defence under the UN Charter. That, Mr President, did not change the government's position uh, in relation to the long-term importance uh, of discussion between the parties uh, and ensuring that the parties avoid all measures and matters uh, that can escalate order. the chance Senator of conflict Rice, and violence. Order. Yes, on a point Rice. of order of direct relevance again. Again, it's useful background information, but my question was whether these actions that we're talking about undermine progress towards a two-state solution and whether the government recognises that settlements in occupied Palestine are illegal you, under Senator, international law. Thank you, Senator law. Rice. Um, I take your point. Um, there were, it was a question regarding the activities of one particular party. Um, so I'll call the minister, uh, remind the minister of the question, and he has 14 seconds remaining. Mr. President, I stress again: the current violence, the current disruption, firmly undermines progress towards a two-state solution. It undermines peace and it threatens lives. And the government urges parties to desist from such violence and to return to discussions. Senator Rice, a final supplementary question. No answer to my first two. I'll try with a third. Minister, what actions is your government taking, both publicly and privately, to end the violence and particularly address the root cause of injustices suffered by Palestinians, namely the occupation of their country? Will the Australian government recognise a Palestinian state as a matter of urgency? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, uh, no, Mr President, uh, the government will not. Uh, the government's position remains consistent as it has been in relation to supporting a two-state solution, urging parties to work towards that in their discussions, uh, and, of course, were that to be reached, then further steps in that regard would be considered by the government. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator Reynolds. Queensland is the most decentralised state in Australia and in 2020 had the highest internal migration of any state. Can the minister confirm that in Tuesday night's budget, Queensland received the lowest rate of new infrastructure funding per person of any state? The minister, the minister representing the Minister nuts. for Infrastructure, Hello, Transport nuts. and Regional Development, Where are the Senator nuts? Reynolds. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and thank you very much, Senator Watt, for that question. Uh, what I can confirm is what the government has uh, done in this budget, and again, it's a $110 billion pipeline of infrastructure projects around the nation over the next 10 years, including, including in Queensland. Uh, for example, the $400 million for the Bruce Highway Edition funding. Uh, and many, many other projects, Senator Watt. So, for example, the $400 million 
for the inland freight route uh, from Mundagai to Charters Towers for the upgrades there, $240 million for the Cairns Western Arterial Road duplication, $160 million for the Munala River interchange upgrade order, for Senator packages Reynolds. one and two, Senator Watt and an additional— Senator Reynolds, I have Senator Watt on a point of order. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. On relevance, we didn't ask the minister for a list of projects. We've all seen them. The question was specifically about whether Queensland received the lowest rate of new infrastructure funding per person of any state. Um, Ministers are provided with uh, on the point of order, or, 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 or sorry, I wasn't sure if you wanted to make point on the point of order, Senator Reynolds. Ministers are given two minutes to answer the question. The minister has been going for 40 seconds. I've allowed you to remind the minister of the last part of the question. Um, I note the minister was speaking about matters related to the state of Queensland, which was covered in both parts of your question, but I'm listening carefully and she has um, 80 seconds remaining to answer. Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. And I can confirm that this uh, investment in Queensland is actually in addition to the $1.3 billion uh, that was committed in the last year's budget. And that included projects such as the Coomera Connector Stage 1, the uh, M1 Pacific motorway upgrade, the Centenary Bridge upgrade, Currumbin Creek Roads uh, intersection upgrade, Order. the Mount Lindsay Highway upgrade, Order. the Beams Road open level crossing, the Riverway Order. Drive, the Bruce Highway upgrade strategy. Uh, so Queensland is an integral part of this government's $110 billion infrastructure program. And Queensland, like all other states and territories, are being funded by billions of dollars and thousands and thousands of jobs. Order. Senator Watt, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister confirm that of the infrastructure funding the Morrison government did allocate to Queensland, only 1 per cent will actually start being spent before the next federal election? Oh Senator Reynolds. Mm. Well, in addition to the infrastructure programs, of course, we have the city deals. Uh, and, uh, for example, the city deal in Townsville, because this government is committed to making our cities more productive. So we're investing $381.7 million in the Townsville city deal. Uh, the Horton Pipeline Order. Stage 2, uh, the Port of Townsville Channel upgrades and the city deal job creation. So far from... Uh, leaving Queensland behind. Queensland, across many government programs and infrastructure projects, is receiving billions of dollars from the federal Order. government, which is creating thousands and thousands of jobs right across Queensland. Senator, what a final supplementary question. At the last election, the Morrison government committed to spend $287 million upgrading the Ca Captain Cook Highway in Cairns, $195 million building a new water pipeline in Townsville and $100 million upgrading the Linkfield Road interchange in the electorate of Dixon. But construction on those projects has not even begun. With this record of promises not being delivered, why should any Queenslander believe the government's new Order. promises in this year's budget? Order. Again, I remind senators. I n Order. Oh, Senator Reynolds, take your seat. I'll call you when I can hear you. I will ask senators again on my right on that occasion to not interject while questions are being asked. Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr President. And there is a reason in this budget that we have made it use it or lose it provisions, because the state governments uh, regularly get allocated money from the federal government and do not spend it as we Order. have agreed. So, you, Order. The Senator talks about water projects. Well, in the, this budget, the Australian government's committed to an additional $7.5 million towards the Rookwood Weir, half a million dollars towards the second stage of the Warwick Recycled Water and Treatment Upgrade, and there are many more. It is one thing for the federal government to Order. allocate the money, Mr. President, Senator but McGrath the state government what? has to deliver them. So I suggest that the question should be better directed towards the Queensland Premier. Senator Hanson, oh, order. Have you got a number? Order. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. Actually, I can answer Murray Watt's question there. Get the Senator, Labor Party Senator out Hanson, of the way from roadblocking a lot of the federal your... government Senator funding Hanson. in Queensland. That's what you need Senator to do. Senator Hanson, right. you're my... running down your own clock. I know, I know. My question is Senator Birmingham, representing the Prime Minister and Treasurer. The State Grid Corporation of China is a 60 per cent shareholder in a foreign-owned company trading as Gemini. 
Gemini owns electricity generation assets and is the second largest owner of Australia's gas pipelines, including gas pipelines in Queensland. Gemini pays no tax in Australia because it says it has borrowed at 10.5 per cent from its parent company. Gemini says it is subject to an ATO audit for transfer pricing because of this arrangement. Despite a serious trade war with China, Gemini is seeking funding from the Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility for the proposed pipeline from Mount Isa through the Galilee Basin to Roma. My question is, how much money is the federal government planning to loan to the Chinese government so China can own critical infrastructure assets in Australia? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Hanson uh, for her question. It's, uh, it's a serious question in relation to the protection of critical infrastructure and security assets uh, across Australia. Uh, and indeed, our government has moved uh, in successive points over the years to make sure that we tighten areas of foreign investment laws, uh, that we ensure, for example, uh, that asset sales by state or territory governments that previously were not captured uh, for foreign investment. Uh, approval processes are now captured under those processes. Uh, through our security of critical infrastructure reforms, uh, we've also put in place new measures and are strengthening those measures even further in relation to how it is that crucial critical infrastructure assets, such as our energy systems and communication systems, uh, are appropriately protected uh, from uh, risks in relation uh, to um, uh, cyber attacks or other types of attacks uh, that could undermine their operations and, through that, the nation's security. Uh, Senator Hanson, you raise uh, questions in relation to an apparent application uh, to the Northern Australia Infrastructure Fund uh, for a particular project. Uh, in relation to that particular project, uh, I would give you the assurance that our government will make sure uh, that all security implications uh, are considered. Uh, the minister has uh, a power of veto uh, over final decisions under the Northern Australia Infrastructure Fund uh, and, of course, uh, in relation to matters of security concerns, would, if appropriate, uh, use that power. Senator Hanson, a supplementary question. Thank you very much. Foreign powers are avoiding government review under the Foreign Acquisitions and Takeover Act of 1975 by starting new businesses, like the proposed Gemini pipeline through the Galilee Basin. When will the government plug that loophole? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, a couple of points to, uh, to that, Senator Hanson. Um, uh, one is the security of critical infrastructure reforms that I have outlined to do uh, have a reach around areas of licensing and other factors uh, that can allow government to control those who operate in certain sensitive sectors like the telecommunications industry and like parts of uh, the energy sector. Uh, I would also note uh, that the reforms to the foreign investment uh, and acquisitions uh, laws that we have, uh, have uh, outlined and, uh, and introduced include measures that ensure where a company has been granted approval to operate in one sphere and then uses that uh, to uh, expand into areas that may be sensitive and would be contrary to Australia's national interest. Uh, there are now call-in powers uh, that the Treasurer uh, can exercise uh, and can withdraw certain rights and approvals uh, to companies if they do so. Senator Hanson, a final supplementary question. Energy Australia, owned by China Power and Light, is reported to be receiving an early Christmas present from the federal government in the form of a $5 million gift card to help pay for its new Tullawarra B gas power plant so it will be hydrogen ready. How much does the, does the federal government plan to gift to foreign-owned companies who don't pay tax in Australia? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, th thanks, Mr. President. Well, the question touches on a few points. Certainly, our government uh, continues to pursue measures to ensure energy security across Australia, uh, to ensure uh, that uh, we do have a reliability of supply, and, uh, and that indeed uh, requires, at times, uh, the um, the driving of investment decisions forward in relation to generation of new energy in certain sectors. Uh, however, Senator Hanson, in, uh, in relation to uh, the particular uh, grants or supports, uh, I would emphasise to you that we always make sure uh, that 
uh, companies are operating within Australia's laws, and indeed our government has taken various steps over the years to make sure that global tax avoidance uh, measures uh, have been taken in Australia, uh, that we tighten those laws, and we are in fact yielding some billions of dollars in additional tax revenue as a result of measures that have been taken to tighten areas of global tax avoidance. Senator Van. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Seselja. Can the Minister outline how the Morrison government's 2021-22 budget secures Australia's energy needs, secures Australia's economic recovery and protects jobs in our regions and in our cities? Minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Seselja. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. President. I thank Senator Van for the question. And yes, I can. The Liberal National Government is securing Australia's recovery uh, with investment in more than $1.8 billion in the 2021-22 budget to boost jobs and to su support affordable and reliable energy. Now, through our technology, not taxes approach, this year's budget will continue to provide reliable, secure and affordable energy to all Australians, uh, and to increase investment in technology solutions to reduce emissions in a way that supports jobs and economic growth. Australia's competitive advantage has always been based on cheap energy, and gas will be central to our ongoing economic recovery. We're advancing our gas-fired recovery and ensuring that Australian gas is working for all Australians, with $58.6 million to support new initiatives. We're taking action in three key areas to boost the East Coast gas market across the entire supply chain. Uh, we are unlocking supply, delivering an efficient pipeline and transportation market and empowering gas customers. We have delivered on the National Gas Infrastructure Plan interim report, which shows that both local production and new infrastructure is needed to alleviate the forecast shortfall in southern states. Now, the government can't sit back and allow the gas shortfall to eventuate. It would have a devastating impact on the economy. Uh, that's why we're backing the critical projects through $38.7 million of targeted support. Without the action we're taking to address supply, industry and households will be faced with higher prices from price gouging energy companies and more blackouts, just as South Australia experienced in 2016. On this side, we understand that gas is a critical enabler of Australia's economy. It supports our manufacturing sector, which employs over 900 thousand Australians, many in the regions. Gas will be critical to providing the dispatchable and affordable power generation we need to keep prices down Order. while Senator also deploying Selger, new technologies the into the expired. system. Senator Van, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. How is the government investing in our regional industries and supporting job creation across Australia? Senator Seselja. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, our investments in this year's budget will create more than 9,000 jobs across the country, uh, grow our economy and ensure Australia continues to meet and beat our international commitments. And I know Senator Wish Wilson will be very pleased with that. Through the 2021-22 budget, we are investing an additional $275 million to accelerate the development of an Australian hydrogen industry. And this new funding will increase the government's total support for a hydrogen industry to over $845 million. This package will support an additional four regional hydrogen hubs. This is in addition to the $70.2 million committed in last year's budget for the first hydrogen hub. And we'll look far and wide around the nation for potential hub sites, from the Air Peninsula in the south to Darwin in the north. Uh, and together with our investments uh, in carbon capture and storage, this will create around 2,500 jobs, delivering on our technology-led plan to secure the economic recovery and continue the jobs growth Order, we've achieved. Order. Senator Seselja. Senator Van, a final supplementary question. Can the minister advise of other measures in the budget that will ensure all Australians have access to secure, reliable and affordable energy? And is the minister aware of any risks to this approach? Senator Seselja. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, unlike those opposite, uh, Liberals and Nationals understand that delivering affordable, reliable and secure energy is absolutely critical to protecting jobs and securing Australia's recovery. That's why our budget funds new gas generators and invests in the technologies we need to lower prices for families and businesses. Now, what's Labor offering? Just what their Greens counterparts would, would like. They only have a recipe for more taxes, more power blackouts and higher prices. They've got Chris Bowen 
uh, in charge of energy policy, who has never seen a tax he didn't like. They've got Murray Watt, who continues to pretend to support the resources sector. They are completely divided when it comes to the role of gas in the system. They apparently have an energy plan for 2050, but not 2030. They simply can't be trusted uh, to deliver the reliable, affordable energy Australians deserve. We reject Labor's attempt to hoodwink Australians. Australians know that it will be technology, not Order. taxes, that Senator will secure Sussurra, our recovery, and that's exactly what this— Senator Hanson Young. Thank you. My question is to Minister Birmingham, representing the Prime Minister. Tuesday's budget was a shocker for the planet. With just 0.3 per cent, 30 cents in every $100 of budget spending dedicated to addressing climate the climate crisis and just 0.2 per cent of the budget, 20 cents in every $100, dedicated to the environment, the environment is suffering. Why did the Morrison government make the environment and climate change the biggest losers out of this year's budget? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, I do completely reject Senator Hanson Young's question and assertions in her question. I invite Senator Hanson Young to take a look at the ocean strategy outlined in the budget and to see the measures there, measures indeed Order. consistent with a blue economy. I invite her to take a look at the waste reduction strategy there, measures consistent with our government's action to ban the export of recyclables and waste from Australia. I invite her to take a look indeed at the climate and emissions reduction measures that are there outlined in detail and, Mr President, most importantly, delivering results, delivering results that are ensuring we are avoiding, according to the forecast of our emissions, we will avoid in the order of 250 million tonnes of emissions each year by 2040. This is building on the fact that we have continuously met and exceeded our nation's commitments. We expect to see around $20 billion of investment in low emissions technology over the decade to 2030 as a government helping to secure around $80 billion in total investment from the private sector and governments. It's working, it's meeting and beating our targets, and we're committed to policies that will continue to do so. Senator Hanson Young, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Funding for biodiversity protection has fallen under this government since they were elected in 2013 by 28 per cent. Spending on biodiversity is to fall over the next three years to make it half of what it was in 2013. How many more native species and Australian members of the Australian wildlife family will be extinct before this government starts funding biodiversity properly? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr. Mr President, we're going to continue to invest in those areas that are essential towards our environmental protection. I don't, accept, I don't accept the assertions in relation to the way in which the Greens have made their own budget calculations. It will come as little surprise to anybody uh, that I'm not accepting the assertions or the ideas that the Greens' budget calculations are likely to be accurate, truthful or honest. Uh, so, Mr President, you know, I give the commitment that our government continues to invest practical environmental initiatives to improve our landscape across Australia, to protect our oceans, to deal with waste and to reduce emissions. Senator Hanson Young, a final supplementary question. Minister, why does this budget do nothing to save koalas from extinction by 2050? Why does this budget do nothing to save swift parrots from extinction? Why does this budget do nothing to protect platypus, quolls, pygmy possums, potteries and the hundreds of other species that are left on the list? Our wildlife is suffering and you are doing nothing. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, that's just not true. It's a falsehood from the Australian Greens and, yet and, and yet another one indeed, Senator Abetz. It's unsurprising to anybody on this side of the chamber or to anybody who has heard the Greens over the years claim, of course, endlessly, endlessly that things aren't happening when in fact they are. We've all heard, we've all heard the Greens say that we wouldn't meet any of our emissions reduction targets over the years, and yet, of course, then each time we do meet them, we do exceed them. Uh, and so the Greens say this endlessly. Yes, we take very seriously the importance of wildlife protection, preservation, of course, of endangered species, uh, and the pursuit in relation to measures and policies to help support them is one we will continue. Senator McCarthy. Mr President, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator Reynolds. Can the Minister confirm that 99 per cent of new infrastructure funding 
announced on Tuesday for the Northern Territory is beyond the forward estimates. Oh, really? The Minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, Mr President. I thank the Senator for the question. And I can confirm that since 2013, the Australian government has committed more than $3.2 billion for infrastructure in the Northern Territory. And in the Senator 2021 McCarthy, budget— Senator Reynolds. Senator McCarthy on a point of order. Uh, Mr President, my point of order is that uh, we're talking about beyond the forward estimates. Thank you. Um, the minister has been speaking for 13 seconds. Um, I'm listening carefully to the minister's answer. You've reminded the minister of the conclusion of your question. Um, I will listen carefully to the minister's answer. I call her to continue. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. And uh, my key message is that there are many, many different programs across the federal budget over multiple budget years uh, that are putting money into the Northern Territory. So not only are the city deals, for example, for the city of Darwin is a 10-year partnership, and that's $320 million. Uh, in this budget alone, we've got $150 million for phase two of the Northern Territory National Network highway upgrades, $173 million towards a six corridor under the roads of strategic importance and uh, 300 million, sorry, three million dollars for a development study for a order. proposal Senator of Tennant McCarthy. Creek. McCarthy. Senator McCarthy, sorry, Senator Reynolds. Senator McCarthy on a point of order. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, point of order on relevance. Uh, the question is beyond the forward estimates. So, I have been listening carefully to the minister's answer, and I've allowed you to specifically remind her of that. If a question asks about a matter in the budget paper in a portfolio area, the minister is constraining her comments to, to, in essence, infrastructure projects in the Northern Territory. If I'm being asked to, to insist that she uses words to address the, uh, the point of order in the specific nature you make it, I believe I'm crossing the line into instructing a minister how to answer the question. The minister is not straying into broader commentary about alternative policies, but is speaking about infrastructure in the Northern Territory. I believe that is directly relevant. Um, there is, of course, the opportunity after question time to debate it. Senator Wong on the point of order. On the point of order, and I am not clear whether the minister is continuing to speak about the past, but what I would submit is that a question about the forward estimates and beyond, that an answer that refers to past investment is not directly relevant to the question. I mean, temporally it makes no sense to suggest that you can answer a question about future spending only by, by referencing past spending. I think, to be fair, the way I heard the minister answering the question was the minister was addressing and listing projects currently underway, not within the forward, not with, not beyond the forward estimates. I think going into the territory of instructing a minister that in a portfolio area they can't talk about the budget to that degree of specificity is actually getting into the content. At, no, if um, the minister is talking about projects that are currently underway but they are within the forward estimates, there's an opportunity to debate whether the minister has answered the question to your satisfaction after question time. But I don't think I can say that's not directly relevant because there's no broader because the minister is constraining her comments to that specific issue of that policy area. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. And the point I was making is that we have been supporting the Northern Territory in a wide range of infrastructure projects uh, for all of the budgets, I believe, that we've had on, since coming into government. And don't forget that we do this in partnership with the Northern Territory government. And in fact, we support projects uh, that they put forward and that are shovel ready. So I've just had a look here over the last budget and this budget. I can count at least 30 separate projects which are in various stages of construction, and some are in planning, some are in approved, and they go out well, well into, well beyond the forward estimates. So the fact that funding goes beyond the forward estimates is a good thing because that means there is a steady pipeline of projects in the Northern Territory to sustain jobs probably for at least a decade, if not more. So that, I think, is a great thing done by this government. Senator McCarthy, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Can the minister confirm that 87 per cent of the newly announced infrastructure spending for Victoria announced in this year's budget is beyond the forward estimates? Senator Reynolds. Uh, I'd have exactly the same answer as I did for the Northern Territory. 
is there are very significant projects across multiple uh, projects uh, that have been funded in this year's budget. Again, it's done in consultation with the Victorian government in terms of the readiness of the projects and in terms of the duration of the project. Senator McCarthy, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. On average, the Morrison government delivers $1.2 billion less a year on infrastructure than it promises. Last year, Mr. Morrison delivered $1.7 billion less in infrastructure, and how much less than promised will be delivered this financial year? Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. President. And like many things those opposites say, that is simply not true. This government has got a $110 billion 10-year infrastructure program. Uh, and it is very clearly laid out in the budget, and we are spending more on infrastructure year on year. And we do that in partnership with the state and territory governments. Senator Bragg. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Superannuation, Financial Services and the Digital Economy. Senator Hume, how is the Morrison government securing Australia's recovery by implementing policies to enable Australia to become a leading digital economy and society? The Minister for Superannuation, Financial Services and the Digital Economy, Senator Hume. Thank you, Mr President, and I'd like to thank Senator Bragg for his question, his enduring interest in Australia's digital economy and progress. Digital technologies play such an important role in our daily lives, but perhaps no more so than in the last 18 months. They've helped businesses to stay afloat, for people to interact and transact in new and different ways. And they've also enabled people to get access to life-saving and information and services. The Morrison government knows that getting the set policy settings right now will ensure that Australia's prosperity continues over the next decade and beyond. And that's why, Mr. President, I was incredibly proud to stand with the Prime Minister last week and announce the $1.2 billion digital economy strategy. This strategy is a living plan designed to ensure that we have the right infrastructure, skills, settings and services in place. It outlines our digital growth priorities. It will make it clear what we need to do to achieve that ambition, and they include things like lifting our digital capability and adoption across small and medium businesses to support new ways to work and grow, incre increase profitability and, of course, save time, for example, through uh, a $15.3 million enhancement to uptake uh, e-invoicing to save time and money for businesses, supporting globally competitive export sectors operating at the digital frontier, including manufacturing, mining, agriculture and construction, and, of course, building the emerging technology capability and accelerate the growth of tech startups such as fintechs, regtechs and digital games to drive an uplift in the rest of the economy. And this uh, broad package, Mr President, has been received extraordinarily well. Fintech Australia CEO Rebecca Schott-Guppy said the announcement was welcome news for the entire technology and startup ecosystem. The BCA said that the digital economy was a win -win, the digital economy strategy is a win-win, and the Interactive Games and Entertainment Association said that the games offset, tax offset, a key part of that strategy, was one of the most significant to be implemented anywhere in the world. Yeah. Senator Bragg, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, how is the government investing in technology and skills to support job creation and economic growth following the COVID-19 pandemic? Mm. Senator Hume. Mr President, the Morrison government understands the importance of the digital e technology to, uh, to Australia's economic recovery, and that's why we've announced this $1.2 billion package to ensure that we have the right infrastructure, skills, services and settings in place to assure Australia's ongoing prosperity. For example, we're investing $124 million in AI initiatives to grow the next generation of AI experts and help small and medium enterprises leverage technology to boost productivity. We're investing $12.7 million into the exp expansion of the hugely successful and oversubscribed ASBAS program to ensure that 1,700 businesses get access to services that will help them grow and leverage digital technologies. And these are just a handful of the initiatives put into place to ensure opportunity, growth and jobs for all Australians now and to, into the future. Senator Bragg, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you. Uh, how is the government working to help people have greater control of their data? Senator Hume. Mr President, this is a matter very close to my heart. Empowering individuals and businesses to have better control and gain benefit from their own data that's collected by industry is an important part of the Morrison government's $1.2 billion digital economy strategy. $111, sorry, $111 million will help accelerate the economy-wide rollout of the consumer data right, which will provide enormous opportunities for reg techs and fintech startups to drive competition, building new products and services to help consumers manage and understand their data and get better value 
value from products and services providers such as telcos, banks and energy companies to save time and save money. And importantly, the consumer data right is delivered in partnership with industry and has privacy settings embedded into its design to ensure it's a safe and secure system. Here. Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, my question is to the Minister for the uh, National Disability Insurance uh, Scheme and Government Services, Senator Reynolds. Yesterday, the Prime Minister said that the Australian Federal Police had given the go-ahead for Mr Gaitchens to resume his investigation into uh, who knew what and when about the alleged rape of Ms Higgins in the uh, Minister's ministerial office. Has the minister been interviewed by Mr Gaitchens? The Minister for Government Services and the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Reynolds. No. Senator Farrell. Thank you. Yes, I have another supplementary question, uh, <coughs> Mr President. Uh, have any of the minister's staff been interviewed by Mr Gaitchens? Senator Reynolds. Uh, not to my knowledge. Senator Farrell, a final supplementary question. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr President. I do have a final uh, supplementary. Can the minister guarantee that neither she nor a member of her staff inform the Prime Minister or any of his staff of the alleged sexual assault prior to the 12th of February this year? Senator Reynolds. Senator Farrell, that really relates to the ongoing AFP inquiry that I addressed in my uh, comments yesterday. Order. And I certainly have no desire to prejudice that, that investigation. Order. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Mr President. My question is for the Minister for International Development and the Pacific, Senator Seljar. Can the Minister update the Senate on how the Morrison government's budget will help create a safer, healthier and more prosperous Pacific region? and how securing the Pacific's recovery helps secure Australia's own recovery. The Minister for International Development and the Pacific, Senator Seselja. Uh, thank you very much, and I thank Senator Patterson for the question. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has caused immense disruption here in Australia and across our region. And our response is simple. We are supporting Australians and we're supporting our region. And through this budget, the government is investing in an open, inclusive and resilient Indo-Pacific region. Now, Labor uh, is maintaining an outrageous lie that we have cut development funding in the budget. Let me be perfectly clear. We've maintained Australia's baseline $4 billion ODA budget, which will continue over the forward estimates rising in the out years. And in response to the pandemic, the government is delivering $1 billion worth of additional investments over the years to 2023 24, over $800 million this year and next. Uh, we make no apology uh, for the government front-loading these investments. Uh, is Labor really arguing that we should hold off on supporting our neighbours at this critical time as they are dealing, as they are dealing with... No, well, you got it wrong. You Order. got it wrong. The government, we're, we're not going to take your advice and hold it back. Hold back the additional assistance at a time of crisis. The government has demonstrated again and again that we will allocate new funding in response to the need Order. now right region. COVID-19 has created a highly Order. international Senator environment. McAllister. And the government's temporary and targeted measures are exactly the right tool to respond to that environment. In the year ahead, we'll provide $262 million to support our region's vaccine procurement, $156 million to address the economic impacts of the, of the pandemic. And in 2021, we delivered approximately $1.7 billion in ODA to the Pacific, over 50 per cent higher uh, than Labor delivered to the region when last in office. So we're not going to be lectured to by the Labor Party about our commitment to support our Pacific family and our Pacific neighbours. Senator Patterson, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister outline how supporting our partners in the Pacific to tackle and recover from the COVID-19 pandemic as quickly as possible will support economic growth both in Australia and across our region? Senator Selja. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks, Senator Patterson, for the question. Uh, the human suffering caused by COVID is immense, uh, but equally uh, its impact on long-term economic stability and security uh, is 
also uh, concerning. The government has committed $305 million to support economic resilience and recovery from COVID-19. Already $200 million has been dispersed to our nearest neighbours. Uh, in the year ahead, Australia will provide a further $100 million across the Pacific and Timor-Leste to maintain essential services and protect the most vulnerable. For countries like Fiji, which are highly dependent on international tourism, the shutdown of international travel has been absolutely devastating. Uh, we can help Fiji to get the virus under control and support its quick return to economic growth. I'll be speaking to the Fiji Health Minister today about our cooperation and we'll be delivering more Australian vaccines to Fiji this week. Uh, we'll always support our Pacific family. A safe region means a safe Australia and our support at this time is more important Order. Than Senator ever. Patterson, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister update the Senate how the budget builds on the government's record investments in the Pacific, and can the minister outline the comprehensive nature of this government's engagement with our Pacific neighbours? Senator Seselja. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. President. I can, and in doing so, uh, we we reject Labor's lazy approach to our engagement in the region. Uh, what those opposite don't understand is that Australia's partnership with Pacific nations extends far beyond the record ODA budget alone in the Pacific. Order. Labor seems to believe that bilateral ODA remains the only way in which Australia addresses shared challenges in our region. By contrast, uh, this government is using a range of economic tools to support economic stability and grow jobs in our region. We're providing bilateral loans to our most important near neighbours, PNG and Indonesia, at a crucial moment in their COVID-19 response efforts. The loan to Indonesia is part of our biggest package of economic support to Southeast Asia since the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami. And this government has established the $2 billion Australian infrastructure financing facility for the Pacific, which is helping to deliver strategically significant projects such as the Palau ICT cable project, Order. the Markham Valley Senator Solar Project Sir in Selger, PNG Senator and Birmingham. the Tina River Hydro, Order, Hydro Senator Project. Order, Time for the answer has expired. Senator Birmingham. Mr. President. It started at 2.55. Mr. Mr President, it, it did start at 2.55 and it being two minutes to four, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Are there any uh, motions to take note of answers? Um. Senator McAllister, sorry. Uh, thanks very chair. much, Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Colbeck to the questions asked by Senator Kitching and Senator Gallagher. Well, Mr Morrison promised that four million Australians would be vaccinated by the end of March. Well, he's failed that test. Now it's the start of May and we are only at 2.8 million. In fact, the Prime Minister has failed pretty much every vaccine test that he has said himself. He promised that all of Group 1A would be vaccinated by Easter. Failed that test. He promised that 6 million Australians would be vaccinated by the 10th of May. Well, Monday's come and gone, hasn't it? Monday's come and gone, and we're at 2.8 million. The Prime Minister has previously promised that all Australians will be vaccinated by the end of October. But now that seems impossible, doesn't it? Because at the current rate of vaccination, 400,000 a week, we will not get there until 2023. Weirdly, that's not what it says in the budget papers, is it, though? Because the budget papers assume that all Australians will be fully vaccinated this year. But the Prime Minister is now backing away from that at a rate of knots. Yesterday, he was trying very hard very hard to distinguish in his media appearance between a policy setting and an assumption. Now that is a distinction that actually won't make sense to many Australians. And Senator Colbeck's answers today will certainly not make that any clearer. He spent a considerable amount of time today trying to distinguish between sort of policies, uh, positions and assumptions and the grey zone of semantics between those ideas. But Australians actually don't need another word salad from this appalling minister who oversaw a shambles of a response to the threat of COVID to aged care residents. They actually just want a simple answer to a simple question. When will all of Australia be vaccinated? 
because it's not a moot question. It's not, a, uh, it's not an unimportant question. The reason that the budget includes information, assumptions about vaccination, is because it has a real impact on Australia's ability to recover economic, economically from the effects of the pandemic. A vaccinated Australia is less vulnerable to the risk posed when a positive case escapes from hotel quarantine. A vaccinated Australia won't have to have a widespread lockdown if community transmission is detected. A vaccinated Australian can travel, supporting vulnerable jobs in Cairns and in Launceston. And that is the reality for many countries. And the Prime Minister promised us last year that we would be first in line first in line, front of the queue for vaccines. Well, according to analysis by the Financial Times, we're actually ranked 104th internationally in the rollout. And economists are telling us that all this delay caused by this incompetence will cost the Australian economy billions of dollars. This is something that the Prime Minister should have and could have taken charge of personally. The Morrison government has badly mishandled sourcing vaccines. And today's announcement about sourcing Moderna vaccines is honestly long overdue. Labor has been calling for months now for the Australian government to strike a deal with Moderna for access to their state-of-the-art mRNA vaccine. That's a position that the government has consistently rejected as recently as the last few weeks. And at the heart of this, is his failure by Mr Morrison to take responsibility. He loves the job. He clearly loves the job, but he doesn't really like doing the work. He would rather lean on the state premiers. He wants a photo taken with them when things go right. He's nowhere to be seen when things go wrong. Just like in the bushfires, nowhere to be seen unwilling to take responsibility for the things that really matter to this country, always willing to point the finger, always finding someone else who is responsible for the things that have gone wrong, but never willing, never willing to stand up and actually take responsibility for the things that will make a difference in the lives of ordinary Australians. They should stop pretending that the vaccine rollout is going well. They should stop blaming other people who draw attention to the failures. They should face up to the problems they have created because Australians and the economy are paying the price. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Deputy President. I do take pleasure in rising today actually to address this issue that uh, Labor senators are, are raising in this place. Uh, what this government is proving is an amb ambe oh, what's the word? They're ambidextrous in, in our ability to deal with the challenges of, of the supply of vaccine, our ability to, to, to connect with, with reality, something that we don't see uh, much on this other side of the, the chamber. Professor Murphy said that it is absolutely vital for Australia to be prepared for variants to the coronavirus and the Moderna deal which was, has been announced, uh, provides extra diversity and redundancy in the country's vaccine arsenal. Now, this is phenomenal. This is great because we know that there's been uh, supply constraints. We know that there's been issues and it's your ability to deal with them when they arise. And that's what this government is proving, its ability to adapt, to shift, to work towards solutions. And that's what our Prime Minister and our Health Minister and others that are involved, the, the, the great officials that are involved in, in negotiating terms and negotiating deals to see the, the, the delivery of these vaccines. What the Morrison government is doing is proving its ability to be ambidextrous, to modify, to adapt as the circumstances change. And Australians, they, they can make sense of this. They get that. They get that. They respect the fact that when circumstances change, you, you have to shift, you have to adapt, and you have to move quickly. Now, this is what the Morrison government has done in terms of this vaccine. With the announcement of an agreement for the Moderna vaccine, which secures a further 25 million doses, uh, the total number of vaccines that are going to be available to Australians has now increased to 195.4 million doses of vaccine. That provides us with options. 
That provides us with options to be able to shift. If there's issues, we can shift to others. There is opportunity that's been provided here by this government. Now, sadly, Labor have proven yet again their inability to, to adapt. They, they come in here with their same old and tired tactics of fear and cynicism in some you know, maybe misguided attempt to score some political point, but really they have no clue. All they're doing is just revealing that they don't have a clue about what Australians care about. Because if they did, then they'd be coming in here and asking questions and inquiring about the very substantial budget statement that was delivered by the Treasurer. So the question of Labor's ability, Labor's ability to be able to adapt and move uh, to where we need to go is, is really in question right now. And it's a question that's before uh, Labor and Labor members and people that support the Labor Party when they're, when they're looking at what Labor's position is. is you know, what will they do with the, maybe the third round of tax cuts that are, that are, that, that, that are presented, uh, that this government is, has uh, put forward? Uh, where, where's Labor's position on this? Will they be ambidextrous? Will they, be, will they present uh, themselves with the ability to be able to move and to be be able to shift and be able to recognise the times that we're dealing with. Because Australians care about this. This is something that Australians want to see. They want to be able to take home more of the money that they earn. But there is deathly silence on that side. We're not hearing what Labor would do. Mr Frydenberg said that, uh, that uh, if the opposition leader abandoned the government's tax cuts, which would abolish the 37% per cent, uh, per cent tax bracket, leaving earnings between 45000 and 200000 tax at 30%, uh, and, si and he said that, uh, that the Treasurer said that, that, this would, um, that this would create a system that was, uh, uh, that, that was uh, unaffordable uh, and we must create a stronger system. Mr Frydenberg said that the Labor Party has not said if it is committed to stage three. They've not said whether they're committed to stage three. Even though at the time it passed through the parliament they said that they supported these tax cuts. But there's been silence from the opposition leader. There's been silence from senators, Labor senators as they've come in here in this place. Now, this would mean that individuals that are in an income, uh, if they abandon these uh, th stage three or of the proposed, or if they abandon it, it would mean that somebody on eighty thousand dollars a year, a middle income earner, would be nine hundred dollars a year worse off. Nine hundred dollars a year worse off. Now, these are the issues that Australians care about. These are the issues that are on uh, front of mind. When Australians are working, to, are working very hard and working hard to pay their bills, they want to know, can they keep more of the money that they earn? Where's Labor's interest with the Australian people, I wonder? Thank you, uh, Senator O'Sullivan. Senator Ayres. Thanks, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. I also rise to take note of uh, questions from Senators Gallagher and Kitching to uh, uh, Senator Colbeck uh, in relation to the uh, failed vaccine rollout. Uh, you can see the penny dropping for senators opposite. It's, it's been going all week. You see, on the other side, they thought they'd got away with it. A catastrophic bungling of the most important public health program uh, in Australia's political history, vital for our public health, vital for the future of our economy, uh, and at the beginning of this week, you could see it in their faces as they came in here on the balls of their toes that they thought they'd got away with it, that the criticism has been muted. Now, in fact, what has happened is households across the country have just shrugged their shoulders because it's more of the same from the Morrison government. We've gone from I don't hold a hose, mate, to I don't hold a dose, mate. We've gone from broken promises more announcements, more spin uh, over the bushfire crisis to broken promises, more announcements, more spin, more marketing over another issue that's vital for the public health, uh, vital for the economy and vital for every household in the country. You could see it in the lacklustre tone, the excuses, the dissembling, the lack of interest, the lack of a sense of urgency from Minister Colbeck in question time today, uh, just like when he's had responsibility for aged care. Remember, neglect was the title of the report 
that, that made an assessment of his performance as the aged care minister. Everything that this minister touches turns to custard. See, the COVID-19 pandemic for them has just been a distraction from what they see as the real business of government, staying in government and looking after themselves and their mates. We've had a cycle of announcements and promises over the COVID-19 vaccine rollout that has been accelerating as the sense of crisis and failure has lifted. Last year, the Prime Minister promised that Australia would be at the front of the queue for vaccination. <coughs> the beginning of this year, the Prime Minister promised that four million Australians would be vaccinated by the end of March. Today, well, the promises and announcements accelerate. Five different positions from the Prime Minister and the Treasurer and various assorted ministers. And the problem for Minister Colbeck answering questions in the Senate today is that while he's entitled to be confused about the government's position, it's really quite a simple proposition. If you tell the truth, you don't have to remember anything. You just tell the truth. Well, the truth is that Australia has vaccinated just 2,736,107 people. We are 81st in the world in terms of the percentage of our population vaccinated. In raw terms, there are 15 countries that have a smaller population that have vaccinated more people. It's a geography lesson, really. Singapore, Switzerland, Austria, the Czech Republic, Serbia, the United Arab Emirates, Israel, Belgium, Sweden, Portugal, Hungary, the Netherlands, Romania, Chile and Greece have all vaccinated more people and have a smaller population. Chile has six million fewer people than Australia. They have vaccinated 16 million people in their population, fully vaccinated, almost as six times as many people as Australia has. How can that be that this country has performed so poorly, there's been such willful neglect of this basic requirement of government, that this Prime Minister has not been able to grasp the nettle, to do the right thing by Australians and Australian families, and has left us stranded, exposed, isolated, vulnerable to future uh, outbreaks of this vaccine, uh, of this virus, a quarantine system that is fundamentally compromised, unable to take responsibility for quarantines and vaccines. He's left Australian households at, some, at the mercy of the pandemic you, and a future Ayers, economic crisis. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you very much. And, um, I thank the Labor Party for raising this very important issue. And uh, yes, it, we are at a, a in the middle. We are still in the middle of an international pandemic. But you know, the Labor Party continue to talk us down. They continue to talk down Australia, which has by far exceeded the rest of the world in managing COVID cases, in ensuring we have the best practice for testing and tracing and managing outbreaks of COVID so that we have actually got through this pandemic um, with very low statistics. So um, when we're talking about the actual vaccination rollout, the sense of urgency that other countries have is not experienced here in Australia. We are getting the vaccination out the door. We are entering into negotiations with companies to ensure that we've got enough vaccinations going into the future to ensure that we can vaccinate our entire population. And importantly, in a country like Australia that is so big and so diverse, but with such a disparate population, we are ensuring that we can manage to get the vaccination out to the people on the ground in the regions where it's needed. We are utilising every possible uh, mechanism to get the vaccination out there. 
We are working with our general practices. We've got over 5,000 general practices registered to be able to give vaccinations. That is throughout Australia. That is not 5,000 general practices located in Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane. That is general practices like in my hometown of Daniloquin, where my local health clinic is giving COVID vaccinations. We are working with the Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Services to ensure that our Aboriginal communities in some of the most remote locations in Australia are not forgotten as we manage the rollout of this vaccination. These are all things that take time to develop, but we've done that. They are all things that ensure that we are flexible and we can pivot to need. We're even working with the Royal Flying Doctors Service to ensure that people on our most remote stations have access to the vaccine, because we're not focused only on where the pandemic has occurred in our cities, where we've had the majority of outbreaks. We are focused entirely on ensuring that every Australian who wants a vaccination can access a vaccination. And we should be proud. I mean, uh, Senator Ayres uh, made the point that Australia is 81st in the world in terms of getting the vaccinations rolled out. But he fails to mention that uh, our case numbers are 120th in the world. But when you look per capita, our case numbers are much, much lower than all of the countries that the Labor Party are focusing on comparing us to. We don't want to be the next India. We don't want to be the next United Kingdom or the next USA. We want to make sure we stay ahead of the pack so we are managing the entire pandemic. We are not focusing just on vaccinations because we know that the best way to get through this pandemic is to continue to ensure that we don't have major outbreaks, to continue to work with our state partners of all political colours on their management of COVID, to ensure that we can manage any incoming COVID from returning Australians. Um, and we are working constructively through National Cabinet to also get the vaccinations out the door. New South Wales last week opened their first uh, major vaccination hub at Sydney Olympic Park, and that has been going very successfully with massive registrations of people and um, bringing forward the phases of the rollout as required, as advised by our health experts who we listen to, we continue to listen to, and um, we continue to work with the scientific community to manage this pandemic as we go on. Thank you, Senator Davey. Senator Smith. Thank you, Deputy President. I also rise to take note of questions by Senators Kitching and Gallagher to Senator Colbeck. And what we got in the answers today was more waffle from a government far more focused on the politics of the vaccine rollout rather than the delivery of it. And this is something we've come to expect after eight long years of this government that has always been far, far more focused on announcements than deliveries. We've seen it time and time again. A job maker program meant to create 450,000 jobs, which only created 1,100. A Federal Integrity Commission, nowhere to be seen. $4 billion in national disaster recovery, not spent. But this time, the government's outdone themselves. They've outdone themselves on the all announcement, no delivery, because this time they haven't just bungled the delivery, they've bungled the announcements. So they announced 4 million Australians would be vaccinated by the end of March, and they failed to deliver that, because it's now May and we've got about 2.8 million vaccinated. So they tried to announce something again, and then they failed, they failed to deliver the re-announcement. We've got five goes from five different ministers. Minister Hunt, who promised all Australians would be vaccinated by October. Minister Tian, who promised 
or who said that the goal was for all Australians to have a dose by the end of the year. Treasurer Frydenberg, who promised every Australian will get two shots of the vaccine by the end of the year. Senator Birmingham, who said that people would still be getting vaccinated next year. And Minister Colbeck, who has said vaccinating Australians this year has never been part of the government's plans. Five, five different attempts at re-announcement from five different ministers. And I've got to give you guys credit, right? Because we thought we had you worked out. We thought we had your measure. We thought you were all announcement, no delivery. Great at the announcement, political geniuses at that, but always failing on the delivery. But you tricked us, because you can't even announce it properly. You're not only no announcement, no delivery, you can't even do the announcements properly. Five different positions from five different ministers. Five attempts at an announcement from five different ministers. It's ridiculously hard to keep up. And the fact is, in all these failures, the failures in delivery particularly, you're letting Australians down so very badly. Because it's not good enough to bungle this. It's one of your few jobs in the COVID recovery, right? Vaccinations. And you're bungling it. It's not good enough for Australians. It's not good enough for vulnerable Australians especially, who are still scared, who are still anxious, waiting for their vaccine, because that vaccine for them is a ticket to a more normal life. It's a ticket to safety. It's a ticket to being able to go back into their community and not live with that deep-seated fear they live with every day. For our aged care workers, who are going through an extraordinarily difficult time at the moment, with this anxiety on top of them. They're not all vaccinated yet. The fear they live with every day is intolerable. For our frontline healthcare workers who are exhausted, exhausted from this pandemic, who want to be vaccinated and are not yet vaccinated, it's not good enough for them. It's not good enough for all the Australians who need this vaccine and aren't able to get it. It's not good enough for our economy because we know the reopening of our economy, the, the full redevelopment, the growth that we know we need to see in our economy depends on jabs in arms, jabs you cannot deliver. It's not good enough for our economy. It's not good enough for vulnerable Australians. It's not good enough for aged care workers. It's not good enough for frontline health care workers. It's not good enough for any of us. So instead of tying yourself in knots, bungling announcements, to then go on and bungle the delivery of those announcements and re-announcements, which we just can't even catch up with, just do better. Do better for all Australians who need you to do better on one of the few jobs you have. Do better for our economy. Do better for our vulnerable Australians. Do better on this vaccine rollout. Do better so we can start getting back to normal. Do better so people can be less anxious and less in fear. Just do better for Australia. It's about time. Thank you, Senator Smith. So the question is that the motion to take note of answers is moved by Senator McAllis to be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, President. I rise to take note to responses to question eight by Senator Hanson Young uh, from Minister Birmingham. Of all the <clears throat> untruths, of all the deception, of all the spin, in fact, if I could use some pub vernacular, Deputy President, of all the bullshit we hear in this place about climate change from the coalition, perhaps the biggest mistruth of all is that somehow there's a trade-off, that somehow there's a trade-off between the economy and action on climate change. There isn't. Action on climate change is important for the economy. It's not just an important opportunity to create new industries, new innovation, new jobs and solve an environmental problem. It's important because there is no bigger cost to our economy than climate change. There is no bigger threat to our national security than climate change. How often do we think about the extreme weather events that cause 
the outages in power that caused the problems. We heard today at question time about a stable, reliable, low-cost energy source. Most of the problems in our grid are caused by heat waves and cold snaps caused by our changing climate. The damage caused by prolonged droughts to our rural and regional areas, the lack of rainfall, the mental health issues, the disruption to essential services and essential assets from cyclones, from floods, from heat waves, from storms. We've all seen it. We've all experienced it. Where I'm giving this speech in Canberra, in the Australian Senate, just one summer ago, the summer leading into 2020, we experienced the most extraordinary period of extreme weather events and disruptions to the community, to the economy, to the areas in southern New South Wales, all the way to the north coast, down to Tasmania, across Victoria. Australian citizens being evacuated from beaches by the Australian Navy. The loss of millions of animals. The construction costs to communities to rebuild. That's just the tangible cost of what it costs to rebuild their houses and their infrastructure and their facilities. It can't even begin to estimate the cost and damage to their lives, to the fabric of their communities. But we ignore that in this place, in our short-term self-interested debates that we have on climate action. Somehow a technology that we've been talking about for 20 years is going to mysteriously solve our problems by creating lower emissions and a reliable, safe power source. Well, I don't know if that's a pig that's flying over the Senate right now, Acting Deputy President, but I'll tell you what, I'm fed up with this government's excuses and distractions from real climate change, and I know most Australians are as well. Senator Hanson Young mentioned today that this government has put up just 50 cents in every hundred dollars that it's spent in this budget towards the environment and towards climate action. If there's anyone in this place, if there's any senator and any member of parliament that can't say that the biggest challenge our nation faces, the biggest economic challenge, the biggest social challenge, the biggest environmental challenge, the biggest political challenge is climate change. If they can't say that, then they are quite simply in denial. They have their head in their sand. And if that is the case, why has it had so little attention from this government? Well, indeed, why has this government thrown fuel on the fire by funding fossil fuels? And sh shamefully, we just saw that in the Senate this afternoon with legislation gagged to provide public funds for fossil fuel projects. The public expect a lot better from us, Acting Deputy President, and the Greens will deliver on that for the Australian public at the next election. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Wish Wilson to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We now move to tabling and consideration of committee reports. Senator Lyons. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I present the Procedures Committee first report of 2020, and I move that the Senate adopt the recommendations in paragraph 1.6 of the Procedure Committee's first report of 2021 proposing that the Senate adopt revised rules for remote participation in Senate proceedings as a temporary order until 2 September 2021. Madam Acting Deputy President, on 24 August 2020, the Senate adopted for the first time the rules for remote participation in Senate proceedings contained in the committee's first report of 2020. 
The committee has recently reviewed the rules and has again emphasised that the use of remote participation should be strictly limited to enable senators to participate in Senate proceedings while they are prevented from physically attending the Senate because of COVID-19 related travel restrictions, quarantine requirements or personal health advice. The committee also agreed on a new process for approving the use of remote participation with the intention that the system should be available when the President and Deputy President, acting jointly and in consultation with senators, determine that its use is warranted for one or more of the above reasons. The motion I have moved would adopt that change as part of revised rules to apply on a temporary basis until 2 September this year. The committee also considered the operation of estimates hearings and recommended that senators attend in person rather than seeking to particip participate remotely, and that witnesses should expect to attend in person unless other otherwise explic explicitly approved by the relevant committee. The committee recommends that legislation committees considering estimates adopt these principles. I commend the report to the Senate. Thank you, Senator, Senator Lyons. Uh, the, the question is that the recommendations moved by uh, Senator Lyons be agreed to. All, all those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? The ayes have it. Thank you. Senator Brockman. Got there in the end. Thank you, Madam Got Acting there in the end, Deputy yes. President. On behalf of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights, I present Human Rights Scrutiny Report 6 of 2021 and the Committee's Annual Report for 2020. I also present the report of the Environment and Communications Legislation Committee on the, environmental, the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Amendment Regional Forest Agreements Bill 2020, together with the Hansard Record of Proceedings, documents presented to the Committee, additional information and submissions. Thank you, Senator Brockman. Uh, we will, the Senate will now proceed to the consideration of documents which are listed on pages 13 to 15 of the notice paper. Any document to which no Senator rises will be taken to be discharged from the notice paper. Page 13. Senator McCarthy. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I uh, would like to request I take note of documents aged care number one, three, four, five and seven on page 13. Would you like me to go through or are we just going to go page We're by page? We're going to go page by page. Okay, and I seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. Uh, nothing else on page uh, 13? No, we now move to page 14. Senator McCarthy. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I seek to uh, take note of uh, documents 9, 10, 15 and 16, and I seek leave to continue my remarks. Since there are no other takers, Senator McCarthy. Oh, yes. No, Senator Pratt. Senator McCarthy. Oh, just loving the floor here, Madam Acting <laughs> Deputy President. Uh, on page 15, uh, I, I take note of uh, documents 19, 23, 24 in the document section and I seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you. The Senate will now proceed to the consideration of committee reports, government responses and Auditor General's reports which are listed on pages page 15 to 17 of the notice paper. Any report or response to which no Senator arises will be taken to be discharged from the notice paper. Senator McCarthy, the floor is yours again. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, uh, I s wish to take note of committee reports and government responses number one and four on page 15. Keep and, going. <laughs> and on page 16, uh, numbers five, eight and nine. And on page 17, numbers 20, 21 and 22, and I seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. Are there any ministerial statements? Yes, we are. Senator Cash. Thank you very much. And on behalf of the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Mr McCormack, I table a ministerial statement on rural and regional budget outcomes. The 
President has received letters requesting changes in the membership of committees. I call the Minister. Leave to move a motion to vary the membership of committees. It's leave granted. Leave is granted. Minister. I move that senators be discharged from and appointed to committees as set out in the document available in the chamber and listed in the dynamic red. Thank you. I put the question. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those against, the ayes have it. Thank you. Sen uh, Senator Steele, John. Sorry to do this to you, but could I draw your attention to the state of the chamber? Ah, yes. Thank you. Quorum required. Ring the bells. Sorry, uh, I'm advised that that's been cancelled. So, Senator Steele, John, we don't have. <laughs> you stand corrected. Thank you. Okay, we now move to Senator Davy. I seek leave to take note of the ministerial statement just tabled. Thank you, Senator Davy. Sorry. Uh, Senator Davey, we've moved on from there, but you can seek leave of the chamber uh, to uh, take note of that report. Yes, I seek leave of the chamber to. Is leave granted? No, we've gone beyond item 17. We haven't started item 18 yet, so. I think the sort of quorum call kind of leave has been granted. So, Senator Davey, you have leave to speak. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Acting, Acting Deputy President. Uh, this year's budget is a budget for the bush. It follows on from the regional budget of last year to cement our government's commitment to rural and regional Australia. Despite the challenges of the past few years in the regions with drought, flood, fire and now a mouse plague, our regional industries have carried this nation through the COVID pandemic. And that is why our regional investment is the right thing to do for the nation and for our ongoing economic recovery. The pandemic has changed the way we view our regions. With 43,000 Australians opting to make the move from the city to the regions, it is vital that we as a government invest in the infrastructure and services needed to ensure our regions remain the best place in the world to live. And from my perspective, regional New South Wales is certainly the best place to live. But it will be even better thanks to the commitment of the nationals and the nationals in this government to continue to deliver services over the Great Divide. For the first time ever, this is a health budget specifically focused on the almost 8 million Australians who live and work in the regions. All Australians, regardless of where they live, should have access to high quality health care, and that is what we as a government are delivering. To do this, we know that we must attract, train and retain doctors in the bush. That is why we are investing for the long term. This year we saw the first intake into the Murray-Darling Medical Schools, with three of the five campuses uh, located in New South Wales and the campuses in Wagga, and Wagga Wagga and Orange accepting students from February this year. 
as well as piloting new workforce programs in New South Wales to better support our young doctors, including working with the Murrumbidgee Health District, our government is developing a streamlined program to support the National Rural Generalist Pathway and complementing that with training for early career allied health professionals through an expanded allied health rural generalist pathway. But we know we also need an immediate me measure to help our existing regional doctors, and that is why we are providing a new progressive bulk billing schedule to better acknowledge the remoteness under the Medicare benefit scheme. We understand doctors face greater health complexities and challenges in regional and remote areas, and that is why more than 12,000 GPs across the nation will be eligible for this higher bulk billing incentive, but only GPs based in regional areas. We are also looking after those who have looked after us. Rural and regional and remote communities will see improvements to residential aged care funding models, an expansion of home care packages and direct funding for infrastructure upgrades and greater support for our aged care workforce. And we are also acutely aware of the need to look after our mental and as well as our physical health. $2.3 billion is being invested into mental health and suicide prevention, the largest investment in Australia's history. That includes a new national network of 57 additional mental health treatment centres and satellites, as well as expansion of the very successful Headspace program. And this will all bolster services for young and old in the bush. The Nationals have always advocated for better communications in re regional areas. We fought for and implemented the Mobile Black Spot program, which in New South Wales has now seen 284 mobile towers delivered. We're also, we've also developed and we are delivering the regional connectivity program which enables communities to identify the right local solution for better online digital access. Already in New South Wales, 15 projects have been funded, including mobile voice and data coverage, fixed wireless and fibre broadband services. This includes projects like the Murrum Bateman Fixed Wireless Network and the Connecting the Outback project in Bogabri. Importantly, this budget provides business and personal tax relief. The instant asset write-off has been a boon for small business and farmers across the nation. And I personally know of uh, farm machinery uh, suppliers who are struggling to keep up with demand because of the success of this program. So we're extending it. Further to this, over three million low and middle income earners in New South Wales alone will receive a tax relief of up to about $1,080 over the financial year. And it would be remiss of me not to mention the increased excise rebate for small distilleries and independent brewers. In New South oh. Wales, there's 87 plus small distilleries who will benefit from the increase from 100,000 to 350,000 for this rebate, which brings them in line with our very successful wine industry. When this move was announced, it was within hours I got my first letter from a small distiller saying they are now going to advertise for more staff and reinvest because distilleries, breweries, like wineries, a dollar invested in their business is multiple dollars invested in their communities as they boost regional tourism and the hospitality sector as well. As ever, the Nationals are committed to our regional infrastructure. Roads, rail and freight keep our people moving. We know local roads are just as important as our major highways and corridors. That is why we invest $278.5 million more for the local road and community infrastructure program rolled out by local governments and $270 million in New South Wales alone for road safety projects. And we are finally investing in the Great Western Highway to improve the flow of traffic over the Great Dividing Range from Katoomba to Lithgow. Our commitment to inland rail is ongoing and we are increasing our commitment to the Building Better Regions Fund, providing a sixth round. 
This fund has already seen 249 projects in New South Wales alone. Projects like Orange City Council Central Business District Revitalisation or the Eurobadala Regional Botanic Gardens Visitor Centre. And jobs. We are always committed to jobs. This budget increases our job trainer package to see ongoing investment into the future workforce that we need to support our industries. Working with the states, we're providing free or low fee access to courses for in-demand industries like agriculture, like manufacturing, like construction, all industries so important to our regional economies. We've also extended the apprenticeship wage subsidy measure, which has been so successful at enabling employers to take on and train new staff. New staff, new skilled workmen who will then, and women who will then go on to service our towns and our industries. I could not be more proud of this budget, and I could not be more proud of the team I work with to ensure that this budget is not just focused on where our major population centres are, but is focused on where our economy drives from, because it is our regional economy, the resources sector, the agricultural sector, that has kept us ticking over for the last few years, and particularly in the last year of this pandemic. So I congratulate the government and I congratulate my colleagues and I commend this budget and our regional budget statement to the chamber. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Davey. Senator McKenzie. Well, thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. And I too, as leader of the National Party in the Senate, uh, want to speak to the tabling of the regional ministerial budget statement supporting regional recovery and growth, uh, a specific set of plans, commitments and strategies to really prioritise rural and regional Australia as we enter uh, COVID-19 recovery. Because as we know, uh, in the National Party, we live, we work, we raise our families out there in the regions. And it's been tough. We've had drought in Senator Macdonald's patch uh, upwards of seven years. And thanks to some great rains in the new year, a lot of smiling faces out there at Beef Week uh, in Rockhampton last week. But we also were hit uh, by bushfires over summer 18 months ago. Uh, and that recovery is tough when overnight you lose everything that you and your family have worked for. Uh, and obviously COVID-19 has uh, been a significant impact on rural and regional Australia as we've struggled to find a workforce uh, as international borders closed. And sadly, uh, as many premiers slammed state and domestic borders closed due to uh, COVID-19, we saw rural and regional communities in those border towns severely, severely impacted. But with Budget 2021, uh, very proud to be part of a coalition government that backs in the resourcefulness, the resilience uh, and the strength and the opportunity of rural and regional communities. Because we're, uh, we're just on for getting on with it uh, out there. So this budget supports jobs, it drives growth, it's going to help rebuild the national economy and you do that in Australia, in a country like Australia, by focusing on manufacturing, by focusing on ensuring uh, our resources sector is strong and by focusing on agriculture. And this budget has some great measures uh, for all three of those uh, areas. We also do it by uh, an infrastructure commitment that doesn't just focus on roads and rail and bridges, which are incredibly important to get product and people moving along the highways and byways of regional communities to the ports uh, in capital cities and, and uh, export markets around the globe, but it is also that digital connectivity, that digital in infrastructure that's going to be incredibly important going forward. Not just to educate our kids or to do our banking or participate in social connection, but to ensure we can access healthcare, healthcare 
to ensure that we can drive productivity growth on our businesses on farm. And there's some fantastic initiatives uh, and innovation occurring in this space that I'm very, very excited uh, to see going forward. Uh, National Party senators tonight will be um, participating in this contribution by highlighting how our government has delivered for each and every state uh, and communities right around our country. Uh, and I know they're as happy as I am that we can uh, get this going. The biosecurity announcement, uh, championed by David Littleproud, is fundamental to our ongoing success as an agricultural trading nation. We have a brand globally uh, that people trust because when they buy our clean green produce, it is pest and disease free. Uh, and because it comes from Australia, they can trust that that is actually the case. But as the risk increases, as trade and people movement increases across the globe, so too does the risk. And it will tarnish our reputation and devastate our capacity and reputation as a global exporter of great agricultural products uh, if that is in any way tarnished through um, lax biosecurity measures. And uh, I'm just so stoked to see $400 million to be invested in biosecurity uh, measures to safeguard our farmers uh, from pests and diseases. We've got $87 million on the table uh, to diversify our markets, and particularly important in light of recent trade tensions uh, between Australia and China, noting that tariffs have recently uh, left local producers of wine, seafood, cotton, barley and beef uh, out in the cold. And it's working. This money puts agricultural councillors uh, in our embassies in potential markets to help connect producers uh, to potential opportunities in new and emerging markets. Very, very important to have that people-to-people -people networked relationship, again, uh, that can build trust. North East Victorian wine growers have told me they've spent years building markets in China, only to have orders cancelled, so this is very, very uh, welcome news. We've got money for uh, the Future Drought Fund. But I just wanted to touch, Madam Acting Deputy President, on water. I'm from the great state of Victoria. Uh, we are significant primary producers within the Murray-Darling Basin system, and we have significant population centres uh, within that system. We say no to the 450 buybacks, and the budget backs this with $1.3 billion to recover water for the environment in the Murray-Darling Basin. Um, whilst simultaneously maintaining water for irrigated agriculture. We're also providing a further $22.3 million to help develop business cases for eight water infrastructure projects to help secure our water future. Because out in the regions, we know if you add water with our can-do, uh, Australian farmers will just go from strength to strength in producing world-class food and fibre. There's two uh, projects that are based in my home state, being the Colby Abbon, uh, Colley, sorry, Colliban uh, Regional Rural Modernisation and the Sunbury Buller Keelor Agricultural Rejuvenation Projects. Jobs are a huge focus in this budget, and we've heard farmers calling out for fruit pickers with worker and skill shortages that have had serious ramifications for their production and bottom line. Uh, our budget's Ag Move initiative will help with the relocation assistance to get workers into jobs and farm. And you've seen the massive shift of Australians during COVID realigning their values, having a rethink about the type of life they want to live. Do they want to be stuck in a two bedroom apartment in South Bank? No, it's not much of a life if Daniel Andrews is going to lock you down every second for weeks and months on end. Rather, they're voting with their feet, and uh, 26,000 Melburnians have moved out. We're hoping they don't all go to the Sunshine Coast. We hope that they come out to our regional capitals and live and raise a family there with the increased digital connectivity that our government has provided over the last eight years and will continue to develop and grow. Uh, they will be able to participate in global economies and stay connected uh, with jobs across the world whilst having a unique livability that only living in the regions can provide. So we're hoping we're also backing our youth with an apprenticeship and skills plan that wants to see young people 
in particular, but all Australians move into the jobs of the future. Uh, it's not just enough saying job available. You've got to match uh, the skill set and the know-how and the education offering uh, for Australians to take advantage of those opportunities. Um, we're also wanting sophisticated and advanced manufacturing out there in the regions as we turn that beautiful primary product into a highly valued value-add advanced manufacturing food or fibre product. And, uh, I'm super excited what we're already doing out there, but making sure we've got a highly skilled and educated workforce to meet that demand uh, is something that this budget addresses. Uh, we also address um, the resource opportunities that are out there, and we want to make sure that uh, the energy and gas-fired gas powered um, opportunities that will drive additional manufacturing opportunities through the regions is also supported uh, by this budget. I'm particularly excited about the values underpinning this, this budget, and that is about personal income tax, business incentives that help businesses invest back into themselves so they can uh, employ more Australians. And we know out in rural and regional Australia that has been a super a, a successful program that we extend in this budget. Rural and regional Australia drives our national economy and our government absolutely backs them in to not just recover from COVID-19 bushfires and drought, but with this budget, uh, build it back better, which I'm super excited to be part of a government that's absolutely committed uh, to, to a to growth and development in rural and regional Australia. Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Senator Macdonald. Thank you. I'm incredibly pleased to speak today on the, uh, the budget, focusing particularly on the regional uh, Australia element. Uh, this would have to be a period of enormous opportunity and growth for the regions in Australia, uh, despite the incredible impacts of uh, COVID-19 uh, it has been the regions that have continued to power this country. Uh, and I th particularly think of all the workforce uh, in mining camps uh, and agricultural parts of the country who had to go through uh, that initial lockdown period where they had to make the decision to move to a state or a part of the country, sometimes leaving their families behind for a very long period of time while they dug in and they committed to ensuring that Australia continued staying at work, continued uh, mining, continued agriculture, continued feeding this country. And of course that also includes the truck drivers of this nation, the supply chains of this country that just kept on keeping on, despite the challenges of uh, border crossings, of COVID tests, of being away from home, and of course all the challenges that we know that our uh, truck drivers have across the land with not enough uh, amenities, uh, but something that I know the state governments and territories will be focused on. Um, regional Australia, though, is made up of industries, but most importantly, it's made up of communities and people. And so, uh, whilst I'm particularly excited about the uh, $10 billion worth of uh, uh, infrastructure development, um, uh, commitment to, the, uh, to regional Australia. I wanted to touch on a couple of them, like the $400 million for the inland freight route from Mungandai to Charters Towers. This is incredibly important, again, for our truck and transport operators who are having to deal with roads that have not been maintained sufficiently uh, by that state government, and this will give them a safer uh, and smoother passage uh, to transport animals uh, goods and, uh, and sometimes people. Uh, there's also been money made available for the, West, the Cairns Western Arterial Road duplication, $240 million. Uh, and this is, again, an important part of allowing our northern Australia, northern Queensland uh, communities to develop. The instant asset write-off, which has been touched on so many times over the last few months, has been an incredible boon to agricultural, mining and other businesses to reinvest, reinvest in capital that improves their businesses, allows them to establish themselves for years to come. 
And this is incredibly important that the, this budget is not just about uh, money that will be used in the short term. It is about establishing uh, the, the regions for a generation to come. Uh, the telehealth program, which leapt forward by uh, maybe as much as 10 years in allowing Australians, particularly regional Australians, to be able to contact their doctors, to be able to have consultations without leaving their homes, and remembering that in regional Australia that might be hours away to get to a doctor. The Northern Australia agenda particularly has been reinvested in uh, with this budget. Uh, whether it be the Northern Australia Reinsurance Pool, $10 billion over 10 years, which will ensure that uh, people who've bought into units, families in homes, people in businesses can continue to access capital in the North, which of course you cannot do without insurance, and certainly the insurance market in Northern Queensland had failed. If I could just touch on some of those uh, community elements that I mentioned earlier, though, the idea of committing uh, to preschool places for Australian children. We know that the education of three and four-year-olds has a significant and long-lasting benefit on their later education outcomes. And uh, the increase of the childcare subsidy uh, in part will affect uh, around 250,000 families. Um, but the, the preschool places will also apply to children who live right across this country. We know we have about 1,500 children being educated by distance education uh, because of their geographical isolation and how terrific that that, uh, that will extend to them. Um, we have also seen, um, uh, and I want to correct myself earlier, I believe I said $10 billion. It's $110 billion of rolling infrastructure uh, program over the next 10 years. I mean, this is a huge amount of money um, and it is very significant for developing the part of the country where we grow the food and fibre, we mine the resources and we are raising families. It is a terrific part of, part of the world to be in. The Northern Australia Beef Roads Program is also a terrifically important program. It has been called on by mayors right across the state but particularly there's been no greater advocate than the mayor of the Tambo Blackall Shire, Andrew Martin, uh, but all the shires between there and Rockhampton have been calling for uh, additional funds and this, this um, budget has committed another $100 million towards the Northern Australia Beef Roads Program. And we know that the improvement on roads for beef cattle uh, improves animal welfare outcomes, it improves safety for truck drivers, uh, and it also uh, means that cattle are, are transported in a way that they lose less weight and has less impact on them, which is uh, a terrific outcome for everybody involved. Water projects have already been touched on uh, by Senator McKenzie, though I'll touch on those in the great state of Queensland, uh, and particularly uh, the Big Rocks Weir at Charters Towers, where $30 million has been committed to by the federal government. And we are now just waiting on the Queensland government to discover where Charters Towers is so that they too can support the uh, town water supply uh, that uh, this, this Big Rocks Weir will address. Uh, there's been also money made available to Geoscience Australia for the Great Artesian Basin a water balance model. I mean, how important is this to be able to finally get more accurate information on the water that is available from our terrific water resource uh, in the Great Artesian Basin, understand the recharges and the aquifers that, uh, that surround it. Uh, Hellsgate Dam, in addition to the Big Rocks Weir, $24 million. The Huendon Irrigation Scheme business case was $10 million. The Dimbula Mariba Water Supply Scheme Efficiency Improvement, $11 million for this terrific project. And of course, the Upper Burdekin Feasibility Study of $3 million. Um, there's, I could go on and on and on about all the terrific announcements in this budget and the recent uh, months, but I specifically want to finish on the uh, amazing uh, support for regional aviation in this country. Because with the shutdowns uh, that we experienced at the beginning of the COVID crisis last year, 
we discovered just how much is carried on our regional airlines. It's not just people, it's also freight, medicine, specialists flying to places like Mount Isa to provide cancer treatments. Uh, these are all critical um, uh, parts of, that are supported by an airline industry. And it was immediately apparent to the Minister for Transport and he uh, developed the Domestic Aviation Network Scheme, commonly known as DANS. The Regional Airline Network Scheme, RANS, uh, and this has been supported by the Remote Airstrip Upgrade Program, uh, $8.2 million in funding that is improving emergency landing uh, strips across the north. Uh, of course, the Regional Airports Program, something that has been little discussed which is the women in aviation industry. Currently, women in aviation only form about 4% of the pilots, and even less, as you'd imagine, of the uh, engineers and maintenance crew. So this $4 million of funding assistance will allow support for women to uh, have opportunities to get into the aviation sector, a terrific sector, an incredibly important one in a nation as great and as large as ours. And uh, I reflect on the founders of the uh, Qantas airline who talked about the tyranny of distance and how uh, aviation can solve some of those problems for regional Australia. So another important element of this incredibly regionally focused budget, something that I'm very proud of and I know will establish regional Australia for another generation to come. Thank you. Are you seeking to speak on this regional statement, Senator Ayres? No, we've got one more speaker on this, I believe, Senator McMahon, and then we have a message to receive from the House. Thank you. Senator McMahon, you have the call. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to welcome and commend the statement by the Deputy Prime Minister and the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development on rural and regional budget outcomes. This is a good budget for the Northern Territory, a great budget for the Northern Territory. But let's face it, um, every budget, every federal budget is great for the Northern Territory because without it, uh, we would flounder and we would not be able to provide the great services that we need to to Territorians. Uh, years of economic mismanagement by successive Labor governments have left us broke. So unfortunately at the moment we rely almost solely on uh, the federal government for uh, infrastructure and for running many of our uh, vital programs such as health, education, remote policing. Um, and, and despite the inability of some senators opposite to both understand or appreciate the positive commitments by the coalition government to Northern Territory's economic future, the 21-22 budget has a huge amount in it for Territorians. The only road to nowhere, I will say, is the one between the ears of some senators opposite. <laughs> because within this budget, is a long list of infrastructure expenditure, which is already underway. And the biggest obstacle to the rollout of these commitments is the inability of their political mates, the Gunner Labor government, to keep up with the funding we provide. If the Northern Territory government could in fact keep up, had the capacity to deliver with the current funding available then the coalition government can make money available for projects that are vital for Territorians, such as improved roads and other vital infrastructure that allows us to travel around uh, our 1.4 million square kilometres. But the Northern Territory government doesn't have the capacity. They don't have the capacity and they don't have the competency to deliver many of these projects. In fact, they are going to deliver, they, get, they are going to add an additional 44 public servants to the 21,000 Territory public servants 
just so they can try and keep up with the amount of projects being funded by the federal government. Now, if we look at infrastructure spending, federal budget has allocated more than $323 million for infrastructure in the Northern Territory. Uh, this includes 100, for road infrastructure in the Northern Territory. This includes $150 million for the NT National Highway Network uh, for upgrades to that, which will result in safer travel, reduced travel times and to boost employment across the Northern Territory. Building on the $46 million provided earlier for priority sections of the Stewart, Victoria and Barclay Highways. There is more than 173 million for gas roads around the Beedaloo Basin to support the gas industry, but not only the gas industry, because these roads are also used by pastoralists. They're also used by people for remote indigenous communities, also used for people providing services to those cattle stations and remote communities. Uh, there is more than uh, 4.3 million for the Alice Springs to Darwin Corridor. And then if we look at our North, our future, 189.6 million, 21 to 26 package, which supports the government's job maker plan, modern manufacturing strategy, which is something that, uh, that we in the Nationals are very uh, passionate about. Uh, this will also support the gas-fired recovery program and the Ag 2030 agenda to boost Australia's agricultural production. New, mes <clears throat> new measures for Northern Australia include piloting of a regions of growth approach worth 9.3 million over five years. The regions of growth pilot program will provide specialists to help connect businesses to economic opportunities in areas such as advanced manufacturing, critical minerals development, or in agriculture. <coughs> A Northern Australia development program worth 111.9 million over five years will help businesses scale up and diversify and build resilience through the Northern Australian Development Co-Investment Grants Program. If we look at regional connectivity, so important to us in the north, uh, the government has provided $130.4 million to improve connectivity in rural, regional and remote communities, further driving Australia's regionally-led recovery from the COVID-19 impact. The pandemic has shown many Australians the value of regions, like the Northern Territory, both as economic powerhouses and as desirable destinations to live, work and raise a family. This government recognises regional that regional communities need improvements to their connectivity in order to take advantage <clears throat> of this so-called regional migration of people moving out of the cities and into the regions. And we in the Northern Territory certainly welcome the people that have chosen to make the Northern Territory somewhere where they live and work throughout this pandemic. We also welcome schemes <clears throat> such as the reinsurance pool, $10 billion government guarantee to make insurance uh, affordable and accessible for those who live in areas that are plagued by floods and cyclones. This pool is going to reduce insurance premiums across Northern Australia by over 1.5 billion. This will go to households, strata, title and small businesses over 10 years. Again, vital in the Northern Territory where we are subject regularly to both cyclones and floods. Uh, if we just look at um, a summary of the infrastructure spend in the Northern Territory, Bearing in mind that the Northern Territory has 1% of Australia's population. Uh, current budget year for infrastructure, we have a 2.5% share. 
share of the budget. Forward estimates, we have a 2.1 per cent share. Of the 10-year pipeline, we have a 2.3 per cent share. And for historic last 10 years, we have a 2.2 per cent share. So in every single aspect of that infrastructure spend, we are well and truly double what we should be entitled to compared to our population and the national average. Uh, this shows this government's commitment to the Northern Territory, to the people of the Northern Territory and to people of rural and regional Australia. And I'll just say to those who seek to be critical of this budget, uh, from a Northern Territory perspective, this budget has been endorsed and in fact praised by our Chief Minister, Michael Gunner, Employment Minister, Paul Kirby, the Leader of the Opposition, Le Leah Finocchiaro, major industry groups such as Group Training Northern Territory, Master Builders Northern Territory, Chamber of Commerce. Uh, hospitality and tourism have all endorsed this budget and they have uh, very much welcomed the announcement on student visas. Um, whilst we, uh, we look forward to jobs uh, creation, one of the issues that we have at the moment in the Northern Territory, particularly in the agriculture, tourism and hospitality industries, is actually getting people to work in these industries. So we very much welcome uh, the announcement of changes to the amount of hours being able to be worked by our international students to increase that, to allow these students to fill holes and gaps uh, for tourism, hospitality, um, and, uh, and we obviously have our schemes for the agriculture sector as well to attract Australians to come and work Thank in those you, sectors in the Northern Senator Territory. Senator McMahon, your time has expired. So the question is that the Senate uh, does take note of the report. Those that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Education Legislation Amendment 2021 Measures No. 2 Bill 2021 for concurrence. Minister. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. So the question is the bill be read a first time. Those that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to education and for related purposes. Minister. I move that this bill now be read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated leave in Hansard. Granted. There being no objection, leave is granted. Minister. I move that the debate be now adjourned. Thank you. Clark. Uh, general business notice of motion number, uh, order of the day, notice of motion number 1111, standing in the name of Senator Gallagher relating to the 21 22 budget. Senator Reyes. Well, what a week <coughs> it's been. Um, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, a budget handed down uh, by Mr Frydenberg that really has one singular achievement, and it's a curious achievement indeed. Uh, how is it that a party that came to government criticising essentially on a platform of denigrating and criticising the Rudd government's approach to the to the greatest financial crisis that the globe has ever seen, uh, campaigning against what they said was debt and deficit as far as the eye could see. How is it, how is it that this government, just a few years later, could spend hundreds of billions of dollars, bring the country into a position where our fiscal position really is that we are a trillion dollars in debt uh, with nothing to show for it. How is such a thing possible? How is it possible to put the country into a position where we have a trillion dollar debt but wages are going to fall? How is it possible that hundreds of billions of dollars of public money can be spent a trillion dollars in debt, but infrastructure spending is cut. How is it possible to spend a trillion dollars 
of public money, hundreds of billions of dollars this year, and no big reform. Nothing in the budget to improve national productivity. Nothing to improve national resilience. That is a curious achievement indeed from a stale old government, eight years old, asking the Australian people for more years than the Howard government got. How is it possible that this government can sustain this proposition? Well, I think I heard it best uh, on Radio National this morning when one of the people being interviewed said very dismissively, this is the believe it when I see it budget. Australians know that the Morrison government is all promise and no delivery. All announcement, no delivery. But even this week, this week, for all the billions of dollars that, be, uh, that have been shoveled out the door, the promises and the announcements haven't made it to the end of the week. Poor old Minister Colbeck, on his feet today, I mean, I, I did feel sorry for him, having to defend the entirely indefensible on a matter as crucial to our national economic recovery as an effective vaccine rollout. Poor old Minister Colbeck, and I know it's terrible, we tease him in here from time to time because he stumbles over his stuff and he gets his briefs confused, but, but really, you could have been 21, um, a Harvard graduate in here, and not be able to defend the performance of the Prime Minister and the Treasurer and Minister Tian and Minister Hunt, who said four different things today about whether or not the government's actually committed to a target for the vaccine rollout. How is it that we've ended up with poor old National Party senators in here trying to defend the government's performance on infrastructure spending in Queensland and Northern Territory. Almost all of it's after the forward estimates. You'd have to vote for these jokers not one more time, but two more times to see a single shovel out there, to see a single steamroller, to see anything go on in any of these infrastructure projects. It would have to be a government that would get more than the Howard government got. It would have to be a government that would get more than Hawke and Keating got. You'd be touching the Robert Menzies period in government in order to achieve these things, but it's an eight-year-old, tired government, out of ideas. Uh, the only thing that's left to it is announcements and promises. You get four years more than John Howard got. The Treasurer said, our first priority is to keep Australians safe from COVID. Announce some extra money for the vaccine program. Not clear at all what the target is. Contrast it with what President Biden has done and set ambitious stretched targets for the Americans that they have met and exceeded every time. Not a cent for quarantine. Promise after promise that they'll expand capacity that they'll expand capacity, but no commitment to quarantine. And that's why they've let Australians of Indian background down so badly over the course of the last fortnight. Deliberately excluded the 40,000 Australians trying to get home, especially those 9,500 9 Australians stuck in India. They were locked out and then threatened with being locked up. And they're in that position because of this government's failure on the vaccine rollout and on uh, quarantine. How is it that you have a budget that spends hundreds of billions of dollars, but universities are going to be cut by nearly 10 per cent? You know, the country can't go forwards if the universities go backwards. I'll give you a clue. You know where they develop vaccines? In university laboratories. You know where they develop solutions for the big problems that the country faces? At universities. Where do they e educate the next generation of Australians who are going to take the country forward uh, and, do the, and, and, and do the things that are needed to meet the challenges of the future in our university sector? 
on this so-called tax relief. The Treasurer promised that low and middle income earners, he said, will have more of their money in their pockets to spend across the economy, creating jobs. Well, it's just entirely dishonest. In the budget papers, in truth, the government is projecting a real wage cut. The cost of living is going to rise by 3.25 per cent. Real wages for most Australians will continue to fall. That means low and middle, come, low and middle income Australians face a decline in their standard of living because of the choices that this government has made. See, budgets really matter. They particularly matter if there's a relationship between what you say and what you do, and this budget will impoverish Australian families. There's, there is uh, absolute hypocrisy in the government's approach on tax cuts. On Tuesday night, the Treasurer promised more support for home ownership. But the consensus amongst economists is that everything the government's done here will make housing more out of reach for ordinary Australians, will make the dream of home ownership impossible for most Australian families. They've announced 10,000, just 10,000, a drop in the ocean, first homeowner grants and 10,000 additional grants for single mothers. But there are nearly half a million low and very low income households across Australia in unaffordable rental housing. And on the government's figures, all of those households are facing a cut to their income. Research from last year found that there are 240,000 women aged 55 or older at risk of homelessness and another 165,000 women in that position aged 45 to 54. Many of those people are in our regional cities. If you go to Wagga Wagga, you go to Dubbo or Wellington or Nowra or Lismore or Grafton, you'll find those families sleeping in cars, living in tents with little kids, people sleeping under bridges with no prospect of decent housing because of the decisions that this government has made. Families in the, in the suburbs, middle income families, no prospect of being, being able to afford their own home because of decisions that this government has made. On skills and training, the Treasurer promised a record investment, he said, in skills and training. Here's what their friends in The Australian wrote about the package. They said, after years of the government rebadging skills programs, the dismal failure of last year's headline grabbing job maker scheme, it's a reminder of the need to be skeptical about skills announcements. You'd have to be a foundation member of the coalition cheer squad to accept this year's promises on apprenticeships and skills will end up being delivered over the forward estimates given the government's record. Do you remember JobMaker? Well, I do. I mean, in terms of the budget papers, it was buried at page 248, four pages from the back. The centrepiece of last year's budget is being covered up and covered over. Why? Because it promised 450,000 jobs and delivered just 1,000. <laughs> delivered just 1,000. And the truth for those 1,000 people, the lucky 1,000 people who got a job out of this bunch of jokers, is that they face real wage cuts. The government's history on skills and training is utterly embarrassing. The best guarantee, of course, of future performance is an assessment of past performance. And while there's all big promises and big announcements, what's the truth of the matter of the government's performance in terms of apprenticeships and traineeships? There are 140,000 less of them. I'm always confused whether it's less or fewer. I'm constantly corrected. But there's less of them. Uh, the PATH program, Promised to get 120,000 Australians into a job. How many did it get? Well, it did better than JobMaker. It got 36,290 into a job. Senator Ayres, if you'll resume your seat. It being 5.30, the Senate is now suspended until approximately 8 p.m.
Yeah, thank you. It's it's adjourned, so it goes back on the notice paper. I uh, call the clerk. Government business order of the day 28, budget statement and documents 2021 2022. Adjourn debate on motion. Oh, Senator Brown. I seek leave to have the Leader of the Opposition's 2021 2022 budget reply speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Thank you. Senator McKim. Thank you, Deputy President. I rise to give the budget and reply speech on behalf of the Australian Greens, and I acknowledge firstly that I do so on Ngunnawal and Ngambri land, stolen land that was never ceded. Madam Deputy President, don't believe the government's budget spin. This is not a transformative budget. Forget the phony rejection of austerity. Forget the about face on debt and deficit. Forget the superficial concern with women's economic security, because once you scratch the surface of this budget, you will see that, like the last seven budgets this government has delivered, it is built on the con that is trickle-down economics. This budget proposes no change to the fundamentals of our economy or to the tax and transfer system. The neoliberal train is rolling ever onward, barrelling through everything in its path, ruining lives, destroying nature and cooking the planet. And up front, in the locomotives, are the LNP, shovelling coal <laughs> into the firebox to keep the neoliberal train so rolling on. So Madam Deputy President, this budget was handed down while the planet's climate is breaking down around us, threatening the very existence of life. And while the destruction of ecosystems is already causing a rate of species extinction that is epoch-defining, this budget has been handed down while economic inequality is spiralling out of control. The billionaires are accumulating feudal era levels of wealth while real wages are going backwards and millions of Australians are forced to subsist below the poverty line. House prices are spiralling out of control, pricing an entire generation out of the great Australian gr dream of owning their own home. An entire generation forced to either make a Faustian pact with their bank and live a life of debt or be at the mercy of their landlord who can increase their rent or terminate their tenancy on a whim. And more than a century after being given the right to vote and decades after countless reforms meant to create equal opportunity for women, women are still being disadvantaged. There is an epidemic of family violence and the toxic attitudes of far too many men towards women are still persistent and pervasive. So what do we get in this budget? What does this budget do to respond to the big social, economic and environmental issues of our time? We get business as usual. Yep. Now, sure, some of the rhetoric has shifted. And sure, there are some good things in this budget, as there are in any budget. But underneath it, the same superstructure that created the climate crisis, that is enriching the already super wealthy, that is empowering the big corporations and that is, that is perpetrating patriarchal attitudes and behaviours remains. In some cases, such as the spending of even more public money to help big corporations make even more profit 
from burning coal and gas. This budget is quite literally adding more fuel to the fire. But in many cases, it's what's not in this budget that matters, such as all the inequalities and rorts in the tax system that have gone untouched and that will continue to disadvantage young people and women and anyone else who's not in favour with the LNP. The budget provides no solution to the climate crisis, no response to e escalating wealth inequality and no credible plan to, to increase wages or to lift people out of poverty. Now, true to type, what this budget has done is deliver for the government's mates. This is a budget that should have been and was welcomed by the big corporates and the billionaires. And this government was never going to do anything other than look after the big corporates and the billionaires because this government exists to serve its political masters and donors. Yep. That is exactly what this budget does. That is exactly why the LNP are in this place. That is in their DNA. And nowhere is this government's enslavement to its corporate donors and corporate masters more evident than in its archaic attachment to fossil fuels. Governments and markets around the world are changing tack and decarbonising at a rapid pace. The world is transitioning to a clean energy future as the urgency of the climate crisis becomes impossible to avoid. The US is on board. China is on board. The EU is on board. Left or right, democratic or totalitarian, government-led or market-led, it doesn't matter. The switch is on. The only question left is whether the switch will be fast enough to stop a catastrophic collapse in the ecosystems that contain, that sustain life on Earth. But is Australia on board with the switch? No. Is the government on board with the switch? Oh, no, it's not. Their determination is not only to resist change, but to actually fight against it. It is as, as astonishing as it is insane. In this budget, the Morrison government is giving yet another billion dollars in new public subsidies to the oil, gas and coal sectors on top of the over $50 billion in public subsidies that were already headed their way. Their showcase derangement is the so-called gas-led recovery. A shameful exercise in corporate welfare for the rent seekers using yesterday's technology. And it's all about giving public money to LNP donors to build polluting power plants that will push up power bills and will further fuel the climate crisis. Because gas use by Australians, of course, is going down each and every year. And government money for new gas that is contained in this budget is nothing but a white elephant. Australia should be moving to become a world leader in batteries, renewables and green hydrogen. We've got a chance to not only supply the world with clean energy, but with clean resources, steel, aluminium, other metals refined by using our abundant supply of renewable resources. But such is the political industrial nexus between the Liberal Party and the fossil fuel industry, the government is willing to squander that opportunity in its determination to prop up a dying industry. That's why they've served up yet another budget that sells out our children's future for the sake of the big corporates and the super wealthy. Now, speaking of political donations, during the pandemic, when every economic indicator went backwards in this country and when hundreds of thousands of Australians were put out of work, Australia's billionaires increased their wealth by 34 per cent. That is by $90 billion in one year in the middle of a global pandemic when millions of Australians were unemployed or underemployed. This is nothing short of obscene. 
and it's an obscenity aided and abetted by this government. It's not a bug, it's a feature of this government's policy settings. 65 of Australia's largest companies were, giving, were given $1.2 billion in JobKeeper job payments, even though they recorded a profit during the pandemic. This included $21 million to Harvey Norman, who paid dividends, which helped Jerry Harvey grow his personal wealth by $600 million last year. It is disgusting. And how has this budget responded to the JobKeeper rort and the obscene accumulation of wealth? Well, I can't say it any better than Jerry Harvey, who said, and I quote from him from yesterday, they've thrown a heap of money at us, end quote. Well, they sure have thrown a heap of money at Jerry Harvey and Australia's other billionaires. Straight out of Jerry Harvey's mouth, this is a budget for the billionaires. Now, this can't be allowed to go unchecked. The Greens would introduce a billionaires tax, a permanent 6 per cent tax on the net wealth of the richest 200 Australians that would increase revenue by $5 billion every year, money that we could use to fund essential public services in this country and accelerate a transition to renewable energy and reforestation so that we can draw down carbon and reduce our carbon emissions. Yeah. We'd also introduce a pandemic profiteering levy a one-off 50 per cent tax on the increase in net wealth of billionaires last year that would raise $29 billion. And the Greens would also require those companies that receive JobKeeper but that remained profitable to pay the JobKeeper payments back. This would return over a billion dollars to the public purse that never should have left it in the first place. Absolutely. Together, these measures would help stop the outrageous accumulation of wealth by the super wealthy and go some way towards restoring the notion of a fair go in Australia. The Greens would also introduce a mining super profits tax. Now, not surprisingly, the billionaires who did the best of all during the pandemic are those in the resources sector. Gina Reinhart, Clive Palmer and Twiggy Forrest all more than doubled their wealth during the pandemic. Now, these are the very same people who fought tooth and nail against a mining super profits tax that would have ensured that some of the benefit of the commodity booms that they line their pockets with is returned to the people of Australia. Instead of their booming price just lining the pockets of Gina and Twiggy and Clive, it should enrich the country. But there is no mining super profits tax in this budget. There's no billionaires tax in this budget. And neither is there any walking away from the stage three tax cuts that will further turn up the dial on economic inequality. These tax cuts will deliver, the stage three tax cuts, a $9,000 per annum tax cut to everyone who earns over $200,000 per annum at the cost, and have a go at this, of $150 billion over the next decade. That is more tax cuts for the billionaires. They've got to be repealed. They were grossly irresponsible at the time that they were introduced, and they are even more grossly irresponsible now. And what's more, the stage three tax cuts will immediately neutralise any of the progress that this budget makes towards putting women on a more equal economic footing. The government has clearly, finally and belatedly been chastened by the backlash to its appalling handling of allegations of sexual assault and sexual harassment in Parliament House and its repeated cuts to women's support services in previous budgets. But this so-called woman's budget has barely moved the needle on economic security or personal safety for women. And it comes after having cut funding for women's support services for most of the last seven years. As my colleague, Senator Waters, has said, there's a lot of sizzle, but not much substance. 
The women's budget statement details $3.4 billion in new spending over the forward estimates welcomed by the Greens, including $1.9 billion to help support women's economic security. But in the first year of the stage three tax cuts, men will receive in their pockets $5.5 billion more than women. They are gendered tax cuts. And what's more, some of the measures in this so-called women's budget are actually likely to decrease economic security for a lot of women. The proposal to provide a government guarantee for single parents to buy a home with a 2 per cent deposit is directly encouraging single parents, many of whom are women, to take on a bigger loan than they would otherwise be able to. It's nothing more than a government-sanctioned debt trap. In the most overpriced housing market in the world, just how is encouraging people to borrow more money than they can afford and more money than everyone else going to help secure their future? Well, it's not. But that's just how this budget approaches one of the fundamental causes of growing inequality. It continues to avoid the issue that is central to the housing affordability crisis, the homelessness crisis and the rent stress that many people are experiencing in this country. Australia's real estate is one of the most expensive in the world and what is the government's solution? Encourage people to take on even more debt, to raid their super so they can spend even more money on housing and push housing prices up to even more ridiculous highs. And who benefits from this? Existing investors who only pay half the tax they should on the sale of their investment property at a cost of $8.5 billion a year to the budget. Bottom line, and who else benefits from it? Yes, of course, the banks, who are more than happy to write a loan of any size, regardless of whether people can afford it or not, and whose profits are heading right back up to where they were before the Royal Commission, and they're rubbing their hands together at the thought of responsible lending laws being repealed. This madness has to stop. Yep. The Greens would get rid of the rorts in the tax system that has rigged the housing market in favour of investors and done over Australian people who simply want a home. And we would invest massively in social and affordable housing build a million new affordable homes, we could end homelessness and provide people with an alternative to debt enslavement or a life in private rentals. Now, the government's obsession with pumping the housing market ever higher is just one of the ways in which this budget once again does over young people. Having reaped the benefits of cheap housing, free university education, job security and a livable climate, all members of this government can say to young people is F you, we've got ours. It's nothing less than a complete betrayal of an entire generation and of future generations. It will lock in inequality and actively make the climate break down quicker. Because people in this parliament, with the possible exception of my colleague <laughs> Senator Steele John, won't be the ones who will bear the main brunt of the climate catastrophe. Those in the major parties, of course, as they always do, will get their sinecures, their jobs on the boards of fossil fuel companies and settle down to an extremely well superannuated retirement. And in the meantime, the country and the society that young people will inherit is being run down by the day. And to young people today, I can only and most sincerely apologise on behalf of my generation and those who came immediately before us. Young people, of course, will also bear the brunt of yet another round of cuts to higher education. The devastation caused by the pandemic and the loss of international students of itself is not enough for this government. The budget will reduce funding for universities by 10 per cent and fund reduce funding for TAFE by 24 per cent. My colleague, Senator Faruqi, said it well. How can we expect to rebuild when the government is hell-bent on decimating teaching 
and research. And what's the government doing with the money it's cutting from universities and TAFE, putting more money into vocational education, most of which, of course, will go into the pockets of the for-profit providers. More cuts to public education, more money for privatisation, more outsourcing, more profits for the big corporates. Now, stoking house prices and making cuts to tertiary education are just some of the ways this budget makes sure nothing is done to address entrenched poverty. This government's favourite way, of course, of entrenching poverty is to punish, threaten, bully and blame people who haven't got a job. And of course, why can't a lot of people get a job in this country? Because there aren't enough jobs to go round. Now, blame, blaming an individual for, this, for the situation they're in is central to the great neoliberal con. It's also the go-to look over there tactic to distract from the fact that the billionaires are making off like bandits. So there again, in this budget, is another $213 million to strengthen mutual obligations. More money spent forcing unemployed people to look for jobs that aren't there while income support payments stay bogged below the poverty line. This is not how things should be in a wealthy country like Australia, because we have a choice. Instead of giving the handouts to the big corporates and the billionaires, the Greens would increase job seeker to $80 a day and lift people who haven't got a job out of poverty. And together with investment in public services and public infrastructure, the Greens will provide a national jobs and income guarantee. We can afford to do this. We are a wealthy country if we weren't continually giving out the handouts to the big polluting corporations, to the already obscenely wealthy, we could achieve that goal. A commitment to real full employment and a universal livable income to help increase wages and boost the economic recovery. It's the right and fair and humane thing to do. To help meet this commitment to full employment, the Greens would establish a $6 billion nature fund. Yes. This colonial state has done a disgraceful job of looking after this beautiful country. Our rivers are drying, our forests are being strip mined and burned, and thousands of species are facing extinction. Shame. First Nations people are losing totems and cultural heritage is being wantonly destroyed for profit and for convenience. Shame. But we can turn around and create thousands of jobs in the restoration of nature, in reforestation, in the protection of our lands and our oceans. All it would take is a budget for nature. But that's not this budget. In this budget, nature loses again. Not content with having cut funding for environmental restoration since coming to power, this government has brought down a budget that includes more money to tear up environmental protections and destroy habitats. The government's own review into the EPBC Act found that a continuation of the existing regime would be an acceptance of habitat destruction and species extinction. If you take this budget as a measure of the government's mind, that's quite all right by them. Now, much has been made of how well Australia has responded to the pandemic and how much that has helped economic conditions to recover. But let's remember this. The government outsourced quarantine to the states, they left aged care to rot, and now they've completely stuffed up the vaccine rollout. At every step, this government has hesitated and deflected. Scott Morrison is, in one regard, a lucky Prime Minister. That is, lucky to be the leader of an island nation. Sitting proudly in his office is a ghoulish trophy of a boat that celebrates his cruelty to people who sought asylum in Australia. Perhaps he might now commission a trophy of a plane to celebrate how he's prevented Australian citizens permanent residents and temporary visa, visa holders from coming home during this pandemic. And his cruelty to refugees, people seeking asylum and migrants, which was his defining trait before becoming Prime Minister, has not stopped. He's stripping back in this budget $671 million from migrants who need social support and utterly 
unconscionable thing to do during a global pandemic. But as always, there's plenty of money to lock people up in offshore and onshore immigration detention. They're going to spend nearly half a billion dollars of new money to warehouse yet more human beings indefinitely in immigration detention because the pandemic has resulted in a situation where the government simply can't deport as many migrants as they would like to do. And they're going to spend, and get this figure, $9,300 per person per day on offshore detention. That is nearly $10,000 per person per day on offshore detention to continue to brutalise people who have already suffered so greatly at this government's hands and at the hands of previous governments of both political stripe. It is nothing less than a stain on our national conscience, a foul and bloody chapter in our country's story. This is a budget built on marginalising people, destroying nature, turbocharging climate change and pandering to the billionaires and the big corporations. Just one example of that is its treatment of disabled people. This budget has cut staff to the NDIS while spending $127 million to pay for so-called independent assessments. Now, what that will mean is strangers going into the homes of disabled people, forcing them to perform and prove that they actually have a disability. It is disgraceful and humiliating, and the Greens and Senator Steele John will fight that all the way. Now, Mr Acting Deputy President, I want to conclude where I began by acknowledging that we are on First Nations land. This land is stolen land. And what that means is that the wealth that this nation has accumulated and that this budget allocates out is stolen wealth. Wealth taken from this stolen land. Australia was founded, colonial Australia was founded on the dispossession of First Nations peoples from their land. And whatever the dollar value of our wealth, we will remain poor as a nation until we are honest about that fact. We need truth-telling about the historical and ongoing injustices faced by First Nations people. Truth-telling about the rapes, the kidnappings, the attempted genocides. We need justice for First Nations people. We need truth and we need a treaty between the sovereign First Peoples of this lands and the colonising state. And until we have those things, every budget we see in this place will be parceling out stolen wealth. And in this budget, we get a budget that damages country and further enriches the super wealthy with the profits of this stolen land. Budgets are about choices. And this budget chooses the billionaires over the millions of Australians who are struggling to get by. Well, the government's made its choices in this budget and the Greens have made our choice. And we choose to take on and stand up to the billionaires. We choose to take on and stand up to the big corporates and their puppets in this place. Their puppets in this place and in this parliament. We have a clear plan that would create a fairer and more equal society, Order. a plan for justice of First Nations people, a plan Order. for a government-led program of action to set us up for the future and address the great challenges of our time, to establish a national jobs and income guarantee, a 700 per cent renewable energy society by exporting clean energy to the world, a plan to build a million affordable, accessible and high-quality homes, to revitalise Australia's manufacturing sector, including locally made vaccines, 
for universal free childcare and for free tertiary education, to care for nature and to restore degraded wild places, a plan for billionaires and the big corporations to pay their fair share of tax so we can afford to deliver the public services and the supports that Australians want and need from their governments. And our commitment to the Australian people is to fight for them every day instead of fighting for the vested interests that hold this country back like the government is doing. Senator McMinister, are you going to seek to adjourn the debate? I am. Oh, I'm going to, I move that the debate be now adjourned. Uh, the motion is that the debate be now adjourned. Those in favour say aye, aye. and say no. The ayes have it. Uh, Minister. Thank you. I table a document relating to the order for the production of documents concerning the government response to the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trades inquiry into targeted sanctions to address human rights abuses. Did you, Senator Ciccone? Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I move that the Senate take note and seek leave to continue my remarks. Uh, the, uh, the senator has sought leave to continue his remarks. Leave is granted. And on that, if there is nothing else. We are now adjourned. Adjournment is proposed. And there being, sorry, Senator Rice, are you seeking to speak in adjournment? No, there being no speakers in adjournment, we are adjourned. Oh well. <laughs>